Welcome to the Julius Bear Generation Cup play-in. I'm Grandmaster Robert Hess. Alongside me is Grandmaster Daniel Naradisky. This is the fifth leg of the Champions Chess Tour. We've already had four awesome tournaments in the books. Danya, how pumped are you for number five? Incredibly, Robert. These are some of the most hotly contested, hotly debated, fought tournaments with so many different GMs that we can spotlight. What is there not to like? It's pretty early in the morning for me, but I cannot wait to jump into a couple of hours of incredible chess. It's never too early to watch some of the best players on the planet slug it out for a spot in the knockout, the main event of the Julius Bear Generation Cup. Uh, but we've had four events already take place. So let's remind you of the tour schedule. It happens all throughout the year. Magnus Carlsen, he won the Everything's Masters. Hikaru Nakamura took down the Chessville Masters. Nordirbek Abdusatarov, the star from Uzbekistan, wins the Chess Kid Cup. Magnus Carlsen back to his winning ways at the Aim Chess Rapid. And here we are. We're in the Julius Bear Generation Cup right now. The plane is today. The main event will be August 30th to September 3rd. They're trying to qualify their way to that Division One. That's what all the players want to be in. Four players already locked in for that competition. So, Daniel, we eventually get to the finals in December. But each and every event, it promises so much excitement. Indeed, it does, Robert. And each and every event has its own unique signature. Yeah, some events are convincingly won by the best players in the world, by Magnus Carlsen and we watched Hikaru Nakamura. But the last event, the finals, which I commentated in Norway, Hikaru got knocked out pretty early. And you never know exactly what you're going to expect. It's not formulaic. It's not just the top players qualifying and winning. Sometimes the qualifying players, the top players, they meet their end at the hands of someone incredibly unexpected. I'm talking people like Denis Lazovic and Vladimir Fedoseyev and Robert. These tournaments have really allowed us to spotlight a lot of players that otherwise just wouldn't get the airtime that they deserve. Eduardo Iturizaga was a great example of that from the last event. And you know, if you're in this competition, you want to win. But if it's not going to be you, you're rooting for Magnus or Hikaru or Abusatar. And the reason why is tour standings play a huge role in determining who makes it to the finals at the end of the year. You see three names locked in, filled in, Magnus Carlsen, Abusatarov, Hikaru Nakamura. They, for sure, are going to be in the CCT finals at the end of the year. Caruana, Wesley So, they're very likely to make it based on tour points throughout the season. But there's a third spot up for grabs. And you see Jordan von Forrest well behind Wesley. So it looks like Fabi and Wesley, they're well on their way. But after that, Daniel, who are some of the names that stand out to you who might make it via the leaderboard? Well, I mentioned Dennis Lazovic uh, just now. Not a coincidence. That guy is a beast. He just competed in a small event. That event featured some retired players and commentators, Robert. I forget who was commentating or what that event was. You might have to remind me. Oh, yeah, it was the Bullet Chess Championship. And Dennis Lazovic acquitted himself pretty well. I'm also looking at some of the people on the right column. You mentioned Eduardo Iturizaga. How about Sam Sevian, one of the most promising American juniors, uh, to play on the tournament circuit right now. Alexi Serrana needs no introduction after his performances in rapid tournaments. Robert, there are just so many of these young grandmasters in the 2650 to 2700 range that can bite and that can punch above their weight and regularly do. I felt like you were going to talk about names forever, and I was really enjoying listening because it's true. So many players have a chance. And while there are many players who are going to have a chance today to qualify for Division One here at the Julius Bear Generation Cup. And today is the playing stage. What does that look like? For those of you who forget, it's been a while. We get nine rounds of 10 minutes plus two seconds added per move. That increment is necessary so you don't flag here in the Swiss stage where the top 72 advance to match play. And when we get to match play, you get two games of 10 minutes plus two seconds added per move. 52 players will ultimately advance to the Julius Bear Generation Cup, which is going to be held August 30th to September third so Danya some big names will enter today only four will make it to division one we know that this format nine rounds of Swiss then that match stage yeah it gets really heated it does indeed it gets heated from the very early rounds because you can't afford I mean, you can't afford a loss and generally in our experience commentating the qualifying score to the top group is something like six and a half and you might think well six and a half out of nine that's a lot more uh, leeway than we're used to from tournaments like the Title Tuesday. But 
when you see the first round pairings, you start to realize how hard it actually is to rack up points in this event. I think a lot of people just don't get that someone like Alexander Grishuk might face Ray Robson in the first round. We have GM on GM action from the very first games, and that's what makes this tournament really magical. It's that there's no such thing as a lost round. And every round we have action, we have a lot of top guys losing, and uh, that's a magical formula. And you can almost say there pretty much are no upsets. I mean, sometimes you'll see a real top player lose to a GM that doesn't have the same name recognition. But in this field that is really so strong, uh, everyone has a chance. And let's dive into the actual players who are taking part today. And, okay, look at this. We have Artemiev as the highest rated. Fabiano Caruana, Maxime vasher Legrave, Jan de Pomsky, Eduardo Iturizaga, he was the hero of the last then, event. My monitor is glitching. Who said after <laughs> Eduardo Iturizaga? It's really grainy for some reason. Yeah, the next I, two names. I, I can't really see. Is that a former world champion and perhaps a future world champion? Vladimir Kromnik, <laughs> Alireza Frugia, and then Jose Martinez, well known as Jospom online. He's a popular streamer, and you see his chess.com rapid rating is 2663. So, you know. If he beats somebody who's 2750, we won't be surprised, but it does look like an upset on paper. Yeah, and, and honestly, the uh, complete demolition of what we think of as upsets has been one of the products of online chess th these last couple of years. You look at someone like Jospam, or as he's known on my stream, Jospam, and you look at a performance that he puts in, he gets six out of nine or six and a half out of nine, and he qualifies, and we barely bat an eye. So it's just genuinely amazing how a lot of younger players particularly are making a name for themselves as 2700s in the context of online chess it's a 10 plus 2 time control blitz and time scrambling ability is very important and that's what gives uh a lot of these non-super gms a serious chance as i said earlier to punch above their weight and we will see who is up to the challenge here at the julius bear generation cup and there are a few descriptors that stood out to me. You know, young, almost 2,700, superstars in Blitz. And this one name that comes to mind, he didn't take part in the Bullet Chess Championship. He wasn't invited. He declined. But Nihal Saran is here to play today. So there are even more names than we listed from the notable players. That's how many notable players actually take part in these events. And Nihal Saran is in. Dennis Lazvik not here today because he's already made his way through uh, to the Julius Baird Generation Cup Division 1. He won Division 2 last time, but as you mentioned, Sam Sevian, he lost to Dennis. He did unfortunately not earn his uh, ticket into the top division via the last event, but hey, maybe today will be his day. So uh, the Swiss stage format, Danya, nine rounds, really all up for grabs. It's open to GMs and the top three from each Monday qualifier. As you mentioned, 10 minutes plus two seconds added per move. You need to be speedy with the mouse. You need to think very quickly in critical moments. And it's typical chess scoring, the standard scoring of one point for a win, half a point for a draw, and a donut, zero for a loss. Yeah, pretty cut and dried stuff. Obviously the player's a lot more violent in the early rounds and then the leaders for the end, uh, some of them start to take draws and there's a lot of match strategy and tournament strategy involved in securing a qualification spot for yourself. Uh, but the games are about to begin. We always have a very wide menu, Robert, of fascinating players. So we're going to toggle between a lot of the interesting top games. I vote that we spotlight Vladimir Kramnik uh, for a little while. We have Ali Reza Ferruja. One problem we definitely do not have is the situation where there's one game left. It's a long end game and we have nothing to talk about. We will always have something to talk about in this event. Yeah, because just looking through the list of players, uh, names that I didn't mention, uh, Amin Tabatabai, Shakriar Mamajarov, Levon Aronian. Uh, the list really does go on and on. That's no exaggeration. Jeffrey Zhang is playing. Ivan Saric, who was in the Grand Chess Tour. Uh, Jordan Von Forest, Min Lei, Anish Giri, Gadakomsky. We really can keep going with the names in this field. I'm stoked for uh, Dmitry Andrekin. Georg Meyer, Alexi Serrana, but I can't wait for the games to take off. Yeah, me neither. And we already have some crazy head-on matchups in the first round. Gawain Jones taking on Fabiano Caruana. Just looking at the list of games, my, my mouth starts watering. Unfortunately, we can't cover every game at the same time, but I just think it's so interesting how many different players we get to spotlight in the course of the event. And 
Think about Fabi. You've got the black pieces against a top opening expert, somebody who's written books on a coffee house chess repertoire for white. It's not going to be an easy path to the top for Fabi. And he is looking to avenge himself after the Bullet Chess Championship, where he played well. But obviously, uh, he met a lot of bullet addicts who spend their days and their nights fine-tuning their fast chess craft. Now, he's in a time control that he feels a little bit more comfortable in. Yeah, I think that's important to note that Fabi, he did struggle in the Bullet Chess Championship. He prefers to have time on his clock to calculate, and he's one of the best calculators on the planet. Everyone compliments him on that, and it's just a fact that he is number three in the live ratings, but he was at his peak 28-44. That's pretty nuts to think about uh, where he was just uh, just crushing everybody that's Sinkville Cup 2014 so uh, yeah, we are waiting for moves to come in but as you mentioned Gawain Jones five on a car that's a first round matchup what is this the Olympiad it basically is and given how many countries are being represented I'm going to read off some of the other pairings Robert while we're going to wait for the moves to come in and they should be coming in very soon you've got Levon Aronian against an Italian grandmaster Sabino Brunello uh, we have Cena <laughs> Movahead. Now, this is a very interesting name that we are going to hear a lot more of in the coming months and years. I've played him a lot in Online Blitz. He's, an, he's a FIDE master from Iran. He is unbelievably talented, and he basically plays on even terms with all of the top GMs. He has white against Vladimir Fedoseev. I'm very curious to see how that game goes. I've never seen Cena. I've never seen him uh, play a longer game, but... You know, there's always a first. Is he the next Ali Reza Ferruja? That remains to be seen. That remains to be seen. No, then we no. also have Sam Sevian. Once is enough, isn't it? I, I squeezed that sponge out to its... Mm -hmm. I wrung it out, you know, while when no more water comes out. Yeah, that Cena pun is more common than the name John. So I'm going to have to wrestle with you later, Danya. But I am stoked for the games to begin. And I, you just mentioned some of these names here. And, and something interesting about someone like Cena Mohamed is really, really strong in Blitz. But sometimes I feel like when fans, they see people thrive in Blitz, they assume that that can also be done in longer time controls. And we see the name on this list, right? If you're Cena mm -hmm. Mohamed, it's just an honor to get to play against someone like Vladimir Kramnik, but we shouldn't put that weight of their blitz success into expectations for them in rapid chess. We all hope that everyone has a good day. We don't root for anybody as commentators, but I guess what I'm trying to get across is that these younger players especially who are really good when there's three minute plus zero second increment and they are flagging people in blitz, it doesn't always mm -hmm. translate to when you're playing against Fabiano Caruana or Vladimir Kramnik when they have increment to use so they get additional time which each, with each and every move they make. You're very right. And just the role of class um, and the role of deep positional understanding obviously increases in this time control. I mean, 10 plus two is the time control I like because it really straddles the bridge between, yeah, it has a blitz component on the one hand, particularly toward the end of games. But on the other hand, it really does allow you to make very, very deep moves to display your opening preparation. And that's what I love about online chess in general Top players take it as seriously as they do in over-the-board tournaments. So we see top grandmasters A game when it comes to their opening, when it comes to their deep thinking. And that is, I think, part of the reason younger players who feel like they're, you know, hot stuff after their title Tuesday performance, they score three and a half out of nine, and they begin to see that there's just a couple of things left to learn until they're able to perform to the level of the top guys uh, in the rapid time control. So definitely, I think people like Cena. Uh, these young international masters, even young grandmasters, are looking at this like a stepping stone, like a learning experience on their very, very long path uh, to chess Olympus. And you see in the tour standings, you know, there are some younger players like Dennis Lazovic, tied for eighth with Levon Aronian, uh, but all the way down to a player like Min Lei. That's somebody who has really benefited from chess in having more and more tournaments online. Just more access for somebody who's from a very strong chess country. You actually see another player from Vietnam, Lam Le, a super grandmaster, former World Blitz champion on this list, but there's not always great access to tournaments. So being able to play the elite players from the comfort of your own home, uh, that actually is something that is truly amazing. And it's not 100% the same because there are different tensions when you're sitting across from a player over the board. But there's also fewer pieces getting thrown off the board in time scrambles. <laughs> when you play online, you can pre-move and, hey, guess what? A piece doesn't 
gets swiped off the board when you accidentally hit a rook and it flies over to the next table. Yeah, flies over 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 to Nevada. Although I was watching uh, an interesting blitz video with a time scramble from the 80s, and I was shocked at how cleanly uh, Victor Korchnoi and I think Gary Kasparov are time scrambling. So I'll talk about that more, but I'm pretty sure, Robert, we have a lot of the moves coming in. So we can click into one of the games and we can start going around the horn and seeing if the top guys are already suffering any defeats. Okay, and here we go. Uh, we see that Gawain Jones, you mentioned that matchup against Fabiano Caruana. So relatively early stages, but the queens are off the board. White is temporarily up a pawn. And white can protect that pawn with the bishop going out to f4. That would help the pawn e5. But black is probably ready to soon increase the pressure, maybe a knight e6 type of jump, and bring that knight out into the white camp and create some threat. So I, I just... Look at this position, and I think at first glance, Donya, people count material. White has to be better up a pawn, but that pawn does stick out like a sore thumb on e5. That's very true, and from e6, the knight could also transit over to d4, obviously pressuring the bishop and attacking c2. So I actually think black's knight is a blessing in disguise. It's sitting there on d8, and it's so easy to dismiss a piece that's on the last rank, but you have to examine its potential energy. So... I think Gawain is trying to make a more general choice right now between playing principal chess and clinging to the pawn, which a lot of players would play automatically. But when you're playing Fabi, maybe you're also thinking about playing a move like knight c3 and giving away the pawn. And that's exactly what Gawain Jones did. He went knight c3. He allowed Fabi to take the pawn back on e5. And he's more or less bailing out. But this isn't exactly a draw. Black still has to make one or two careful moves. And then I think the peace accord can be signed. Yeah, though knowing Fabiano and the speed with which he's playing, he feels quite comfortable. That pawn on b7 can be captured, but the rook will slide over to b8, hitting the bishop, and behind it, the pawn on b2. And that starts getting into those types of positions where you can't be too comfortable. You can't relax too early, because if you think it's for sure a draw from either color, honestly, then you, know, you may overlook a little something, and now you're slightly worse, and you have to now find the draw once more. So I think that if you're Fabi, you are slightly worse here. White's piece is a bit more coordinated and active, but he is playing natural looking moves. Bring his king up the board, b7 pawn, still should not be captured. And it was, but I think that just helps. Uh, it's going to help Black's cause. Uh, what a poor quality game. I'm looking at their accuracy scores. It's 97.7 to 97.9. Can we perhaps look at a game that doesn't feature a mistake on every move? Whoa. <laughs> Wait, what? Whoa. What is happening here? Whoa. Do you see the top engine move, Robert? I don't have it open, but I can click. You Are you sitting on your chair, like, firmly? <laughs> the top the top engine move in this position for black is knight e6 to g5. I thought it was a glitch. That is the top engine move. Sacrificing the knight and then trapping the rook on g5 with f5 and h6. That would have been crazy. No, that, that is one of those moves where you're like, um, Fabiano, I know we say you're engine-like, but uh, I think we have to do a, another fair play sweep. By the way, all players have multiple cameras on. They do fair play sweeps before uh, being allowed to be uh, in the competition. So I'm just joking on that front. But Knight G5 there, that would have been absolutely ridiculous. And Gawain Jones playing H4. But I can guarantee you he didn't just play H4 to stop Knight G5. This is just a very common pawn structure arrangement across all endgames. You want your pawns arranged diagonally. The way my coach explained it to me many years ago is in the event of a rook endgame where both sides are taking each other's pawns, when you put your pawns in a staggered position like this, it's harder to capture them in, all, in one fell swoop. Of course, you're also grabbing important space and restricting the pawn mobility of your opponent. So the position remains... Pretty equal, Robert. But with both rooks active, there's a certain tactical component to it. And if one side loses their A pawn, then we'll have stuff to talk about. Yes, but that's, you know, maybe a little bit far away. It does seem pretty level. So do you think we have a moment, Donny, perhaps to change games and look at one of the other superstars in the competition? We absolutely do. We've got a pretty crazy position on the top board between Artemiev and Narayanan, but... I'll give you the final say. Some positions are still in their middle game stage, but okay, Cena Movahead, I got excited. I thought he was up a piece, but then I realized he's down in exchange. So the young Iranian will lose his first game to Vladimir Fedoseyev. 
Yeah, so let's just just choose any game. Donna, you choose, and okay, seems like you picked Artemiev against Narayanan. That whoa, this, the evaluation is going up and up and up. And is that because there's some kind of knight g4, knight h6 checkmating threat? Oh, knight g4, and then knight h6 and queen h8. Yeah. So what's the material count right now? What? Ha yeah. What happens if Black just plays knight takes c6? Um. Oh, it's knight takes g6 and queen oh. h8 mate. Oh my oh. gosh. You know, it's funny. And I saw it. Mm -hmm. I, I was so like looking forward to that knight g4, knight 6 trying to see if there's actually a mate that, yeah, knight takes g6 is a one move tactical shot. That's it. Oh my goodness. I'll show this on the board, Robert, just for uh, the tactical fanatics among us. Knight takes c6 looks like a draw, right? If white plays knight takes c6, black doesn't recapture the knight. Black takes the rook first, then recaptures the knight. And it's basically a dead drop. But no, after knight takes c6, whoop, knight takes g6, LPDO. And if you play rook takes e3, a checkmate on h8. Really beautiful how these combinations arise out of nowhere. And that is why Vladislav Artemiev put his rook on e3 so that when he moves the knight, black cannot capture the rook with check. It would have been a check if the rook were still on e1. Crazy stuff. Stuff that we're expected, expecting from a player like Vladislav Artemiev. But we got a, a whoop out of it, so I'm pretty pumped that we went to that <laughs> game. Uh, but yeah, this does look like, at this point, uh, pretty clear, should be a clear win for Artemio. Now knight g4 uh, probably leads to checkmate, although there is rook d1 check. So I, maybe I'm speaking a little too soon because that would actually be a mistake. As after, uh, maybe we can just quickly point out that knight g4, sure. rook d1 drags the king up to g2. And queen takes c6, the follow-up is check forcing the queens off the board just in time so then white wouldn't be able to deliver the main. <laughs> yep, and I'm trying to make an illegal move three times in a row just to, <laughs> just to show everybody how effective a check can be. The queen trade is forced, and this is how thin the margins are, right? You think the game is over, but you need to demonstrate tactical vigilance really until the very end of the game. So Vladislav is going to take a little bit of time. He does, in fact, convert his advantage. He played C takes B7, Converting a tactical advantage into a material one. He will be up a full pawn in the end game. But Robert, I really think the big reason Black's position is indefensible has to do with the long-term weakness of the king. White has so many prospects for his knight. The queen can jump into e5. I don't see Narayanan defending this in the long run. No, I don't either. So we can trust Artemiev. And I thought we could trust the game between Gawain Jones at five and a crown to just be a draw. But... I'm not so sure anymore. So things have happened in that game, Danya, if we want to go back to see what Fabi is up to, because he's mm -hmm. down a pawn, but he is the initiative Ooh. against that white king. Unbelievable. Black is better here. How do these top players always seem to do that? Dead drawn position, symmetrical. First he acts rook. Now he sacks the A pawn. Now, Robert, I said that the first side to win the opposing A pawn is going to be on the winning end. I think the opposite might be the case. So what's going on here? Not only are Black's three pieces ultra active, but the F2 pawn is hanging. And what Gawain might have missed from a distance is that if he had played King G2, there was a very, very nasty check on F3. And he played King G1. That's another blunder. Fabi's winning. No way. Yeah, I mean, look at this King on G1, right? It looks like... Right, it's safe. You can always go to h2 or g2. But I think right now, the after this white is going to play rook a4, and that would hit both pieces in a row on the fourth rank. Then the knight slides into f3 with check, and back over to e5, and then bishop slides into f3, and then the, all of a sudden we're seeing the contours of a mating attack with that rook on c2 ultimately landing on h1. That would deliver the death now. And now he's got to find one more maneuver he's got to play knight f3 check circle back to e5 in order to keep the bishop protected and then the mechanism you just described robert is going to sound the death knell for white's king so best move here is to play knight f3 check don't play bishop f3 because white's bishop could still cover a first rank check on f1 but fabi's gonna find this he's got no other choice um yeah i'm trying to come up with other ideas for black and oh seems... wait he threw oh, he rushed to check yeah, and I, maybe he want a knight e2 check here because if white takes the knight, then bishop takes wins material. But of course, white would not take that knight e2 and instead move the king away. So we see in the game the knight went to uh, is going to f3 instead uh -huh. of to e2. But yeah, this position is just 
messy and somehow white would hold on White's surviving here i was just showing what happens after 92 check fabi might have assumed that white has to take the knight but no he doesn't because of the lateral attack on the bishop so you're pointing out robert knight f3 check was played king g2 bishop back to d7 so fabi clearly still playing for a win still trying to set up a mating pattern along the long diagonal but white it appears can block this attack with bishop b5 that's exactly what gawain jones just did this is the live position and fabi is running out of attacking ideas yeah it's one move can change the entire nature of the position and the complexion really has changed where black looked coordinated and ready to deliver a checkmate and now black's pieces are all over the place there's like a knight on e1 a rook on c1 <laughs> the bishop on d7 uh, there's trades being offered both of white's minor pieces can be captured but if you take the knight on c3 you lose the bishop on d7 and let's not forget that white is up a pawn so if fabi has more imprecision that could really be a problem for him wow yeah fabi might want to consider repeating moves here robert precisely for that reason you make one incautious move like rook takes knight you allow bishop takes bishop and gawain's the one who's going to be declining a draw because at that point white could even give up his f2 pawn without really fearing uh that he will succumb to a checkmating construction but oh fabi continues to play for a win he plays bishop e6 he had a repetition in his pocket there he still does with knight f3 and knight e1 but i think he's going to keep it going try to milk white's clock down even further gawain down now to two and a half minutes and the less time you have the harder it is to defend a position like this yeah, and 92, the rook slides over to b1. <laughs> Please don't blunder your rook. And now the bishop on b5 is loose. So uh, both sides have pieces on squares that may not be optimal, but I don't see the mating net anymore. And I do think that Gawain has done a really nice job of you know, being on the verge of fully surviving this. Indeed, if, if he moves his bishop, which hopefully he will do, he defended it with his knight. Bobby continuing to chisel into White's position. Hither and thither goes the Rook. It goes back to the second rank. But at this point, it's one move threats. And Gawain should be able to deal with them. Although, I would still be terrified here, Robert. After something like King G1, Black can go Bishop H3 and set up more mating threats. I think the biggest X factor here might be White's clock situation. He's down to 90 seconds now. And every move is taking him a good chunk of time. Mm-hmm. And that becomes a problem. Well, there is a two-second increment. You get two seconds added to your clock with each and every move you make, uh, but that's just two seconds, and you may need two minutes to calculate some of the tactics. And right now, Gawain is burning more clock. And Dino, the F2 pawn, it's loose. The rook at A4 can slide over to F4, but maybe your knight and bishop configuration over there on the queen side, they are protected for now. But maybe if you're Gawain, now is the time to just secure the draw and say, I, I will realistically not win this game. I just need to make sure I don't lose. For sure. I really like the look of rook f4. Forget the A pawn. You're not you're very unlikely to win this game. I think King g1 is a viable alternative. I'm not sure what's worrying him. It might be bishop h3. It might be knight f3 check. You start seeing ghosts when you're this low on time and you're facing someone this strong. But I think Gawain is knocking on the door of a very solid round one draw. Not a big upset. He's got the white pieces, but just a couple of moves away here from, from signing those peace accords after all. Okay. Well, I'll keep an eye on this game, although Gawain dropping to 20 seconds. Uh, are there any other games that are catching your eye? There's a crazy game between Clemente Sichev and Maxime Vachelagrov. Not sure who that is. It's a relatively <laughs> new, young, up-and-comer grandmaster. So I'm going to flip to that game where Clemente is playing on his last seconds. But, Robert, he is up in exchange, and he is definitely better on the board. Okay, so he has four seconds. and went all the way down to zero for a split second there. But he must have made a quick move to gain a couple. And what is happening? The I'm counting pieces really quickly. White is up in exchange, but Black has two pawns for that exchange. So black has knight and two pawns for a rook. And whose king is weaker? I think white's king is weaker. <laughs> white's king is definitely weaker, although he put his king on g2, which I think is a very reasonable move given the clock situation. Although you have to be very careful. Bishop takes f2 and queen takes g3 is a possibility once this rook moves out from c2. And it looks like Clemente, with his last seconds, is just kind of trying to make moves and avoid blunders. And that's a very dangerous strategy because... Maxime is continuing to improve his position. He might go h5. 
You might go d4 at some point. Although you got to be really careful about opening up the diagonal for white's bishop. Really hard to assess this position. Yeah, and it, the knight back to d6, it looked like it received a question mark. Not the best move, but maybe a good move in your opponent's time trouble. Because you know, also, I love the standings. I see them flipping as people uh, gain a victory. And we see new names entering the top of the leaderboard. But the knight back to e4. And what is happening here, Danya? I'm just as clueless as you are. Okay, d3 is not possible. And Viel plays h5, which is a move I really, really like. You give your king a Luft square on h6. So queen f7 isn't as scary of a threat, but I would still play rook f8. And white's running out of helpful moves. So you might see Clemente just sort of going rook d3 back to f3. Instead, he drops back to c2. He's still very much playing for a win, Robert. Trying to target this knight. Maybe the rook should slide to e8, and it does. But mm -hmm. here oh. goes White's Rook. Up it goes. And Bishop takes e4 is a deadly threat. Yeah, because now White has all the firepower aiming at that uh, knight on e4. And by the way, Maxime is down under uh, 30 seconds himself right at oh this moment. God. So yeah, it's a tough position for him. I don't like his chances anymore. How do you defend against Bishop takes e4? And f takes e4, rook takes e4. If Black has to give up his queen, I think the king is a little bit too wide open for Black's position to be defensible. And Veal down at 10 seconds. He doesn't know what to do. How can he? I mean, this position is really, really rough. And oh, the moves have come in very fast, but White has a winning edge. And he's given up his knight on e4. He's still down in exchange. He's got to try d3 here. Only source of counterplay is that pass d pawn. But Clemente takes the pawn. And Veal dropped his bishop back, and he resigned. And what a yep. result. Yeah, I mean, Maxime... He was ahead in the clock. His position was hanging on by a thread. And, you know, you could, can't play for time in these events because the two-second increment does add up. And Clemente uh, Saichev, he is like a 2,900-plus blitz player. He yep. can play on just his waning seconds. He can indeed. And I'll flip to one of the last remaining games where Sam Sevian, another favorite, is also struggling mightily against another one of those good blitz players, solid GMs, Ante Burkic. And Burkic is completely winning up two pawns in this endgame, about to force the queens off the board, and with plenty of time to convert the ensuing knight versus bishop endgame, Robert. Whoa. Yeah, it just looks great. Although, and there's no although, I'm trying to come up with some hope yeah, for although, Sim Sevian. There's although nothing. He's just moving the piece. The king will run around to g7. You don't have a perpetual. Maybe you can try queen a3 check. He's trying queen e3 check, but... That's not good enough. The king's just going to circle around to g7. This is resignable. Yes, and Burkic made a name for himself in the last FIDE World Cup. The next one is starting in like a week from now. But Burkic, he eliminated some high-rate opposition in a previous World Cup. So he's a very strong grandmaster, even if his rating is not as high as Sam Sabian's. So, Robert, the only thing for Black to avoid here is to stalemate White's king. Every schoolboy knows that you want to avoid a situation where you put your queen on g3 when White's king is on h1. White can maybe try queen g3, queen takes g3, king h1 here. I would try a Rosen trap here shamelessly if I were Sam Sevian. Yeah, he's not going to get the opportunity. No. <laughs> you want to do that, but here knight g4, queen f2, and I was at queen h2 to trade queens, but queen f1 looks like checkmate, and Oof. that's what was played. That is a brutal loss suffered by Sam Sevian with the white pieces, but the good news is it's a pretty long event, Robert. You can lose round one. We've seen the Akara Nakamura lose round one in RCC type events, and then come back with room to spare and qualify to the top group. So these top players, they're used to adversity. They're not going to cry over a single loss. No, they won't cry, but it hurts and your tie breaks suffer. So if there's a big tie, like what you said with six and a half points or six points fighting for that eighth spot so you can get into the match for division one, your tie breaks won't be good if you lose the first round, but there is time to come back. Maxime Vashilagrov, he can go and win seven games in a row. The competition is fierce, but he does have a shot. And we like to focus on the games where the top guys are having difficulty, but there were also a lot of smooth wins. Vladimir Fedosev, as I pointed out, very smooth victory over a difficult opponent, the young Iranian Fina, Finam Sina Mobahed. And Vladimir Kramnik, he ran through Kadir Gusenov. That was like a Mack truck running over a small car. That was not even close. So Vladimir off to a one out of one start. We'll definitely spotlight him in round two, where he's going to face a very difficult opponent with the black pieces this time. 
And I just caught the, uh, I thought the round was over, but there was just one game going, and I saw Alexi Serrana beat Niels Grandelius with black. I mean, think about that matchup. Serrana, Grandelius, Niels Grandelius, 2650+. plus. Alexi Serrana, 2680+. plus. Like, these players are very closely rated, and those first-round matchups, as you said before the show began, uh, very juicy from the start. And now we're in round two with even juicier matchups. Yeah, I was going to say, we've got... Nicholas Theodoru up on the top boards. I flipped on Frederick Svane, not Rasmus Svane, which is a more household name, but his brother, who recently became a GM, has crossed 2,600 and is incredibly promising. Has a very different style, Robert. This is what I think is so amazing. Rasmus, his brother, super positional. Always plays 1d4. Frederick is a crazy player. 1e4 to his dying day. And Vladimir Kramnik saying, you want to play e4, young man? I'll give you a Sicilian. How about that? How about them apples? <laughs> and Kramnik, you know, he's venturing into a more combative territory. It's an early round here. He has done well in rapid online events. Uh, you know, he does not like it when there's no increment. The moral <laughs> degradation <laughs> hurts his soul. <laughs> but <laughs> we're back in a Skeveningen. Sorry, Bic. Uh, we can't pronounce this very well. Down maybe hey, you have no, <laughs> terrible. It's it's a... I did a YouTube video recently, and I got a lot of comments. Like, I'm from Schreveningen, and you mispronounced it, young American <laughs> fellow. We, we, we don't have that sound in you know, our vocabulary, but we try our best, and it's a classical Sicilian, and now Kramnik has decided to strike with E5. So this is a critical moment in this game because Black often wants to carve that E5 square out for his pieces, but after this knight trade, this pawn on C6 even though it might be isolated after f e5, d e5, uh, then the knight on c3 is dominated by the pawn three squares away. So there are always pluses and minuses to each and every trade. There most certainly is, and white can, of course, push the pawn over to f5. I think a lot of less experienced players are tempted by that, this King's Indian attack style idea with g4, g5. The problem and another benefit of this pawn on c6 is that it can support the pawn break d5. So white isn't going to even get off the ground before black starts massacring him in the center. So I think Frederick can keep the tension. He can play f takes c5. And you often see white playing moves like queen e1, queen g3. The king sometimes slides over to h1 so that if black ever brings his queen out to b6, that move no longer comes with a check. And it takes a lot of the sting out of the attack against b2. Right. Yeah, B2 is one of those pawns that you're happy to grab, but not if it comes at the cost of your king side. And so I, I look at these positions. You know, F takes E5, very tempting. But after D takes E5, black has the isolated C pawn, white has the isolated E pawn. I typically like having more pawns in the center, uh, but an open F file is often worth it to white. So, you know, Dinah, these decisions, these little moments, uh, they may seem insignificant, but they actually might tell the tale of who will have the upper hand in this game. And not to change the subject, but one thing that struck me, Robert, I played Vladimir in a 3 plus 2 blitz match uh, a month or so ago, and it's that he actually plays quite fast in rapid chess and blitz chess. Yeah, when we get down to a time scramble, that might not be his favorite aspect of uh, online chess, mm -hmm. to put it mildly. But when you actually watch him in early middle games, what struck me is how much I was down on the clock almost every game. Vladimir has such a good understanding of so many different types of positions, and he harnesses that to build up a big time advantage. He's actually very difficult to play, and I think Frederick, sensing that he's not as familiar with these positions, bailing out with a queen trade, but the end game is obviously still very combative, very unbalanced, and I think you put it very well. Is Black's poor pawn structure going to be the deciding factor, or is it Black's relatively uh, well-placed knight, and the fact that White's knight on c3 is tremendously restricted. Really interesting, rich endgame here. Can we just talk about how instructive that was? You may think, well, what did Vladimir do? Why didn't he take that queen on d8 sooner? He was really calculating which piece is better because if his bishop were on d8, maybe that bishop would slide to b6 to offer a trade of dark square bishops and fix black's pawn structure. Taking with a rook on d8 challenges for an open file, so... That makes sense as well. So I just ha really want to give a shout out to Vladimir for not rushing that decision. A lot of us would take instantly. We would have pre-moved. But that was a moment that was worthy of calculation. And I think that's what the best mm -hmm. players do is they don't take any position for granted. It's not just like, okay, whatever. It's equal no matter what. It's like, well, let me see how I can possibly get an interesting chance 
if I take with one piece versus another. So I thought that was pretty cool to see from Vladimir right there. And I'm always trying to learn when I come to I'm trying to help the audience learn. But I myself feel like that kind of moment where I wouldn't be sure necessarily, but I probably would just rush a decision because who cares? Mm-hmm. I like to see that from the top players. Automatic moves, right? We don't even realize how many assumptions we make. I pause on this position because I think a big reason Kramnik didn't take with the bishop consists in this move, knight c3 to a4, trading on white's own terms. And unfortunately, after knight takes c4, no, white doesn't take the rook. That's illegal. White takes the bishop first, hits the other rook with the knight, and unfortunately, black can only recapture one minor piece at a time, and both rooks are hanging. So I'm pretty confident that this is the line Vladimir Kramnik calculated, and this swayed him in the direction of rook takes d8. But your point... Robert is very well taken. These top players, they don't make any assumptions. They never take anything for granted. And they realize that the moment we make an automatic move is oftentimes the moment that we miss a good opportunity to turn the game around. And guess what? Second time around, Kramnik took with the bishop. And I think we're going to see that bishop land on b6. I think black is doing really, really well in this end game at this point. Yeah, bishop b6 fixes black's pawn structure in the event of a trade. Bishop a5 goes right after the e4 pawn, and you try to compromise white's pawn structure on the queen side. So multiple options for that dark bishop. The a7 pawn is actually under attack. If you give white a free move, bishop takes a7 is actually a threat because the bishop on d8 is loose, only the rook on a8 defending it. Indeed, and Vladimir with another think in this critical moment, trying to figure out the best way to employ his bishop, or perhaps to trade it off. Of course, white can meet bishop b6 with king f2, and we start getting this tug-of-war battle where both sides are trying to engineer the trade on their own terms. So as Vladimir Kramnik ponders uh, his next move, we will keep checking back into this endgame as it heats up further, but we've got a lot of other amazing matchups. Fabiano Caruana, I think, won his first round against Gawain Jones, uh, who got a little bit too low on time, and he faces... Russian Grandmaster Alexander Rachmanov in a very interesting Sicilian. So I flipped that game. No, this is not a Sicilian. This was... Oh, it was, yeah. but it wasn't a conventional one. You won't believe what Sicilian this was. A Nimzovich variation, which is mm-hmm. E4, C5, Knight F3, and then Knight F6. A favorite weapon of this uh, Grandmaster, Alexander Rachmanov. And uh, Shakar Majarov has played that before. It's quite tricky, but you can trick yourself because if you look at this position... White's king, there, it's got bubble wrap around it with all those pawns, four of them, <laughs> in fact. But the black king is stuck in the center. And Fabiano is thinking, how do I improve my position? Uh, one move that comes to mind, or I should say an idea, is h4 to h5, just to cement black's pawn structure in place. Another move is rook to g3, saying to that bishop on f8, are you sure you want to develop because g7 would be loose? And so I feel like there are several ways to play this position for white. You could also think about playing g4 and then try to get g5 later. So there are several options for white, and he starts with rook g3. I like that the most because I think freezing mm-hmm. your opponent is a really good idea, especially in quicker time controls. But what is actually black's plan? Because if you play a4 as black, white happily plays b4 and shuts that side of the board down. And to piggyback off of your bubble wrap analogy, Robert, as queen c7 is played. Oh, that blunders rook takes d5. Rook takes d5 wins the game on the spot because of this devastating follow-up check on d... Oh, my. How long did that take him? One second? Two seconds? Fabiano's like, I eat this kind of stuff for breakfast. Yeah, he doesn't even have the eval bar at his disposal. He just has his (laughs) big old brain. And he (laughs) takes the knight, opens the e-file, and... You can't take. That's clear because bishop takes d6, pawn takes is checked both to the king from the queen on e2 and to the queen on c7 thanks to that pawn on d6. And actually, you might just get checkmate. I might even take your queen. Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, that makes matters worse. But if you go king e7, I don't think you take this rook on c8. A lot of us no. would be tempted to get our material back. Sure, white would have an advantage there. But I think white can play with like queen f3 and just go straight for the black king because look, there are no defenders around it. The rook on h8 not playing a part. The bishop on f8 stuck at home. And yeah, this looks like a very one-sided affair. Queen takes d5, going to be the follow-up. This is happening. Knight king e7 played. Alexander Romanov does not want to suffer uh, anymore. I think he's going to resign if Fabi finds, when Fabi finds queen f3. Obviously, queen h5 is also possible, but black can meet that with g6. You could drop back to f3 then if you really want to be clinical. That opens up another pathway 
for the queen. And that's the kind of stuff we see top players do, Robert, right? We could roll our eyes at that and say, well, what's the need to be that precise? Doesn't queen f3 win? And it does. But these top players are so used to demanding perfection from themselves. Bobby, for, particularly for younger players, he's taking his time. He sees queen f3. He knows it wins the game. But he's spending that extra 30 seconds making sure that he's not allowing any unnecessary chances. I tell that to my students who play a little bit too fast when they sense that the win is close at hand. Even people like Fabiano Caruana take more time than they need to make sure that they don't let the win slip from their grasp. Yeah, I, I think this is super instructive. And uh, they just don't play without thinking. Sometimes they calculate very quickly, so they think in half a second. But it's not just make a move with their hand. They are using their brains. And so queen h5, it may be more precise based on what you're saying. g6, queen back to f3. Now you also have the f6 square to infiltrate. So I, I like that point by you, Danya. I think that Fabi is going to try to be completely accurate here. And that way he can end the game in, say, four moves rather than going down a path that will require 20. And obviously, he's not going to take forever. He's going to leave himself... Good amount of time. And he does, in fact, play queen f3. Yeah, Rahmanov responds with f6, as we expected. And now the simple queen takes d5. Just poses unstoppable threats to the black king. If I may show one really pretty line. Queen takes d5 already on the board. If black plays f takes d5. Oh, okay. Queen takes d5 check is made in two. I was thinking you go queen f7 check, rook g6 check, and bishop b3. But isn't this... A slightly prettier mate and robert i always love in these situations to point out the role played by a seemingly random pawn were that pawn not on c3 were that bubble wrap not in place black would have been living to fight another day after king to b4 as it stands black is checkmated but obviously queen e5 and knight f7 is another pretty mating construction look at black's pieces hemming in his own game lacking development and that move rook g3 that fabi played just as we tuned in uh, that was one to keep that bishop on f8 stuck at home. And now queen f... Oh, he takes on f6. This is good. Everything's good enough. He's going to go rook e3 check. Uh, then rook e8. Same idea. I think he's just so winning, Danya, that pretty much every move that didn't drop a queen would have won him the game. And another instructive point. A lot of people, when they watch these types of games with the engine, they think of moves like EF as a huge mistake. But... After king d, knight f7, black can resign because black is down a full minor piece in the end game. There's nothing left to play for. And so Rahmanov is going to let his king get checkmated. He's going to resign in this position. What a game. What an attacking game by Fabiano Caruana. So instructive. And, and so different from his first round game where he probably shouldn't have won that. He wasn't really better. It was he was down a pawn, but it's pretty much even material. And then in game two, he's like, let's change up the style. I have the white pieces. And he went for the crush. So a nice game from Fabi. We'll see more of him in this event. Uh, where to next? You picked Fedoseyev against the Adoru. And the eval bar says equal. Slightly better for black, but I'm trying to... Equal? Wait, what? Okay. Black's up a pawn, right? Someone vomit all over the chessboard. I'm like, just, you know, <laughs> Whoa. let out all the minor... Whoa. <laughs> what just happened? Whoa. Double exclaim. Knight takes f2 just happened. Explain that to me, Donya. What's going on here? Uh, my guess is as good as yours. Uh, originally, I thought his idea is queen takes d2 check, and it is. Okay, so it's a long-term peace sacrifice by Nicholas Theodore. I think I, actually his logic is very simple. He was up a pawn when we tuned in. So knight takes f2 offers him. Sorry, no. Material is equal. So he's won two pieces, uh, two pawns for the minor piece, right? Yeah, three he pawns. Two, he was he up took a pawn. D2. You're right. And he was up a pawn. So he's not <laughs> looking for anything specific. Yeah, this is how complicated the position is. Can't even calculate material. What a commentator. But I think he's just going to play bishop takes e2, drop his queen back, let's say, to d6. And he's going to say, listen, got to pass b pawn. I've got the, the four on two on the king's side. And white has long-term problems with his king. Very practical. There we go. Yeah, and actually we tuned in, like, just a move late in a sense because black took a pawn but walked into a pin so all of this was more or less forced from theodore he had to find this series of moves but now that we're in this position so we've mm -hmm. finally done our math three pawns extra for black a knight extra for white that's about even right each pawn worth a point a knight worth about three but as we look at the clock in particular and i'm looking at the remaining pieces on the board I do feel like Fedosev has very good chances to win the game, despite the eval bar being completely unbothered, saying it's level. 
I look at this and say, well, what is Black going to do? Black kind of has to sit still. I don't see an actual idea for Theodoru. Maybe you want to trade one pair of knights, but I'm, I'm thinking that it's more difficult to play from Theodoru's perspective in this position, especially when you're down under two minutes. That's a great point. And if Black ever loses the B-pawn, that still might be a salvageable position with a four on two, but you're going to have to suffer uh, to hold that for many, many moves. And with only a two second increment, you're never going to be able to build up more time than you have. He's down to a minute 40. Betaseev can also try to pose threats on the king side. You can see him sticking a knight in the center pretty menacingly. He's already threatening knight c4, which will in fact allow him to win that b6 on. But you could also envision, Robert, the other knight potentially coming out to h5, and the rook could almost play a defensive role, blocking a check with the queen on d2 uh, from e2. And Black's knight, at the present moment, is fully restricted by White's pieces. I really like the way that Vladimir is coordinating his pieces and starting to pose very unpleasant threats both to the b-pawn and to Black's king. Nicholas has a tough defensive task ahead of him, and even knight c3 can be considered in this position. Yeah, it's difficult to answer this question. What trades does Black want? A queen trade probably helps the defensive task, but you probably want a queen trade and a knight trade after that because two knights can be very, very tricky, not just because you might miss a fork in a scramble, but because they can team up on certain squares and pawns. So I, I do think that the ideal set of trades for Black is getting those queens off the board and then also getting a pair of knights off the board. And then finally, I think Nicholas can feel more comfortable in his quest to make a draw. And he's also an excellent blitz and bullet player. So, you know, he will really make these minute and 22 seconds count. We'll keep an eye on this game, but I'd like to return, Robert, if we may, to the Kramnik game because we have major developments there. And these developments, I thought, were favoring Black. But upon closer examination, I actually think that Frederick Svane might be the one uh, who is pressing for a win. I saw this rook on b2, I saw this pawn on f4, and I saw the pressure that Black can exert down the second rank. So can I be forgiven for thinking that Kramnik is winning? And I'm biased, of course, always, in favor of the higher rated player. Uh, you're completely forgiven. And look at how Kramnik just played that, by the way. I was no. looking, wait, what's wrong with rook takes c2 and things like that? He says it's more important for me to keep that white rook away from the defense of the king. If there was a rook takes g7 at any point, the g2 pawn would be defended. But now in this position, there's going to be a rook takes c2 and maybe an f3 or a bishop f3 or a bishop f1. And that white king could feel exposed. And a great reaction from Frederick here because h4, if that bishop were not hitting the pawn in f4, g4 for black would be so scary. But mm -hmm. you can't push the g pawn without losing the f pawn. So that's really, really good news for Frederick. He wants to take on g5, play rook g7 to follow, and get rid of those black pawns. Yeah, Kramnik really trying his best to generate winning chances, but all of his attempts were in Svein. And he's the one uh, who has to worry about holding a draw. How are we gonna, how is the game gonna unfold here? Kramnik now down to a minute. Yeah, I said that he plays fast, but sometimes even the greats need to spend some time to think. He plays F3, which I think is a good bailout move. He's trying to trade as many pawns as possible. He's gonna play bishop takes F3, bishop takes E4. And when, when the smoke clears, Robert, I think we're likely to get a C and an A pawn against a C-pawn, but with the opposite colored bishops, should be a holdable position for black. But I'm starting to worry when Vladimir falls behind a minute because you know what that means. Uh-oh, I jinxed him, didn't I? No, I think you just called it. You said that it should be this, but you were worried about his time. And he took on H4. Now white has connected passers. And it's not just that, F5, F6, F7, a very Oof. direct plan. I mean, there's also pretty, as long as you get your pawn to F6, White has great chances to win the game because perhaps Black will have to sacrifice a bishop just to stop that pawn from promoting. This is very worrisome for Vladimir here, but I think this is a big moment for Frederick. What move do you make? I would move my king, but if I go king g1, then bishop f3, that doesn't stop anything. Oh, so yeah, I, you could get made it. I guess king h3, but that also looks kind of scary because your king doesn't have so many squares to go to from there. Yeah, and you could be forgiven for thinking that like King H3 walks into a checkmate, but Frederick calculates the variations. King H3 on the board and F5. Look at how precisely he is handling this position. He uses the F pawn, pushes it up to F6, ties down Black's bishop to D5, and at that point, the job isn't done. White might have to rely on his past A pawn to really overextend 
Black's defensive forces. But definitely the correct move here is F6. Yes, and you're going to win a piece, I think, by force. Because even if the bishop comes to D5, oh. you, you, yeah, you get your rook G7 check, wow. and a bishop D6 check, then a rook E7 check. It's actually a very forcing sequence. And Beautiful. unfortunately for Vladimir, Frederick has two pawns remaining. If you could get that last pawn, rook and bishop versus rook, that is a theoretical draw. Unfortunately, a, a pawn will remain on the board, and that is why Frederick should get this victory. And pausing at the right moment, the winning move, and I won't make it on the board. We'll wait for him to carry out the winning sequence. It's pretty basic Betty here. Yeah, Rook G. Oh, and he missed it. He played A4, which is the move I was initially relying on. It's still winning, but I guess I do have to show the winning line at this point, Robert. I'm pretty surprised. He found the hard moves, and he, and he missed the easy winning sequence. Bishop D6, Rook E7. Now, you can't go to F8 because the Rook drops back with a discover check, and after King D at F7... No, that's not the move. That's not wow. the move because black can eliminate all of white's pawns as you had indicated. So maybe that's the reason Frederick didn't go for the line. You have to throw in another check, then come back to E5, yeah. and only then you're ready to push F7. Yeah, that would have been very hard to find. And instead, the position we currently have is this one. Should still be a win for white, but work still required. He trades the rooks. We like that, that decision. I think I understand why he did it, but the fact that he's thinking after offering the trade is strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you think before making that trade, and Vladimir doesn't have time, so he probably will, in fact, lose this game. Uh, but that that I think we're biased to an extent by the eval bar. I thought it was just winning for White because the eval bar off the side said, oh, White <clears> just has this in the bag. But there was much more than met the eye that I guess White could not actually keep the pawns in that variation we were showing. Now White is essentially two pawns ahead while black is one pawn ahead on the h file white is two pawns ahead on e7 and a5 and that bishop on e2 i think it has too much to do and that way it but, can't handle everything but what do you do what's the winning strategy because the moment you inch your king over to the other side of the board black is going to use his h pawn as a deflection to get that e7 pawn and once black gets e7 the king might be able to make it to the promised land in time i think frederick is Treading water, kind of his engine is idling. He's trying to find a Zugzwang, mm. but King F6 always met with H4. Where's the win? Okay, so can I... I want to put my King on F6, but... I, yeah, you're right. This is very difficult stuff. Maybe you go C4. Maybe you intercept oh. the bishop, then take on H5, and maybe you've got just enough breathing room between these pawns, but he takes the other route, and apparently that gives away the win. So C4 was an amazing move. I think, in to some extent, it makes perfect sense. You're trying to eliminate the past H pawn, but it's also counterintuitive because you want more pawns remaining. At least that's what you think. Mm -hmm. uh, opposite colored bishops, if I only have two pawns remaining, oh, they should, probably should make a draw. But when you have split pawns, in bowling, it stinks to have a split. In end games like this, it's great to mm -hmm. have a split because it means that black's pieces cannot oh! easily defend against both. A6! Oh, A6. <gasps> he blundered A6! What an instructive tactic. That's a deflection of white's own and the king going to circle around to F8 when promotion will be unstoppable. Robert Kramnik had to make a very difficult move. He had to play C5 with the king still on E8 and putting the pawn on a dark square, always a hard thing to do with your last seconds. A8 equals queen is going to follow and a beautiful, beautiful winning tactic. That is a deserved victory by Frederick Svane. It wasn't smooth, but I think he earned it. Yeah, you don't have to be perfect in these type controls. He almost let it slip, but at the end, he got the job done. He gets a victory over former world champion Vladimir Kromnik. So a nice win for Frederick. He did have the upper hand throughout. He played some really nice ideas. And Donya, I mean, with that, this round two is coming to an end, and we've seen some great chess. We have indeed, and a couple of games still trickling down to its conclusion. We have uh, Nicholas Theodoro, who did manage to hold that position uh, against... Vladimir Fedoseev. So already crazy GM on GM matchups, Robert. And the best news is that we're only two rounds in. We've got seven rounds to go in the main tournament. Oh, yes, we do. So Don and I will take a short break. Some of these players, they'll stretch their own legs and get ready for more action here at the Julius Bear Generation Cup plan. We'll be right back. It doesn't look like much but neither would a Sicilian defense to the untrained eye. This is a performance enhancer. You don't see it. How about now?
Manage your air quality, sharpen your performance, change the game with air things. Welcome back to the Julius Bear Generation Cup. This is the play-in stage as players vie for Division One and the other two divisions of the knockout, which will happen at the end of August. I'm Grandmaster Robert Hess. Alongside me is Grandmaster Daniel Naroditsky. Danya, we've had two excellent rounds in the books, and round three promises more excitement as it's just Grandmaster on Grandmaster action nonstop today. It's almost like a tournament, Robert, where any Grandmaster is allowed to join. And you've got actual combative matchups as early as round one. I mean, wouldn't that be a pretty good series of tournaments to hold? Maybe with like a final somewhere after the tournaments are completed. I don't know, just some ideas that I had this morning while waking up. Your ideas are excellent on and off the chessboard, clearly. And while we are seeing that the third round is commencing, we saw some players like Fabiano Caruana go to two out of two. Frederick Svane beat... Vladimir Kramnik to also join at the top of the leaderboard. And you've chosen the matchup between Levon Aronian and Alexei Dreyev. So it's good to show Levon for the first time today. He won his second round. I was keeping an outside eye on that. It was a really close game. It was a tough battle for him. But he got the job done, and now he remains at a perfect score. He does indeed. But that perfect score is in jeopardy at the hands of the very experienced Russian GM, the opening expert, Alexei Drev, who is no stranger to online chess. He played in almost every RCC event last year, and a 2 out of 2 score is not easy to achieve in this tournament. I'm having a hard time identifying the opening in this game. This was a Sicilian, believe it or not. I don't think that's obvious, given the pawn structure we have, but this was an opening that we know very well, Robert, a delayed Alapin, which both of us are pretty partial to. Yeah, it's funny because it looks like a French defense based on Black's pawn structure, yes. the bishop on c8, but there's a white pawn on c4. And you're like, how did that get there? Usually it's back on c2. 
but it's because it was an Alapin with C3 Sicilian, and then the pawn did go up to C4 to kick the Black Queen back. So Drev, you mentioned he's an opening expert. He's been a second for... Uh, Shakar Mamajarov and others. He himself has been over 2,700. He's well known for his prowess, in, both as an opening theoretician, but also as a speed chess demon. And here in this game with the black pieces, he's a bit stuck. And I think the reason he's stuck is that bishop on c8, not a very good piece. Not a very good piece. And if you try to secure employment for the bishop with b6, then you're going to be resigning that game after bishop f3. The other bishop is making contact with the knight. So I think it's a combination of two factors. The first, as you said, is the bishop. The second is your general lack of space and your general lack of good squares for your other minor pieces. In terms of fixing the situation, I would consider starting with the knight b to d7, obviously creating a one-move threat of e5, but why could simply drop the bishop back to g3? And anytime you push a pawn, if b6, you open up the long diagonal. If you push e5 prematurely, you give the knight a beautiful spot on f5. So instead, Alexei putting a bishop on d7 and I think preparing to develop his knight to c6. So Black's position is solid, but it's definitely very cramped and rather unpleasant. And, you know, people think of Levon Aronian as being this maestro tactical genius, that he, and he is that. But you know what's really annoying about playing Levon is he often plays very quickly. And his blistering pace is especially problematic when he is actually better. He doesn't have to bluff. <laughs> he doesn't have to go for anything speculative. He just has more space. His bishops are on excellent squares. Uh, this knight on b8 is undeveloped. It now has moved up to c6. But now white can trade a bunch of times, and black has a bad endgame. Because if you just take on c6 twice, you leave black with these split pawns on the queen side, and those are isolated weaknesses that white can try to exploit. And he can exploit it from different directions, right? You can play queen d1 to f3. You can put the queen on a4 and long term that's the keyword when you try to examine this position i don't like having long-term weaknesses in rapid time control games because you're gonna have to worry about them for many many moves to come you're gonna have to burn a lot of clock but levon taking a fundamentally different approach he says i'm the side of the space advantage i want to keep as many pieces on the board as possible but robert i still think alexi drev is breathing a small sigh of relief he's crossed one hurdle he's completed his development but now he's got to guarantee better spots for his pieces because Levon, he can stick a bishop on d6, and he has a very simple plan of putting a rook on d1. And that's exactly what Alexei Drev is trying to do, but can Levon sneak in a little bishop take c6 action here? Isn't yes. that a pawn? It definitely is a pawn. And I think we can understand why Alexei went for this, that grandmasters do not like to suffer without space. They'd rather give up material and say, at least I have some activity for my own pieces, but bishop takes c6, bishop takes c6 from black, bishop takes e5, objectively white is better, and this is why Levon plays bishop Ooh. g3. He's saying that the threat is strong in the execution, that this e5 pawn, it sticks out, maybe I can grab it later. I'm, I'm not at all claiming that that was the best decision. It's clear that bishop takes c6, but bishop e5 was better, but I think that it just goes to show that these high-level players... They just want to control the dynamics. They don't even want the material if it means that their opponent is struggling to find ideas. Bishop e6 was a good idea, Danya. I think that black is uh, fixing the problems in the position, but the mm -hmm. d5 square, the light square diagonal from f3 down to b7 pawn, I do still like white's position. Agreed. I think white can consider that old plan of queen e2 and rook ad1, but one problem that Levon faces here is that the immediate knight d5 is just not as good as it looks because it doesn't pose any threat. So let's say he goes knight d5. Alexei doesn't have to overreact. Bishop takes d5 would be a terrible idea. White recaptures with the c-pawn. You're going to lose the e-pawn. The diagonal for the white bishop is expanded. But Alexei can play a move like rook c8 here. And guess what, Robert? Knight d5 is on the board. And Drev does take a more drastic approach. He plays e4. And now you've got to be really careful because queen takes c7 might run into bishop d6. Even that is not the end of the story. When the queen drops back, a lot of white's pieces are hanging, but I would sidestep that. I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole, and I would just recapture with the knight. And the fact that Alexei is thinking tells me that he senses the danger here, and he does recapture with a horsey. 
But this illustrates exactly uh, what I've been saying, is that look at Levant's position. He has the bishop pair. The bishop on g3 mm -hmm. now has a fully open diagonal, and that's why the knight came out to f5. But what Levant really wants, and I think he'll trade queens and play bishop f4. Maybe bishop f4 first. I'm not sure uh, which is better. But he just wants to keep his bishop pair. He'll play a rook to c1. Maybe the knight will go out to a5 or c5 at the right moment. But I feel like in this kind of position that the bishop pair, that feels like a legitimate advantage, even though the evaluation bar says... Come on, and black's not really in big danger. It's you're just slightly better for white. I think from a practical point of view that the players look at this and say, no, white's definitely better. They don't have the evaluation bar to look at. Great call by you. Queen takes d8. The reason I think being Levon wanted to sidestep the possibility of queen d8 to b6. Alexei could have kept the queens on the board in the event of the immediate bishop f4. So he does exactly what Dr. Hess prescribed. He takes his medicine, he keeps his bishop pair, and like you said, very easy ways to improve the position for white. A super important consideration in rapid time control. How easy is it to make helpful moves that make my position better? Here, much easier for white than it is for black. I guess black could play rook ac8, but maybe that runs into knight a5. White's rooks just more effective because they play in concert with the bishop pair, and particularly this dark squared bishop that really lords over both sides of the board. White is squarely uh, in the driver's seat here, and Alexei's still suffering, even though he's got a little bit more space. So the and eval bar says what? 0.3 better for white? Is that what, is that what it three. says? Exactly. If you looked at this position, like let's say we were just playing a game, I feel like I would think, and you can give me your response, but I would think that white is like 0.7 better. Like this just looks that good for white to me. And I think that's why mm. Levon went for this. He does not have the evaluation bar, but he knows that it's easier for him to play. He has a bishop pair, no weaknesses, and that's why he decided not to take the pawn because that position looked at least a little more comfortable for black, even if objectively that was the quote-unquote correct decision. And an excellent move by Levon. This is where the bread is buttered for these top players. How many people would automatically go rook ac1? I mean, including myself. I thought that move was automatic, but no, he plays rook f to d1. Now, you might look at this and say it doesn't matter. He's just putting a rook on a square. But there's a lot of tactical precision that stands behind these mundane-looking decisions. In this case, he understands that the pawn is untouchable because of the back rank mate. White just takes on c4, delivers mate on d8. So Drayev has to waste the tempo playing h6. Now we're likely to see Levon putting a knight on d4, a different tactical way of defending the c4 pawn, exchanging black's strongest piece, and this is how you keep your advantage uh, to the size of what it currently is. And I think it's growing, because I think black's decisions are becoming increasingly difficult. For instance, if you swap on d4 and the rook lands on d4, e4 is loose. That knight on f6, where do you think you're going? If you move anywhere, you drop a pawn. Uh, the c1 square is covered, which is essential because if black has any ideas of some funny business of b5, you're not going to deliver a back rank checkmate there thanks to the bishop on f4. I look at this position, I say clear advantage for Levon, and I think that this type of position is one where white wins a very good percentage of the time, and if black plays absolutely perfectly, Drev can make a draw, but he's down nearly three minutes on the clock. And he, his opponent has a bishop pair, and there's going to be an outside pass pawn potential for white. In fact, you could just take on b5 twice right now, and black is in some danger because the bishops just thrive in this kind of endgame. And white's always going to have something to bank on, that b2 pawn, which can even sit on b2, but still terrorize black for a very long time to come. So I would call this a 50-50 position. I would say maybe maybe even 60% chance that Levon wins given the time situation, but... We'll keep a close eye on Alexei Dreyev's attempts to defend the position. We've got a couple of crazy positions, Robert, on some of the other top boards. If I can flip to one of those crazy positions, and I'm trying to figure out if it's crazy or if it's just losing for white, maybe you can help me out. This is a game of Eduardo Iturizaga, who you pointed out in the pre-show as one of those dark horses who can always punch above their weight in these types of events. And Igor Kovalenko really needs no introduction. Incredibly strong grandmaster. Uh, 2,700 feet a, and, and a great blitz player as well. He's got the whole package, and he's got an extra piece, but <laughs> that's not the end of the story, is it? No, but I, I like what you were saying there. He's got the whole package and an extra piece. So if the whole yeah. package wasn't enough, uh, then <laughs> thank you for the knight in the center. But I think that white is relying on some tricks, and a move like bishop d7 is a great one because you're just kicking that knight out of there. And if the knight moves, 
Maybe black can throw in a rook c8, start trading off pieces. White doesn't really have an attack. White only has one pawn, and the, and the pawn on g5 does look pretty nice. But what you really need is that pawn to go up to g6, and then the white queen to somehow get on the h-file. But that's just not happening. Yeah. And in fact, queen takes g5. That gets oh, rid gosh. of it. But e4 is loose. And you might get checkmated on the h-file here. I didn't even notice that the h-file is open. There's no pawn on h2. And even if there was a pawn on h2, this plan would still be pretty effective. Kovalenko, though, very patiently, puts a rook on e8. Now he's ready for queen takes g5. And nothing remains of what looked like an imposing initiative a couple of moves ago. But that was only due to the placement of the knight on c6. Once it's gotten kicked away, the illusion of compensation has dissipated. And this should be a straightforward technical win for Grandmaster Kovalenko here. And he'll go to a perfect three out of three. And one of the names that goes under the radar, but is able to uh, thrive in a competition like this. He's a great speed chess player, as you mentioned, formerly over 2,700 in classical chess as well. Ooh. So Rook C7, nice try. You know, there are some tactics here, but it doesn't threaten anything besides the A7 <laughs> pawn because the, 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 like everything is defended in Black's position. I was playing Blitz with my friend Sasha Bordnik a couple of weeks ago, and he made a move like that, right? A move that makes a lot of noise. And we were both looking at it in awe. And then about a minute later, I said, wait, there's no threats. <laughs> like, like, yes, the move looks very impressive, but what does it actually threaten? And you know, the funny thing is, I think the best move here is A5. You just defend against the only threat that this move poses. And it's very important. Rook takes D7 was not a threat because the Black Queen defends the Knight. But Kovalenko, probably an even better move. Get the Bishop out of the purview of the Rook. And I'll get the Rook off of the 7th rank. I think this is a reasonable way to play. But I'm not enthralled with it, Robert. I think Black, White can take and play Rook C1. And maybe the other Rook can take a dip to C7. Whoa, King G6. Girl, <laughs> careful now. Afraid of nothing. And look at the C file. Yeah. The White Rook has only the C1 square and none others to work with. Because every other <laughs> look square at that. is under Black's control. So I think that... Um, if you're playing B3 just to kick the bishop back, I mean, you can tell that black is well ahead here. So I'm good with this one, Danya. I'm happy to move yeah. on. And I just wanted to point out that with one, I'm going to say only in air quotes, one half of the two, Yesipenko is playing Nepomnishi. They drew a game, so they're not even on a perfect score, and they're playing each other. That is how ridiculously strong this competition is. And Jan Nepomnishi looks to be winning with the black pieces despite being down a couple pawns in the position. Yeah, it looks like a very Yanapamnishi type of position where he sacked a bunch of pawns. What does he have in return? First of all, you've got this incredibly menacing pass pawn on e3. But more pressing for white is the fact that the e7 knight is teetering on the brink of death. If you play knight takes g6 check, black simply slides up to h7. Too many threats, Robert. The queen will be hanging. The knight will be hanging. I think you have to go queen e3. And then black can try to use the d-pawn in order to kick the rook away from e1. Black can do that here as well, d2. And if the rook moves up from the first rank, I think this classic rook c1 and bishop c2 idea is going to be decisive. And Jan has five minutes on the clock, which is absolutely typical. Absolutely typical for Nepomnishi. Just plays super quickly and super well. And here, d2, that looks like the game ender. Ooh. Or rook e2. Two. Sorry to cut you off, Robert. No. He's just played it. What a move. Of course he did, right? He's trying to win the knight on e7. If you take on e2, it looks like black just blundered the queen. But black gets a new queen with check and then picks up that rook on d7. So that was a great find by you. And Yana Palm, she played it a half second after uh, you saw it. And knight takes g6. Just a single check. Doesn't do anything. We pulled up the analysis board here. But that's basically it. You might say, well, white's obviously not going to take on e2. But if white takes on f5... Then the rooks are connected. This is the second idea of rook e2. And again, it's an intermediate capture. Then black captures on f5. Andrei Yesipenko, with absolutely no moves, is likely to resign. And with 50 seconds on the clock, this is what Yana Pamnushi does to you. We have no position, no time. It's almost like he's a world champion challenge. <laughs> and he was almost world champion. That was a disappointing finish to that match for him. But he's won the candidates twice. He's an absolute monster. And he is about to get a victory against... Andre Yesipenko, nice win for Jan. So we trust him. I think we can scoot on over to another matchup. By the way, Jeffrey Zhang is at two and a half out of three. So I see him there. But what matchup is catching your eye? I'm sure some of these games have changed quite a lot. Whoa. Well, I'm looking at Fabiano Caruana, who's about to finish off uh, Armenian GM Sean Sargisian with black to get to three out of three. 
I'm looking at this position and I was searching for an extra piece, a pawn on the seventh rank for a shot. I didn't find neither the first thing nor the second. What I will find is a big zero on the tournament cross table for black. Shot though, he's still fighting. He's trying to manufacture threats against the black king. But look at that defensive role played by the bishop. I love pieces like that, minor pieces that are so faithful both to the king and to the pawn on d3. A Fabi just bringing the hammer down with a retreating move. Yeah, you were pointing at the bishop on h7. It defends and attacks in a way by protecting the d3 pawn and the c2 mm -hmm. square after it. And so queen e8 does the same. It defends that last rank, but also attacks h5 with check. Black is only up two pawns. It looks like black's up like four, but this is a completely winning position. And what would be very sad for white is if you play king g1, because then black would swap rooks like queen e3 check at the end. And, oh. You know, if you take with... That would have just been devastating. So here we see Bishop E4, Fabi improving the location of his bishop, putting pressure on G2. And I think Shant relying on some time trouble for Fabi to stay in this game. I just don't see how Fabi can go wrong here. He has plenty of time and he gets the increment. Yeah, I think F5 comes to mind, slicing off the queen's connection to the H5 pawn. Once you pick up H5, it's all she wrote. Fabi taking a more head-on approach. He pushes the other F1 forward to f2 f3 opening up white's king but also after gf bishop f3 the h5 pawn would have fallen shot doing his best to keep as many pawns on the board as possible but fabi he can consider f5 even here slicing off the connection between these two pawns i like f5 a lot because black's king is actually quite safe white's king is exposed and there are many pieces around it threatening it so f5 looks good i'm sure there are many other winning moves but fabi dropping Oh, by the way, Shunt offered a draw at some point in this game, which Fabi declined. Oh. I don't know when that draw was offered. It probably was earlier in the game, because around here, it wouldn't even make sense to offer. It's clearly winning for Black. <laughs> that would be slightly obnoxious, wouldn't it? And it really helps that you can't envision any scenario where White gets a perpetual check, because even if Black's king has to hide away on h7, the g6 square is protected by Black's bishop, and Black has a monopoly on the light square. So Fabi can move the queen away from the eighth rank. It's done its job. And you never have to worry about any sort of shenanigans along the 8th rank or on the G6 square. This one should be over momentarily. It should be. And by the way, Frederick Svane beat Min Lei to go to a perfect 3 out of 3. So Ooh. beating Kromnik and Min back to back. It's a great start. But we're only a third of the way through in this Swiss part of the plan. Yeah, and Min Lei actually blundered a Knight Fork in one move. So he moves on the 2 out of 3. Uh... Kovalenko still converting that extra piece against Eduardo Uturizaga. I think we will leave uh, Fabiano Caruana to play the last couple of moves of this game. He's got 20 seconds, but that does not add to the intrigue of this game. He can win this with two seconds on his clock, and he's used to doing that from all of his title Tuesdays. So I'm going to flip on to maybe the game of Chakir Amamidyarov, who is in a rook end game. Alireza Faruja uh, also won his game against Konstantin Lupulescu, so I'm pretty sure he's got two and a half out of three as well. Chakriar, can I have a hard time converting this extra pawn against Kraftsev? I think this one's a draw. And that was a crafty last move there by Martin because <laughs> h6 was a really good move because it looks weakening to, you know, to some extent. The g6 pawn now can become a target. But the problem is the white rook is frozen because the e3 pawn would fall with check. And if you take the b3 pawn, which is what white wants to do, then black plays g5. So he does, does go after the g6 pawn. Black does 10 seconds. And that's, uh-oh. Oh! Oh, that, he tricked him. That was a mistake. He had to go g5 first to be able to play b2 later, Robert. Now the rook can capture on b2, travel upwards to b6, and basically force Black's king onto an awkward spot. There's a very instructive zigzaggy kind of mechanism that I think uh, uh, Fabiano Jacriar is going to put into practice here. And he's thinking. See, I like what he's doing. He is using the clock as a weapon, but after b2, he's like, let me be accurate here because rook takes g6 check, allows king to f5, and the mm. f4 pawn will drop. You cannot afford if, to lose the f4 pawn if you want to win this game. So rook takes b2. He just played it. The black rook slides over. But now after rook b6 check, where is the final infiltration going to come from? It's going to come from the seventh rank. He's going to go rook b... I thought he's going to go rook b7 check and then rook to g7 instead. He goes h5, and I think this is also winning. He just has to sidestep the lateral checks by the black rook, and he can do that using the f-pawn as an umbrella. He can zigzag around to the g-file, 
And eventually, Black is going to have to play GH, Robert. And when Black plays GH, White gets the advanced and connected passers. That should decide the game. Maybe Martin can try G5 here, and he does. He is fighting to the last drop of blood. But look at that. Rook F6 check, and then F5. Because otherwise, Rook F4 check would have won the F5 pawn. That's not a pawn that White wants to give. So F6 oh, is that two connected over. pass pawns. And I, I think this is a really instructive endgame, that H5 move. It goes to show that we think about chess as, okay, well, I'm up a pawn. But I think it's important to look at endgames as White was up two pawns, connected, and then Black would have been up a pawn. Because you want connected past pawns in the endgame. This is completely over. Mama Jaro's going to move to 2 and a half out of 3. But that's how I often look at these positions. That if I can get two connected past pawns, I'm essentially up two pawns. That's what white is. Mm -hmm. Up two pawns here. And black is up two pawns in the H and G file. Yeah, you have to section off the board. You always like to divide the board uh, into various <laughs> parts. And that makes the position a lot less overwhelming to evaluate. That's often the only way that you can approach certain endgames. I'm... Looking around the horn here, there are a couple of mo of games still left. Most of them in their endgame stage. Pavel Elyanov has a pretty crazy time scramble here against Alexandra Kostenyuk, who is trying to avoid losing her queen, and she is being successful here. This might be a draw. Yeah, don't want to lose the queen, don't want to lose the bishop, and they're connected with one another. By the way, Alexandra at one and a half out of two, both these players are, uh, but Pavel Yanov at a 2700 level, not much of a surprise. And for Alexandra, we know she can punch up, but a one and a half out of two star for her is fantastic. And right now, it's one of these positions where oh, I, either side can win this game. It should be a draw, but you see them sort of both prolonging this game, and that king on d2, I feel like that's a great piece, especially if the queens come off the board. And Pavel is the one declining the repetition. And I think the reason is because Black's King is just more unsafe. So it's likelier that Alexander blunders something along a diagonal. But she's playing very carefully, keeping her queen and her king close in order to avoid an unexpected skewer. And that queen on d4, Robert, was dominating all of the potential checks by the white queen. That's what she's trying to do. She's trying to eliminate the possibility of any checks. And as long as she can keep her queen active, I think this one should be... Should end in peace. Although you never know. Maybe Queen E1 check. Oh, Queen C5 would have won the pawn. Wow. Queen C Wait, Queen B6? Oh, that's scary. Queen B6 is definitely oh. something that was overlooked. And I just want to note that Alexander Kosenik beat Parham Maksudlu in the first round. So she's already beaten one Super GM. Why not make it two? Uh, but look at this. They're both sides a bit nervous here. White is down under four seconds and needs to be oh careful. Gosh. One second. He's got to move. And he's making moves with one second left on the clock. He gives a check on e4. Pinned pieces protect. You couldn't have taken that queen. But here and comes Sasha. the black king. And she might win that a pawn. And if she wins the a pawn. Oh, no. Oh, she's allowed it. Oh, my gosh. And that's a win for Elyanov. You mentioned this idea before. She completely overlooked it. And Elyanov, in a mutual time scramble, takes the point and moves to two and a half out of three. No way. And Robert, the earlier instance of queen b6 wasn't quite as deadly because black was actually able to block with her queen. But with the king sitting on a different color square, Alexandra had to take the queen. And moreover, she couldn't even give the bishop up for the b pawn because if she had been able to do that, as one Robert Hess would point out, white is the wrong color promotion square for the h pawn. Bad luck. If the pawn was on a5, black would have had bishop a6 and would have been able to draw the game. But that's just the way the cookie crumbles when you're playing Super Grandmasters. You always don't seem to catch that last break. What a heartbreaker. Yeah, that hurts. And she was playing a great game. She's had a very nice tournament thus far, and she'll look to recover in the next one. I just watched Rude Makarin. Uh, he, Rudik Makarin, but on just the comments, just R-U-D for short. Uh, he won his game with Black against uh, Nasuta from Poland. So... Yeah, this round is coming to conclusion, and that means we're about to get into round four. And, Danya, I'm glad that we're not there yet, but I just want to be honest with the audience that coming up in a few rounds, people will start making very quick draws. For sure. And that's understandable given the tournament situation. These players' primary allegiance is to qualify to the top group that they can. So they're going to make whatever decision maximizes that potential, and we won't uh, stick around in case a game ends in a draw, we will always find a combative game on the lower boards. And that's often why in the last rounds, Robert, and I've pulled up the last remaining game here, a rook end game that's very likely to end in a draw. Renato Terry, incredibly household name at this point. He's going to hold this position against Aram Hakobian. 
But there's always a game to look at. There's always somebody who has to win in order to qualify. And so that's the great thing about these Swiss tournaments. There's never a shortage of combative games. But your point is well taken. We're on move 115 at the moment. And I want to give Renato Terra a shout out because this guy is an IM on paper only. Thus far in this very event, as he looks to draw against Grandmaster Ram Hakobian, he's already drawn Ferruja and then he beat Jordan Von Forrest. So uh, you look, I am title. How is he doing so well? Uh, he's pretty darn good. He's well known in the quicker time patrols here on chess.com. And he's having a great day thus far. And he should not lose this game with best play. But I think the one concerning element is that white pawn is very far advanced. And if this white king starts dancing up the board, I could see possible positions where black gets a little bit nervous and goes wrong. And there's a method behind Renato Terry's madness here. He's keeping his rook largely on the C or D files. And that is exactly the reason why. It's because in response to King D3, he would be able to check with the other rook and then quickly zip back to A8. So it's amazing how the rook on A8 actually does play an active role in the defense. We're going to see him go rook C7 here or King G6, staking on these two files. And Aram, he's trying everything. He's trying to move up through the center. He's trying to lure Black's Rook out of C7, but thus far, he hasn't been successful. Oh. Until now, he can play Rook A1. Oh, oh he could have his... ladder checkmated. <gasps> ladder checkmate. In this... Okay, that is hard to see because White is just clinging oh on to that passer on A7. But, you know, especially when this game concludes, we can probably show that variation. Yes. That was an absolute nutty miss and something super hard to spot when you yourself only have 10 seconds. Yeah, and it's not only because of the time situation. You're just so fixated in your mind on winning due to the A7 pawn that even thinking about checkmate here is very, very hard. We see the eval bar. That immediately primes us to look for something decisive. But Aram is focused on not losing on time, and he's focused on getting his king past the Rubicon of the C file. I don't think he's going to be successful. That might have been his last chance. Robert, we're 141 moves in. I feel like we need to open up the record books. What is the longest uh, <laughs> What is the longest chess tour game thus far? This might be among them, and it's a draw. Yeah, go back to that position, Danya, just to show everybody of why the evaluation bar freaked out. And this is really hard to spot, but the eval bar shot up, which means that the rook should shoot back and help deliver a ladder checkmate. Because in response to rook takes a7, first to check on the g file. If black had king a8, that would have been a draw, but as it stands... Black is unable to block the check with his rook. All the black can do is go rook c5 in order to block a check on the g5. And now white actually has to find rook to b3, aiming for b8. Black has to go back, and now you go back to g1, Robert. This is incredible chess geometry. Rook f3, and look at this. Rook f3, rook g7, rook d3, rook c3, and only now do you pick up the rook on c7. How on earth did Aram Hakobian <laughs> miss this with 10 seconds on the clock, I think we need to kick him out of the CCC right here and right now. What an easy tactical <laughs> spot. I mean, how could you not find that enough? That is one of those things with the eval bar alerts us as commentators. But when you're playing, you're not expecting that tactic to exist. Maybe with a couple minutes on the clock, he'd find it, but not with a couple seconds. And now we are right in the thick of round four. We see Fabiano Carwan taking on Ralph Mamedov. And Dunn, if you told me that this would be the matchup, I would expect this exact opening. Yeah, Ralph Mamedov has I feel like has played the Sicilian since he was two years old. Mm -hmm. Fabiano Caruana has played the Rosolimo since he was three years old. And so we have a Sicilian Rosolimo. Ralph loves Fianchetto openings. He plays the King's Indian. He plays the Accelerated Dragon. Anything with a bishop on g7, Ralph Mamedov will be first in line. And what I love about the Rosolimo, Robert, is how multifaceted it is. Within the same opening, you can have ultra-tactical positions uh, if Black plays it with e6. And you can have very positional struggles in the line that Ralph Mamedov has chosen with a lot of subtlety in the center. Like, when does black play a e5? There's the answer right now. When does white try to counter-strike with f2, f4? Maybe also now. But so much understanding underpins a uh, successful Rosolimo play for both colors here. And I remember during the World Championship match in 2021, when I was commentating alongside Fabiano and Danny, uh, there'd be times when we'd just be hanging on the Airbnb and Fabio was working on some chess and he works very hard on this opening. It's not something that he prepared for the World Championship match and then forgot about. And you, there are always little things that you could look at and the best players in the world, the, even if the move, the 
is rejected by the computers. They're like, oh, this is terrible. Sometimes it helps you come up with a good idea. And right now, Fabi's playing some great ideas. Ooh. He's preventing Black from casting Kingside in the near future. And what Ralph is doing is he's keeping more pieces on the board. This knight from F8 will likely go up to E6. But the big problem piece from the Black set of Ross Limo is the light square bishop. Where is that bishop on C8 going to go? What diagonal will be useful? I'm not really seeing anything just yet, but I'm also struggling a bit to see what White's plan is. But that's such an instructive point because a lot of people, when they think of a bad piece, they think of a French bishop. They think of a piece that's hemmed in by their own pawns. But a bad piece doesn't necessarily mean a piece that literally has no squares. It can also mean a piece with no prospects, a piece that can't find a concrete job. And if you think about a black bishop which sits on e6, not only will it stand in the way of the knight, which really wants this square as a transit point, and it does go out to e6, but now the bishop is just kind of awkwardly sitting there like, you know, a kid at a middle school dance. It, what is it doing, right? Where is it going to go? Bishop a6, white can just play b3 and prevent c4. And that is a long-term problem that Ralph definitely has to deal with. But right now, he is dealing with executing his main plan of increasing his central control. And Robert, I'll pass it back to you, but just wanted to big, give a quick shout out to Nicholas Rosolimo himself, after whom the line is named. One of the most interesting characters in 20th century American chess. He was a French immigrant uh, who worked as a taxi driver and actually owned a bookstore, a uh, chess bookstore in New York City. And that bookstore was apparently the site of some really, really interesting chess drama uh, between all of the characters of 1950s and 60s New York chess. So definitely very fittingly named variation. So would you say he's your second favorite taxi driver of the 20th century after Robert De Niro or? Oh, <laughs> wait, I'm trying to remember that Robert De Niro phrase from Taxi Driver. Is it, who am I talking to? You're but very good, Robert. Yes, I am I am giving you a round of applause right now as we speak. You talking to me? You talking to me? Yes. You talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> you just hurt my soul That's a little bit. That's the one bit. I was looking by, for. You asked the question. Like, you, you had the answer to the question, but you just asked it in like a slightly different phrase. So it was like one of those painful, like, you know what you're talking about, but you just happened to misstate it. But what in the, I don't know what we're talking about in this position. Yeah. What is happening here? <laughs> like these knights on G4, F5, and E6, the bishop is kind of <laughs> trapped on H6. Danya, do you have any explanation for what's going on? Well, the bishop is trapped on h6, but it's it's like a Norwegian prison. Like, that bishop is not actually that poorly placed. It's controlling some squares. It's hurting the coordination of black's king side. Okay, is either side threatening anything? Like, what is white's next move and what is black's next move? The top engine move is rook a8 to a7, which I think tells you a lot about <laughs> black's inability to improve his position. My inclination would be to stick this knight on f4, but if we could bring up an analysis board, knight f4 apparently doesn't do anything either. White can simply improve his position with a move like rook a1. And the big problem is that black can never take on f5 because both knights are reinforcing the bishop on h6. And if you make the mistake of opening up the e-file, well, obviously this is going completely in the wrong direction for Ralph Mamedov. So what makes this position so crazy, Robert, is that there's so much going on and yet there's nothing going on. Yet neither side can seem to easily improve their positions which makes it pretty infuriating to try to find a helpful move. Yeah, and rook a7, not easy move to spot, but it Come does on. make sense now that you've mentioned it because the bishop on c8 doesn't have anywhere good to go. It's probably going to stare at the knight on f5 at some point. And instead it goes bishop h8, which mm -hmm. gets the bishop out of the attack. I still mm -hmm. don't see a follow-up for black, but I'm also not entirely sure what white's plan is. Like, What should white do in this position? Rook a to e1, I, I don't know what you're threatening. You're just putting your rook behind your own pawn. So is there an active plan for white or is Fabi just gonna shuffle? I think Fabi might start shuffling. I'm starting to become a little bit more partial to Ralph Mamedov's position. I really like the look of this knight on f5. I think Fabi's last move is a really good one, very alert. He prevents the move knight d4, which would have really shattered the coordination between white's minor pieces. And if Ralph plays knight f4 prematurely, white could even consider, in some cases, blowing up the center with d4. Because something we haven't talked about yet is the king position. As long as the center remains closed, black's king is more than happy to chill in the center. If the center opens, white's pieces are well positioned to rip the king to shreds. So Ralph, I don't know what he's going to do now. Maybe rook a7, rook d7? 
He does play knight f4, but he has to be so, so careful, Robert, about allowing this rook a to d1 followed by d4 plan. Also, g3 at some moment, because if you take on h3, the king goes up to g2, and your knight's trapped over there. So uh, it's a closed position, which means that knights often are better than bishops, and we're seeing that right now. Mm -hmm. The bishop on h8 is a pretty miserable piece. The knight on g4, defending h6, putting pressure on e5. The knight on f5 is also in enemy territory. So bishop a6 was played, and I think g3 is a good move, because... If you take on h3 with check, your knight gets trapped over there. If you take on d3, I believe, and here he plays it, that the wow. white queen will slide away from the d file, and there will be a pin along the line. And I just really heard that that knight on d3 could get trapped as well. And if black plays c4, it's not all about winning this knight. You have induced the move, which makes the bishop even worse. Black is stuck in mud here, the queen aiming at the b6 square. So white can just continue improving his position slowly with a plan like rook d2 and maybe preparing b3, maybe even h4 chipping away at this uh, pawn that sticks out like a sore thumb on the king's side. Bobby, with filigree precision here and the speed with which he's making these moves, I think is really, really impressive. Hey, he's just a monster. And then the fact that the knight just dropped back means that the worst is sort of behind Fabi. He doesn't have to worry so much. And now he can slow play this. Like, I play queen e3, rook d2, rook d1. And not only is there a rook coming to d1, Danya, potentially you could play for b4. I'm very focused on the move d4, and all mm -hmm. of black's forces are aimed at that square. But b4 is another pawn break, especially a black castle's queen side, which I think is about to happen, that you can yep. consider the move b4 to blow that side of the board open. Frying pan into the fire, right? Black finally gets his king out of the center, and boom, the moment it does so, white blasts open the queen side with b4. As impressive as this pawn structure may seem, it's also very susceptible to moves like b4 because it makes contact with a lot of pawns at the same time. So Bobby might have to find a different purpose for these minor pieces if and when Black's King gets out of the center, but he's got more than enough firepower on the other side to support a rapid fire attack on the queen side. What a rich and interesting positional game. And he goes right away. I mean, he's found his purpose in b4, just chipping at that pawn structure. The eval bar doesn't like it, and I'm guessing you wanted a slower approach. Your h4 move now is really sinking in with me. You can't do it right away because the knight on g4 was loose, but maybe there was a, a way to play f3 to defend the knight and then h4 just to try to open up the king side on favorable terms. But b4 played hardly can uh, complain about that in the sense that it's a rapid game. You're opening up the black king. But maybe he should have waited until Black Castle Queenside before playing b4. Yeah, before playing b4. And if you played before before, before Black Castle's king side, or queen side, that is, what is the additional option that you've granted to Black? Well, one could argue that Black could much more easily take twice on b4. You would do that with a second thought with the king sitting on c8. But with the king still on e8, you can allow the queen side to get opened and then maybe close down the diagonal with c5 after white's queen recaptures then you've guaranteed a potential square on d4 for your knight so zero clarity has been reached in this position in the last 10 minutes i feel like they're making moves but with every move that's being made i'm understanding what's going on like less and less <laughs> yes and the eval bar says oh black is now slightly better the players don't know that this is a really okay. complicated position and fabi is a minute ahead of the clock and has the safer king and i think that's going to be true for a large part of this game. The white king can't be attacked. The black king's stuck in the center. And whoo, whoa, he castles <laughs> into it. And he oh, took that... on b4 first in your face, Fabius, says Ralph Mamedov. Wow. Shocking. I mean, what a decision that was. And I guess his point is after b takes c5, knight takes c5, d3 is loose, a4 is loose. Uh, but the knight on e6 is doing an important job of defending the g5 pawn as well. So I'm not sure how to assess this resulting position but there is a lot hanging in the balance there is and there's literally a lot hanging in the position i think ralph might have forgotten about the g5 pawn if i may quickly show this line bc well okay black can grab the pawn on d3 but then white can take on b6 intermezzo move hitting the queen so ralph might be making on knight take c5 but after bishop g5 rook d3 it looks very impressive for black it looks like the queen cannot maintain contact with the bishop, but it can. You can drop back to c1, very calm move. And if black continues to pursue the white queen, 
Look at this, Robert. Queen c1 to a3, and suddenly it's Black's pieces which are experiencing the brunt uh, of the problems. After rook takes g5, white doesn't have to be fancy. Takes, takes. You can even play queen takes b3, and when the smoke finally clears, this is the ultimate positional problem. You've got this dud of a bishop on h8. So black cannot afford a bunch of pieces to get traded like this because you're going to be sitting there playing essentially down a minor piece. And as I say that, Fabi with a5, my goodness gracious. Every time clarity is about to be reached, things just get more complicated. Well, I think one thing that's going to be clear is the bishop on h8 is going to be terrible, and the bishop on a6 is likely about to be awful when you play pawn to b5 at some point. First trading rooks and then b5, the bishop on a6 stares into its own mm. pawn. So I think the knights are really shining, the bishops are struggling, and that's what Fabi is aiming for. And he has a nearly two-minute lead on the clock. I think it's much more difficult for black to play than white. White's king's so healthy on g1. And black's piece all over the place, right? They're discombobulated. The bishop on a6 is not in rhythm, in sync with the rook on g6. The bishop on h8 and the nine e6, they're not really coordinated. So I feel like white just has things under control here, and the position is getting increasingly oh. difficult for Ralph. I love that every one of Fabi's games thus far in this tournament has had a different signature, right? His first game against Gawain Jones, making something out of, at one point, what seemed like a worse endgame. His second round, brilliant tactic against Alexander Rahmanov, just smashing through the gates in the center. And then this fourth game, super complicated. But I see that you're surprised, Robert. B takes A5 might just have made matters even worse. No, no, no. It's not about this. I was looking oh. at the, the top pairings, and this position apparently e uh, uh -huh. evened up. But I saw that Eduardo Iturizaga is 3 out of 3, but we looked at his game before, and he was down a full piece. And oh, I looked won that game. I looked to see how he won. Kovalenko had 45 seconds to Iturizaga 6, and he hung his queen in one move. Like, he moved his <gasps> queen to a square where Iturizaga took it in a completely winning position. So I was just shocked to see Iturizaga at a perfect score. Then I was even more shocked to see how he won that game. So, hey, Eduardo, doing well. Happy to be a 3 out of 3, but fortune, it's on his side today. Fortune seems to smile on the best blitz players. That is a heartbreaker for Kovalenko. That's crazy. We thought that was totally and completely over. This game is clearly far from over. Fabi in the driver's seat, but he might have just made a mistake by taking on A5. But Robert, I wanted to take a quick visit at a different game. The board two game between two players that we haven't spotlighted yet. It's Amin Tabadabai against Alan Pichot. There is a white knight that's on G7. And just that fact alone should be appealing enough to look at this position. What on earth is happening here? 95? No. Wow. Oh, uh, he, he didn't even take anything. I thought he took a pawn, and then I looked. It says knight d5, not knight takes d5. But his point is clear. There were many pieces in front of the black king. Let's start trading them off one by one. If you take on d5, I take on g5. Then I take on g7. <laughs> we actually have even material there, at least in terms of pieces. I have to count the pawns, and it seems like white is currently a pawn ahead. But at least the black king won't get checkmated. Jeez. And then the d5 pawn in the ensuing position is going to be a major target for Black's bishop. So let's dig in for a second. After bishop takes c7, let's say that white starts with that move. I assume black's going to recapture with the queen because if you take back with the knight, knight h5 Robert creates very unpleasant threats against these dark squares. Queen f6 is threatened. You're shaking your head. So is Alain Pichot. And he has, in fact, taken on e7 with the queen. But can white simply trade queens? Go knight h5 and say, I'm up a pawn, and you've got holes on both sides of the board? I think it's exactly what Amin Tabadabai said, that I'm up a pawn, <laughs> and you have holes on both sides of the board. And Amin just crossed 2,700 briefly, and then he dropped back below. But he's about at that super GM level. He's somebody that mm -hmm. I don't think we talk about enough. And the World Cup is about to start. He made a very deep run two years ago. Uh, in Sochi. So um, Amin Tabadabai, he's improving, it seems like, every single event, every month. And right now, he's steadied his position. He's up a pawn. It's seven on six. The bad news is there's double B pawn. So certain positions, they can be vulnerable. But for now, Dunya, this looks like a very clear advantage for White. It most certainly does. And the advantage is growing. He's got the three on one on the king side. He's got a potential target in the form of the C7 pawn. You might see him go rook A, is c1 and if black sticks a knight on d5 white's knights are so mobile that not only are 
uh, they active where they currently are, but they can combine with one knight jumping to f6. And if you get a knight versus bishop situation, that bishop on b7, all that it's doing is threatening to take on f3. But if white's king moves away from the g file, that's going to be a dud of a bishop as well. I would even consider throwing in the move king f2 so that you never have to worry about tactics down the g file. This should be a technical win for white, although two minutes on the clock for both sides. We've seen crazier things happen in this very tournament. Yes. And Kovalenko. Wanted... Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, there's no queen to blunder here. <laughs> That's true. Other pieces can be blundered, though. And I just wanted to quickly shout out Nicholas Theodoru, who goes at three and a half out of four. Uh, Yana Pomshi at three and a half out of four. We surely will focus on his games in future rounds. Yuri Kuzabov, the Ukrainian Grandmaster, at three and a half. And Ali Reza Faruja, somebody who drew Renato Terry, but won his other three games. So he drew round one and now has won three straight. But, uh, I was about to call you Fabi because I was looking at the <laughs> game of Fabi here. Look at that bishop on f8. It was stuck on h6 for so long, but now that it's reached the f8 square, there are problems for black. He could have gone knight e7 check, Fabi, and won the exchange, but he understands that rook on g6 isn't that valuable. Let's rush that pass pawn up the board, and then maybe this bishop's coming to c5. Gosh. And there it is. Pawn to a7 next, and yikes. I don't know how you're picking out relevant details out of this position, but I was thinking what to compare it to. Maybe like a Hieronymus Bosch painting, like, you know, Garden <laughs> of Earthly Delights, where there's seven million things going on, and it takes an expert to really call out, to tease out the relevant details. And I think that the big relevant detail is just that, again, that bishop on h8, as we were pointing out earlier, you really can't play a position this tactical with a piece that's doing nothing. So there's that. Then there's the pawn on a6, which is restricting black's king. White's king is completely safe. So ultimately, Robert, I think the most important factor, and it might seem like the most primitive observation, but it's the king's safety. It's the fact that black has struggled with his king for the last 15 moves. But where's the finishing touch? It's probably not to take twice on d4 because that allows the bishop to get reactivated. Yeah, I would not free up that bishop. I think that keeping it stuck in the corner is worth more than a pawn. And Fabi agrees. And, oh, excellent uh, move. Such a high-class move. He's just reinforcing the knight in f5, but also the knight in g4 no longer doing much. So maybe this knight will now go to c4 because if it gets mm -hmm. to b6 and he Woo! goes knight c4, black's in a world of hurt. And if you take on c4, that's one of the critical defenders of the black king. That's coming off the board. The c3 pawn suddenly becomes loose. And Fabi is playing a phenomenal game right now. They say that for good basketball players, the basket is like an ocean, right? The net literally expands. And I think for great chess players, you see something similar where it's like the way that they shuttle their pieces from one side to the other. It's like the board itself is bigger. That knight was on g4 one second ago, literally. Now it's on c4. It's threatening to jump to b6. And if black is forced to give away his light squared bishop, I think his position collapses in the span of two or three moves, Robert, because you won't be able to hold c3. You won't be able to rely on your other bishop, obviously. And the knight on d4 is going to start losing its support. I think Fabi is completely winning here. And I'm looking at the clock. Bishop f6 played. Oh, knight b6? Yeah, bishop f6 is one of those moves. Like, I just need to do something. Everything looks bad. But knight b6 check, uh, that forces the king over to b8. I don't know if a7 yeah, wins the, the game on the spot. Yeah, there? Hmm. Where's the crusher there? Is it queen e6 and bishop d6? No, that's not convincing because black can give, a, give away his queen. So it's just rook a1. Oh, that's simple. Very well spotted. Oh, Fabi. I mean, come on. Every move with purpose. And now, what is the finisher? Because oh, I want to move my knight. 94, 95, and a7. Sorry to cut you off. So why do I need to take on d4? Oh, it's because black as queen takes a6 now. Oh, wow. So I'm still confused what the exact difference is. But yeah, Fabi, me too. <laughs> Fabi wasn't expecting this, but can he just take and play knight takes f6 here? And he's then take on a6 and you're up a piece. And I was worried about c2 in that final position, Robert, but I, I guess you're stopping the pawn with bishop a3. How do you stop the pawn? If black plays rook takes f6, maybe you need to actually take this other knight first so that when you drop the bishop back to a3, black is unable to chase it with the knight. And Ralph trying to stir complications up with knight to b3. Rook takes a6. Everything's hanging. Black can take on c5, and suddenly the knight and the rook are both hanging. And that c pawn still lives, and that could yeah. be dangerous. So knight d7 check, 
protects the bishop on c5. He goes rook b1, bishop c4 oh. quickly. What is happening knight here? I think knight back to e3, right? C2, though, deflects the knight. And oh black is still goodness. alive. Yeah, C2. C2. Knight C2. Rook takes F6. Oh my then gosh. The knight comes back. A1. And the bishops are both hanging. There's knight A1 at the end. And you win oh, the knight on B3. What a move. And Ralph sees it. He moves his king away to the side, which is the only way to stay alive. What? And the bishop on C5 and the knight on C2 are both under attack. Rook takes B3. Bishop B3. Knight A1. You get two pieces for the rook. Oh my gosh, knight a1 is crazy. He goes bishop b4, Fabi panicking here. He wants to go knight e3, Robert. He's thinking forward, but the bishop has a beautiful square to drop back to, and it's equal. Black might be better. Well, rook b8 check and bishop takes e5. I don't oh. really see how black is better here, but maybe black is holding no, no, on. No. It's a scramble. This game has been exciting from the start, and right now, Fabi needs to get moves, and he's down under 10 seconds. Yeah, I exaggerated there slightly, but... When the game turns like this, you can actually feel like you're losing the thread of the game. A great move by Ralph, trading away the Knights. He is very close to holding this position together. He could still lose this because White is more active. Yes. But compared to what oh. it was about five moves ago, oh, he missed F5. F5's he huge. Missed F5. Oh, oh he F5, missed F5 would win the Rook because Rook H6, Bishop yes. F4, Rook H7, Rook B7, check. And... He's still much better, is five men of Carwana. He's one pawn right now. And this is what I said before. White is up two pawns in the center. Black is up a pawn on the C file and a pawn the H file. E6 check. Bishop E6, E6 rook D8 check. Would have won a piece. And black could have won that back with rook F1, but that E pawn would have promoted at the end. Fabi plays it now, but it's too late. And Ralph is going to get a theoretically drawn position, but will he be able to hold it with no time on his clock? Uh, this is not easy to do when you're down under 20 seconds, but the two-second increment, you get two seconds out of your clock with every move, that should help. And usually what players do in these positions is they eventually win the pawn, but they want to you know, perfect the squares of their pieces. Like, look, bishop on d4, rook on d8. Oh, but now he's he just allowed to draw. Yeah, he made a mistake. That's it. Rook c8, c5, and white has to take in order to give away his rook. That's it. What a hold by Ralph Mamedov absolutely ridiculous ralph deserves so much credit for finding tactic after tactic that kept him in the game there were mistakes it, you know the evaluation swung from equal back to winning for white that's what happens when you're in a scramble but he really deserves so much credit for not just losing that game and this was one of the last clean wins that fabi had this is already after they traded queens he could have played f5 right away robert and a great point by you it's not about pushing the pawns it's about trapping the rook because if you go back to h7, I was going to make a whoop sound, but my voice is going. So <laughs> rook b7 wins the rook. And if you play f5, rook g5, still bishop f4. And again, or even just bishop takes f6. Apologies for that. Just bishop f6. And you are winning because of the connected passers. You can even trade rooks after rook g8. And the pawn is the right color. That actually is the most important factor in this entire position. What an incredible game. That was a joy to watch. Yeah, that one, it was very close, and Ralph was borderline lost. I mean, he was losing, but he found those tactics, and he survived. So they both moved a three and a half out of four, and look who's at the top. Frederick Svane and Amin Tabatabai, a perfect four out of four thus far. And, Daniel, I think we have a few games left in this round, including mm -hmm. Dmitry Andrekin, who is down at peace against Kasper Drozdowski. And he is. And he's got some pawns for that piece, but Drozdowski is dominating them with his knight. Draken with his last seconds, he's losing everything here. And no stalemate. The king has h7. What? A win for Casper. And he's the not-so-friendly ghost. And unfortunately for Andraken, <laughs> dropping a 1 out of 4, I don't think he'll have any chance to qualify for the top division today. But there's division 2 and 3 to work his way towards. It's just so brutal, right? You lose a game early on. You play somebody like Drozdowski, who is a great blitz player, and just such a good opportunity for lesser-known players to score some amazing upsets. I'm still... My hands are still shaking, Robert, from that Ralph Mamedov, Fabiano Caruana game. But ultimately, it's not a tragedy for Fabi, who is on three and a half out of four and still an excellent position to make his way into the top division. Yeah, if your main complaint is, oh, I'm not four out of four, I'm only at three and a half... <laughs> Shows that he's still having a good day. And, well, the players, they're going to get set for the fifth round of action. Donnie and I will take a quick break. But when we return, it is another round here at the Julius Bear Generation Cup playing here in the Champions Chess Store. We'll be right back.
Move over, Mittens. There's a new top dog in town. Benji the Bernadoodle might be an international master of fetch, but chess lessons with his dad, Gotham Chess, aren't really sticking. Host of his own public access TV show, Wish Boy knows a thing or two about the most dramatic moment in chess history. A baller through and through, Buddy Buckets is moving his game from the basketball court to the chessboard. Watch out! Pinky practices chess from the inside of his mom's handbag on Woofstock's law campus. Don't judge a dog by its diamante collar. Ponchik learned chess from his dad, GM Levon Aronian. He has never lost to another dog at chess and certainly won't lose to you. This July, the possumness is unleashed on chess.com. Shout out to Meetup with over 25,000 members and still growing. Head over to meetup.com slash chess to find a local group or organize a chess meetup of your own. While the chess has met the board here in the Julius Bear Generation Cup, we have seen some players, two in fact, go to four out of four. Amin Tabatabai and Frederick Sfane done it, perhaps names that people didn't expect to be the only perfect ones remaining but there they are, strong grandmasters making a name for themselves in a field with many superstars. And Frederick Swane made a name for himself in round two, defeating a very obscure uh, chess player with a short resume named Vladimir Kromnik, and then not even looking back. We've had some crazy games. We obviously have Fabiano Caruana and Ralph Mamedov, who were the stars of the previous round. Their game ends in a draw. And one thing I really like about these middle rounds, Robert, is when... Players with a perfect score 
drop down to play the highest rated player with half a point below. So we might see Fabiano Caruana, Ralph Mamedov, and others play those players at the top, and they really, really want to win to stop these perfect runs. Okay, well, you know, we're starting at the top. Why not? A mean top to buy, Frederick Svane. The games are go. getting underway. So why don't we dive right in to the action as we see the players. They have played just one move per side. Did they make it? <laughs> no, thankfully not. I thought they made a draw already, and I was about to lose my mind. Yeah, maybe a mean deciding between a King's Gambit, a center game. Or deciding what move he's playing in this position. I mean, plays the Italian. He plays the Ruy Lopez. Oh, gosh. Am I seeing what you're seeing? Uh, Berlin. That is also what I'm seeing. And I think Amin <laughs> is legitimately deciding if he wants to force a draw. Now, as a higher-rated player with the white pieces, I think it's a good chance for him to play for a win. If he could win this game, he takes a lot of the pressure off of the subsequent couple of rounds. You really can't post your way division one he will need to win at least one more game and he's and going for the he's safe taking the middle ground mm -hmm. yeah where we had the same exact thought he's taking yeah. a safe approach where white is slightly better but the position is symmetrical a white gets those pawns a little bit more advanced and i think this is a wise choice Danya. I, I don't think it was worth just risking too much but you're in the white side of this position only one open file no real risk to speak of yeah, rookie one is the kind of move you play if you're okay making a draw, but you don't want to get, you know, uh, your door knocked on by angry fans who feel like <laughs> they deserve an actual game. So this isn't just a dead draw, right? You can't compare this to the repetition line with queen e4, queen d4. There is chess left to be played here. You even see decisive games at the very top level because as symmetrical as the position looks, Robert, white does have the space advantage. White has this nagging pawn chain that really restricts black's bishop so i never like playing positions like this from the defending side but i think a couple of careful moves separate black from uh, a likely peaceful result okay so let's go around a bit just in the early stages of this round this game uh, will be either a draw by agreement at some point or a long battle just because it's mm -hmm. a position that doesn't have tension in it at least not yet so you pulled up the game between diego flores and fabiano caruana uh we're early stages there it looks like fabi getting his bishop out to g4 um getting active but nothing really too major has happened yet no pawns or pieces traded so why don't we just keep looking at games just so we can get more names yeah. in front of the audience well, and Drea draw their oh. game early on as do mamedov and kuzubov so We'll skip those two games, but Ali Reza Ferruja and Nicholas Theodoro are on a very combative path. Oh, okay. So we see the Black King still in the center, the White King safely castled, but that Bishop on C2. I've never really been a huge fan of these types of variations, even though I used to play it myself, and maybe that's why I'm not a huge fan. <laughs> is I'm like, I look at that Bishop on C2, and I know eventually it might see the light of day, but for now I'm like, no, that piece doesn't look good. But I like opening the A file. And I like that I've castle, but black is very solid. I guess I just don't really know how to weigh the different dynamics that are happening here. It's a very kind of amorphous position. Like you've got a lot going on, and yet it's hard to say what's going on in the center. You have two sources of tension. Now one source of tension, black pushes the pawn up to b4. And one way to garner prospects for the light squared bishop, you see this in the Rui Lopez as well. And actually this position has a lot in common with certain Rui Lopez structures is for white to play a5 and actually stick the bishop on a4. Very often that a pawn is untouchable for various tactical reasons, uh, such as the discovery along the a file, but top priority for Ali Reza is to complete his minor piece development. And another thing, Robert, that we have in common with the Rui Lopez, you very often see white's knight traveling from d2 to f1 to g3, assembling your pieces on the king side because very likely black's king is not going to stay in the center forever. Black is likely to go knight g6 and bishop e7, and then, of course, he's going to castle kingside. And I guess white also can throw in the move d4 at some point, especially with this Oof. knight already on d2. And the bishop on c2 that I was complaining about, suddenly it will have an open avenue aiming towards the black kingside. So the lack of development for black, uh, that means that perhaps something like knight g6 to get the dark square bishop in the game uh, might be necessary. But Theodoro is spending a bit of time here. Alariza with a minute lead on the clock. He being Alariza, probably happy about the start of this game. 
And one move you want to avoid in, in such positions is d5, d4. I think some players would have the temptation to close down the center, eliminate the potential tension down the e-file, but the medicine is worse than the disease there because d4 allows White's Knight to jump into this ultra juicy c4 square. And from c4, it has access to dark squares in the center and on the queen side. So I think Nicholas has to just bite the bullet here. And as unpleasant as it is to allow a move like he takes d5, I think he's got to go knight g6. I don't see a, another way for him to untangle his kingside pieces. I guess you could go for the Fianchetto with g6, but man, I would be ultra terrified of weakening all these dark squares. And yeah, I guess after knight g6, you have to calculate, is pawn takes d5 going to be annoying? Yeah. He puts his knight Ooh. on a5, so he's playing on the rim. And I would be tempted to just play d4 in the center. D4. If my opponent's playing on the flank like this. But Alireza, you know, he has many things that he could do. He could take on b4 first. Sometimes you do that. I, I wouldn't go about that right now. Uh, my eyes are on d4. But I know sometimes in these Rosalimo positions, Danya, you play h4. Because knight g6 is the idea. And then maybe you can play h5 to kick that pony out of there. So many possible plans. h4 is a very instructive idea. I like it when that move is played before uh, knight g6. But I really think we should Alireza Glass... To White's opening play in this game. He's got a great position, and um, I'm just going to pretend I didn't say anything just now. I like that. I honestly. mean, that was that, okay. That, that was, was okay. a good one. No, I, I approve of that message because hey, I, I don't really have a glass to raise. I was looking. I just have a water bottle, so yeah, I got nothing. It's okay. I do. I promise this is coffee in it, though, so, you know. <laughs> All right. Well, Night A5 played here. Why don't we continue to you know, look at other games? Uh, honestly, a game that really is catching my eyes, the one between mm -hmm. Levon Aronian and Aiden Suleimani. Levon has the black pieces. And well, Levon is three out of four, so he probably needs to start winning if he wants to qualify for Division One once again. But look at this position, Donya. Isn't White just full steam ahead playing G5 next? And I don't understand why there's a big uh, question mark next to the move G4. It's as natural as one, two, three. White's threatening G5. Black's queen is actually going to be trapped after hd bishop g5 and wait a second g5 yeah what g5 what is levon intending maybe some sort of g6 to complicate the narrative on the king side yes but white can actually take twice on g6 and i think the check on f2 that levon is banking on doesn't do as much as he thought it would after king h1 and maybe he's trying to invoke fear in his young opponent, saying, I'm Levon Aronian, I'm a super GM, 28-35, uh, if I'm not mistaken, at his peak. But I think you're right. You can just take twice on G6, and the Black King's in trouble. Dunno, go back a few moves before G4. I think uh -huh. I know what the miss was. And he used the right square, but with the wrong piece. That Rook G4 threatens oh. Bishop takes H6, winning a pawn, and you're going to deliver a checkmate. And if the King steps to the h-file to avoid the g-pawn being pinned. The h-pawn is now pinned, and bishop g5 wins the queen. Yep, not f4, not e3, not d2, not h6, but g5, <laughs> and that's it. Can't take with the pawn, and you can't play g6 now, right? That was the more or less saving grace in the game. But here, queen takes h6 check, and look at that bishop, protecting the queen, attacking the enemy queen. Rook g4 would have ended the game. That's a great catch, Robert. Instead... I think Suleimanli has a lot of hurdles left to cross because this might be winning according to the eval bar, but hey, try evaluating that position yourself against Levon Aronian after takes, 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 and queen f2. Apparently white is winning here, but how exactly do you continue attacking, Robert, after a move like rook f7? Do you drop your knight back to h4? Do you play g takes h6? I think there's still a lot of chess left to be played, and when you miss a chance like this against someone like Levon, how many times have we seen that, right? A lower-rated player has a clear-cut win. They miss it. The position remains winning objectively. But when you give these top players another life, they tend to exploit it. So I'm starting to get a little bit worried here about Aiden Suleimanli. And he did just take once on G6, and now he's going to mm -hmm. think about taking twice. Uh, but it's a scary position. It should be good for White, but things could go wrong. And another super GM in a very interesting battle is Anish Giri. Anish, only a two and a half out of four, so a plus score, but he's going to have to get some victories if he is going to make it to Division One. He's somebody who hasn't played much in the Champion Chess Tour this season, so we're glad to have him in the play-in right now. But I think in this position, Danya, 
uh, from the white side. He's looking at this. B6 is a target. F7 is a target. This is a French without a light square bishop. That's the good news. But the bad news is white's attacking everything on the board. No, the bad news is that it's a French. <laughs> that's, that's the extent of the bad news. You don't really need to say anything more than that. And uh, it's funny. Black has traded that French bishop, which is usually a very good sign. But there's so many other minuses in Black's position, of course, centered around the very weak king on d7. And Black could try to, or White could try to exploit that king by dropping the queen to d1, Robert, and using the queen side to its fullest extent, right? The b6 pawn is under pressure. And if White can double on the c file, you are going to be threatening an infiltration to c7. Geary does something very similar with bishop d2. I think he's preparing rook c3. But the eval bar wasn't a fan of that move. Was it because you left the d4 pawn exposed? Knight c6 back apparently not the correct move. So oh, no. these positions are, are quite difficult to figure out. They're locked. And so the knight does defend a5 and attacks d4. Now queen d1. So second time is the charm. <laughs> Anish realizes that he can go to the b file and he's going to load him up because that's two rooks oh. and a queen behind it. He's got the Alakine's gun. I didn't even realize that queen b1 is an idea. So he's got rook c2. On the menu, queen b1 on the menu. And if you can force black to play knight c8, we talked earlier about using both sides of the board. You could also run an f-pawn up the board and add even more pressure on the king side. This is pure misery for Mikhail Demidov. Yeah, and I thought you were going to say full board awareness. The queen on b1 might go to h7 <laughs> if you're not paying enough attention because that hits the rook on g8 and the pawn on g7. So a queen on b1 is super powerful. It's getting ready to win the b6 pawn. It's allowing you to go over to the c file with your rooks. It's also uh, f4, f5, and queen to h7. So many ideas in this position for white, and frankly, I see very few for black. And I am seeing that Demiov offered a draw at some point, and Anish was like, no way. Oh, come on. Take that draw, and you, you know what to do with it. I don't even <laughs> need to tell you. And the queen has moved on to b1. You have built the Alakine gun, but one very instructive point I was going to say, you don't necessarily want to rush rook takes b6, but I think the move rook b5 is what's attracting a niche to play that move. If you were forced to trade twice on b8, yeah, you have an extra pawn, but who cares, right? It's an, it's an extra a pawn, and your a pawns are doubled. So he didn't take on b6 to win a pawn. He took it in order to open the b file, and rook b5 is a collinear move. Black can never take this rook and allow the pawns to undouble. Maybe a niche can start playing a little bit more positionally now and slow down a little bit. Maybe bring this knight away from h4, but I'll put it this way. There's still work left to be done in this position for white. The game's not over. Well, knight f3, e1, d3, c5 is what first <laughs> comes to my mind. You, you know, the knight on h4 isn't doing all that much right now, uh, but that is quite a trek. And I love that move rook b5 because you get to keep the tension on the b file. You trade on your own terms. If black takes on b5, a takes b5, that looks terrible because you've handed white a pass pawn that can then be defended and so he does go knight to f3 which to my eyes looks like a very natural move and well i think demidov wants oh. to kind of counterplay with a queen h4 check at the right moment so i would play king g1 yeah. right now king g1 is a very circumspect prophylactic move and then when you play knight e1 as you're saying queen h4 no longer comes with a check so you're dropping a piece on b8 there's a crazy tactic here with rook b5 takes d5 check sacking the exchange and recapturing the knight on f5 with a big attack, but that's a hard position to evaluate. I don't really think that's an Anish Giri type of move, especially with three minutes on the clock. You don't want this position getting too tactical. You largely want to keep the status quo structurally, and that's kind of what Anish does. He goes g4, he kicks the knight out of f5, forces the trade, and now with the d4 pawn reinforced by its colleague on e3, you can continue your plan, but you still have to watch out for queen h4. Uh, this is fantastic play from Anish. He can go king g2, bring the king up to g3 to take away uh, those points of entry. And also, he puts queen on c2 and says, what is your move, Demidov? Because, <laughs> well, rook takes a5 is a threat now. That knight is pinned. So he goes queen f8 to get the a3 pawn in its sights. But I don't think that black actually has a threat because queen takes a3 drops a piece to rook takes b8 and the king is uh, dislodged from its defense of the knight on c6. So I just think that Demidov doesn't really have options here. And I still think we're going to see king g2 by Anish. And he plays it. And one of the reasons is that after queen takes a3, and after white captures that knight on c6, with the king still on h1, Robert, queen takes e3 would have come with tempo. 
And you know how those positions can get, right? There can be a perpetual, that knight isn't a very good defender. With that no longer being a worry, Anish can refocus his attention back on the queen side. And ultimately, I think he still wants to get this knight around to c5. I love the patience with which he's handling this position. It's very instructive. And what's also instructive is his queen was on b1, went to c2, and then b3. If that king decided to go back to c7, he would put his queen on c3. A better defensive square threatening the same ideas. But he goes knight e1, knight d3, knight c5, and I just don't see how black can possibly defend this. I trust Anish in this position. I don't know about you. I'd be happy to go elsewhere totally. or to see him conclude this game. I think we can entrust the, the rest of the conversion to him. I'll keep... Uh, you know, my peripheral vision on this game if, if something interesting happens. But I think we should pay a visit back to our top boards. We've got that Tabata by Svane game with uh, the two four out of four players. Perhaps we could check into that game really quickly. It Whoa. appears that I mean has been making very steady progress in that rookie one Berlin, and he's been making progress on the board and on the clock. I think he's a couple moves away from ending this game. If we just quickly go back to oh. around move 16, I mean, that's a, just a nasty shot. This game is, I mean, yep. it's already it's over. crushing. Uh, you're about to be up a couple pawns. But in this moment here, look at the move that White uh -huh. played. You're on the open file. He plays the move, a subtle move. Just look at that, queen d1. It looks like it doesn't really do anything. But the queen is better placed on b3, which is where it goes after Black's next turn. And now b7 and d5 are in the queen's sights. And White was able to pick up a pawn. And then you saw the live position. He just cruised from there. And black just loses after queen takes b7 because the entire queen side structure collapses. And an even bigger problem is that you can barely defend the a7 pawn. Svane didn't defend it. I mean, took it. Black got a little bit of counterplay, but that pawn was just way, way, way too strong. And look at this move, a6, with the idea of just sliding the queen over to b7 and the pawn is completely unstoppable. The bishop on f1 doing a great job, by the way, of keeping the king protected. So. I'm going to go back to the live board, which it's features over. this position. That is going to be the final position of the game, Robert. What a positional display by mean. And queen d1, queen b3, definitely the game-winning maneuver. Yeah, I mean, that was just easy after he stole the pawn. He never looked back. So mean tapped to buy a perfect 5 out of 5. And so he is in the per only perfect score left. And that's great for him because we were saying, you can make a draw, but you're not going to be able to coast because those super GMs, they're going to fight you down the stretch. He now goes to 5-5. Five five. He can afford a loss as long as he's able to secure enough points to land amongst the top eight. And that was a great win by Amin. He's on 5-5. Five five. Speaking of great wins, speaking of great moves, I went back to the Suleimani Aronian game because I couldn't take my eyes off of what Aiden Suleimani just did with 16 seconds, Robert. Rook e4 takes the pawn on e5, clearing the path for his bishop to travel to d5. And the queen making contact with the rook is what makes this combination work. White is completely winning. And I think Levon is out of defensive resources here. What a move. I think I would try rook f2 as black just because it looks scary for white to deal with. I don't see an immediate checkmate against the black king, but I do see 16 uh -huh. seconds left for white. So, Donna, you are a bullet beast. You just made it to the top four of the bullet chess championship. It's one of those types of moves that just scares your opponent. Maybe there is some kind of like rook g1, but I'm already thinking about exchange sacks on g2 to try to mm -hmm. go after the white king and expose new diagonals. Yeah, rook f2 is a great practical move. That's totally what I would play. The other problem is that you can't snap this knight off the board in that line because rook takes h2 and queen f2 is a very easy mating construction to miss. You might say, oh, well, the g2 square is defended. It's easy to forget about the other mating square. Rook f2 is on the board. And with 10 seconds, can Suleimanli keep his composure and find a win that I don't see off the top of my head, Robert? It's a okay, check on so d5. And what's his follow-up? Five seconds, h2 knight is f3. hanging. Oh, rook, oh, rook f5. Five. Five. Oh, because Whoa, the bishop takes queen f8. Oh my gosh. That's really nice. Gotta try that knight is... e7 if you're Levon. Knight e7 and bring your knight back to g8 and hope that you can somehow not get made it. Lamb up into a little ball. I apologize. That was not, <laughs> that was not played. But rook oh. f5. What? What a game from Suleimanli. Oh, not over yet. Three seconds left. He's taken on F2 and just so, takes on D7. Mm -hmm. And if queen H4, there's queen D8 check because you can't block with your knight as the queen on H4 would be loose. 
Beautiful. Rook g8. Another attempt by Levon. If you take that rook, you allow perpetual check, but another accurate move. This is incredible. Uh, absolutely brilliant game from Suleimani, a teenager from Azerbaijan. He just, he's he shown. This, this game is sick. This is something I would be proud to find, Robert, in a classical game. He found all of these moves with less than 10 seconds on his clock, and he's driven the king out on f6, and he's going to checkmate it on f4. Levon resigns, but queen e6, queen e4 would have been a very fitting conclusion to this incredible game. Wow, so Suleimani goes to four and a half points. And not a name that maybe a lot of people are familiar with. He checkmated the Black King, but Suleimani has a big tournament victory to his name. He won the Air Flood Open several years back when he was even younger. He's still very young. He's a teenager, but he was like 13, 14 at the time when he was able to take that big tournament. So let's move away. Let's go to another game, and oh. it's Min Lei against Igor Lesijan. <laughs> Isn't White it's black to move. Oh, I was like, <laughs> white's up a piece, but it's black's move. So rook takes d2, allows rook c8 check with a draw. And I missed a pattern like this against a weak player in the bullet chess championship, but he's played queen takes c6. Did Igor Lisa? He's playing for a win. And is he going to regret that decision, Robert? I'm very sh surprised. He's just worse in the end game, even if white just trades queens and gives a check on c8. Black could get checkmated there very easily. Yeah, rook c8 what is check. He doing? If you have king h7, rook e8 will lead to a quick mate. And if king f7, you have rook c7 check. And you just pick up the g pawn at the very Everything. Least. Rook f3 and rook takes g7. White is completely winning. That was total madness by Igor, who might have been attracted to white's clock. But and g4 by min should also win the game. He wants rook e5, g5 mate. Oh, rook c7. Look at that. Oof. It's mate. g5. Doesn't help. Neither does h5. It's mate in one. Rook b, rook b6 is the only way to stop it, but I thankfully can take your rook and go up a full one of those. So that's game over. Min Lei scores this victory. So he is going to move up into our leaderboard. But are any other games going that won't have checkmate in one? Well, I will point out that Ali Raza Faruja has defeated uh, Nicholas Theodorus. So a big win there. We've got Garev. Uh, who faces Renato Terry, the ultra-solid Renato Terry, who seems to be... Ooh, he might be losing here. Somehow the engine not reacting. Oh, now Until it does. now. <laughs> it's like, uh, <laughs> I'll just let you evaluate for yourself. I know this is clearly winning uh, for white. The bishop has to go back to h7. Then you can take on e6 and get another passer. Okay. And at some point, there should be Sugswam. I mean, I guess you actually go the other way. It's tempting to go king f6 and e6, but I don't think you can win unless you target that a6 pawn. Gareev does go to f6, and that was the wrong way to go. You He's allowed to draw. Absolutely correct. The bishop moves, and as soon as the king goes to g6, the bishop goes back to g8. There are no points of entry for the white king, and that means the bishop will just go back and forth, and as you said, it should and will be a draw. Unbelievable. We saw how tricky, Robert, these endgames are to win in the Svane Kramni game. You could literally have two pass pawns on the cusp of promotion, but the fact that one side has a monopoly on squares of a certain color makes it so hard to make progress. And we see that here. Black just toggles between G8 and E6. Such an instructive example for students of the endgame to learn. Um, speaking of endgames, I just, out of the corner of my eye, saw Anish Giri is not winning an end game Whoa. against Mikhail Demidov. And he cannot afford to drop half points like this because he only had two and a half and a four, but he's not winning this game. King G4 picks up the, the remaining pawn. And that to me is pretty hard to believe. He was up on time. He was playing a brilliant positional game, but Mikhail Demidov, all credit to him. We saw him defending resiliently and ultimately Anish fails to win. Surprising to see Anish fail to convert that huge advantage, oh. but that's going to cost him. And oh, speaking of costing him, was that knight b5? There was a moment here where Anish could have played knight takes h6, a very thematic knight sacrifice, and he could have promoted that h pawn. Sorry to cut you off there, Robert. I just saw this out of the corner of my eye. Instead, Anish tries to break through right away with g5, and that allows Demidov to sacrifice his knight in order to eliminate. White's two pawns. A huge miss there for Anish. 
Wow. Yeah, he's going to regret that one. Maybe with a little bit more time on the clock, he would have spotted it. But not in each gear's day here in the play-in. But for Demidov, a nice result with the black pieces against a super GM. So uh, what games still remain in this round? I see just a couple still going. Yeah. And we've got this one. And Drozdowski, he beat Andrekin. So he's had himself a good day. And he's trying to hold this with black. And I think he's doing a good job of it. He's doing a great job. These are bishops of the same color, which generally make on-up endgames a little bit more winnable. But the problem here is white's pawns on the king side. They're both on light squares. White's bishop has to babysit them, and so doesn't have the time uh, to help make progress on uh, the queen side. And Robert, very important for black to keep the king on c7. As long as it's on a dark square, it can never be checked, which means you can never make ultimate progress with that c-pawn. And... Maybe White should offer a draw before it's too late, before he loses the two kingside pawns and has to grovel for the draw. Yeah, we see that it's just even material here. There's no way for Vokidov to win. And it's another good result for Drozdowski, who is an international master, but often has his rating at or above 2,500 FIDE. And at least on chess.com, he's at the top with all the best Bliss players. So another good result for him. And I don't want to be harsh, but Jordan Van Forest is not having himself a good event. He is going to give up another draw and another opposite card Bishop endgame. I guess that's the order of the day. Wait, no, this, is this winning? It's looking scary. So the king goes to c3 and b4, but maybe the bishop gets... Oh. They're just in time. Okay, now ideally you would have your king, Robert, on... Oh, but the pawn is actually the right color. So how do you hold this? Why is this still a draw? Okay, maybe you bring your king back to the... As you were saying, to the uh, c2, b1, a2. And then you sacrifice your bishop for the f pawn while you throw your h pawn away. Oh, and any time black's king goes too far, black's bishop is going to have to defend the a pawn... And like you're saying, White's going to run the H-pawn up the board and deflect the bishop from its defense of the A-pawn. And Harsh sees all of this with 10 seconds left until now. Oh, or Jordan made a mistake. On? Yeah, you oh know, pushing gosh. the pawn to F3 is clearly a mistake because now the king sits in front of the F-pawn and there's no way for the dark square bishop to defend it. I think Jordan thinks he can win that pawn with his king while keeping F3 protected. And that's his mistake. White's not going to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to Zugzwang here. Like, you know, King G3, the king has to go back to F1. But he's just trying to play this out a few more moves. But it oh! seems like it... What happened? He almost flagged. He had 0. 0.3 seconds when he made that move. And he'll lose the game if he flags. That's incredible. <laughs> exactly what I was thinking. He still got that H1. Oh, my goodness. Imagine losing on time. And... Wait, he made that move with literally zeros. I'm telling you, he's... In disbelief that this is a drawn position, but such an instructive point, Robert. You can't just aimlessly push pawns, especially when you push them to the color of your opponent's bishop. That was a big, big miss, and Jordan, his chances of qualifying into the top division are essentially out the window. And we've seen him thrive in the top division. He beat Hikaru Nakamura in a match. Uh, he looked really good, and he has played in two Division ones. But today, it's going to be... Asking a lot from him. He'll need to win every single game coming up. Honestly, that's a huge indicator of how strong these events are. It doesn't... No knock on Jordan's lack of playing strength. He's proven himself time and time again. But the fact that you can qualify in one tournament and the next, you can barely make 50% just tells you how ridiculously brutal this field is. All GMs. And Harsh Suresh is not a GM. I believe Fide Master, but a teenager from India and... Well, on the rise, very clearly, holding a draw against a former Tata Steel Masters winner in Jordan Van Forest, and a great result for White, and a disappointing one for Black. Yeah, there's always a point where you ultimately come to terms with the fact that you can't make progress. That point has been reached, and a half point has been split by the players. This was the last game of the round, Robert. And now we enter that phase where we might see our fair share of quick draws. I mean, we've already seen our fair share of quick draws at the top. But, I mean, top of the buy right now. He is the one who can't be stopped. And you made this point that when 
there are a few people with a certain score, someone has to drop down. And we know that Amin will have to drop down to play the likes of Caruana or Faruja. So it's going to be a tough matchup for him no matter which super gem he faces. But if he can hold, if he can make a few draws here, there are only four rounds remaining. He's in good shape to make it into the top eight and have a chance to play for Division One. For sure. I mean, six and a half, very likely to propel you to that division. So he needs a couple of draws, but you shouldn't think of it that way, right? You shouldn't think, oh, it's okay for me to lose a game. You don't want to enter the last round or the penultimate round needing a particular result. And Fabiano obviously is not going to give away a quick draw with the white pieces. We have a classic anti-Berlin structure where white quickly, quickly trying to expand on the king side. I'm always pretty uncomfortable in these types of structures with black. Yeah, I am not a huge fan myself. I know that it's theory. I know that you can eventually bring your knight to f8 and up to e6 and stop the and control the d4 square and make f4 less likely. But I just I know the plans, yet I still feel uncomfortable. And I'm just looking at the pairings, by the way. So we have uh, Karwan against Tabu Dubai. We have Faruja with the black pieces against Suleimanli and Frederick Svane you know, still right up there and taking on Ralph Mamedov. So. So many strong GMs in the mix right now, all the way down to 13th place to have people with four points uh, or more. And then Renato Terry, Danya, in 14th place, three and a half out of five wow. for that international master who, as I keep saying, it's an IM in title only. He's a GM strength player for sure. I also think he's got no losses. I think the one and a half points he's given away has come through draws. We saw him hold that incredibly difficult endgame against Aram Hakobian. And this is what we talked about at the start of the event, right? We get a chance to spotlight players who otherwise often fly uh, beneath the radar. Although I think after the Bullet Chess Championship and after all his Title Tuesday performances, Renato Terry is going to be on everyone's radar unless you're living under a rock. <laughs> well, we can't all be from SpongeBob. So, no, I don't think too many rocks are lived under, at least for people watching the broadcast right now. Bishop E3 from Fabiano. What do you make of that decision? Because if the bishop takes on E3, will Fabi take with the pawn, opening up the F file for his rook, or will he take with the knight so he can play F4 later and keep his pawn structure intact? That's exactly the question I was going to ask you, right? <laughs> Whether this is a good or bad move, right? The nature of Bishop E3 depends entirely on how he's going to recapture. No, not on F3, Daniel, but rather on E3. And I think Tabu Dabai was not willing to ask that question to Fabi because he was afraid of the answer. Instead, he keeps the tension with Queen E7. And one thing Fabi is not going to do is take on C5 himself because that trades entirely on Black Sturms. You're shaking your head because the knight recaptures on C5. That opens up the diagonal. And this maneuver from E6, the knight can access F4 or D4. You want to keep this knight restricted and awkward as long as possible. And so if black takes on e3, my guess is that Fabi might want to take with the knight and quickly try to push f4, but I really don't know. These positions are hard to understand. It goes yeah. back to f3. He doesn't want to take on c5. That was clear. And look at Tabu Dubai expanding with a5. That's a good decision. But we've seen this. Whether it's the Rasa Limo or the white side of what started as an anti-Berlin, Fabi enjoys playing against these double c pawns. That is a commonality between uh, the games that we've seen thus far against Mamedov and here against Tabat Dubai. So even though the evaluation says zeros, Fabi just has this preference and we'll see, can he make this work? I know in some positions that white queen ends up on the C3 square just to poke and prod at the black queen side. But for now, I see no targets, nothing to exploit. I think that Amin is playing a very nice game. He is indeed, and as this game enters its early middle game, there's a game which has entered and left the early middle game. I don't know how to characterize the phase that that game is in, and that's the game of Jan Napanushi against Noderbeck Yakuboyev. We haven't looked at Jan's games quite as much this tournament. Now, is White just losing here, or is there something that I'm missing? What is the material count? Black is up one? Two pawns? No, two pawns. How, what is... Pawns? What is this? Like, Jan with the white pieces. Okay, he goes rook b3. Whoa. That's a great move. That is a fantastic move because suddenly the black king is feeling some heat. It is indeed, and it's going to feel even more heat after rook takes c3. Doubling up on the e-file, there's an exchange sack waiting to be played on e6. And black has to put very, very careful thought into where he wants his queen to live because at least my inclination is to drop back to f6. But 
Robert, the problem with that move is that it leaves these queenside pawns unattended. So the issue might be rook c1 at a later point, coming around and picking up c6. And once white eliminates one of black's extra pawns, the d5 pawn starts feeling the heat as well. So the best move might actually be to stick around on white side of the board with queen c2. But that's a hard move to play against anybody. When you're facing Yana Pomnishi, you're very tempted to play with an abundance of caution. But apparently queen c2 is the only way to keep a big advantage here for black. And I can see a nervous player making the move queen takes rook on b3. Because currently, mm -hmm. black is up a minor piece and two pawns. So queen b3, the knight takes the queen. Then the black knight on e3 takes the rook on f1. And you say, all right, I will have two rooks for a queen, but I'll also have two rooks and a couple pawns for that queen, though my king isn't perfectly safe. He drops back to f6, can hardly blame him. It is a cautious approach. But as you were suggesting, Danya, it does seem like white can take with the rook on e3, which threatens bishop to h3 or rook to c1. Maybe it's not the end of the world for Jan, but black is clearly better. Black will at minimum be up one pawn, even if c6 drops. You're exactly right. And I think that that is the likely arc that this game is going to take. Now, some newer players, um, and it's funny if Nepo then plays this move, might be tempted by f takes e3. It's always pleasant to deliver a discovered attack, but fe3, I think, is counterproductive because it closes the e-file. It's a one-move threat, but Jan just doing Jan things right now. He is doing classic Jan things, but is this a one-move threat that can be safely parried with rook c8? Is black in time to get this king out of the center? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what exactly he is aiming for. I mean, rook c8, rook takes e3, that rook on c8 would be loose because the bishop on e6 would be pinned. But then black plays bishop e7 and castles kingside very quickly. So maybe there's something to that somewhere where like if you castle the bishop on e7 is loose in some of these positions, but I don't really believe in it. I feel like there's a little element of hope chess in the way that Jan is playing right now. I think he's calculated until rook c8 and he just hopes that something is going to materialize as it so often does in his tactical games but if we just look at it move by move right rook c8 okay white eventually does have to recapture on e3 black plays bishop b7 blocking the e-file making queen take c8 impossible i don't see a move here for white white runs out of ways to keep the black king tied in the center and if you play a move like rook fe1 black castles king, king side yeah, white's probably going to recapture the pawn on a7, but after something like rook a8, Robert, you've got connected passers in the center, and even if you exchange c6 for a3, black is not risking. Black's got a very compact arrangement here in the center, and I think Jan might be on the cusp of having a, a technically lost position if black can get this king out of the center safely. Looks really, really bad. And while Jan struggles to hold this game. I just want to point out that Min Lei won very quickly, and if we could pull up his game, uh, potentially, move 17 was a sweet tactic from Wonderful Time. He had a blast with that one. Look at this, Danya. After this position. Oh! he's He went Rook FC8. That's the setup move. Mm -hmm. Alina's just playing like nothing's the matter. Rook 8 you want, and bang! Knight takes bang. d4 mike breen somewhere is very happy about that because oh, yeah. bang the knight on f3 takes queen h2 delivers a checkmate on h1 and if you take with a pawn on d4 you lose your queen on c2 so knight takes oh, d4 he loses the rook too oh. it, was a, it was a one move shot that was overlooked and then min quickly won wow min lee is just oh and queen a6 i mean he was on fire this game this essentially either forces the queen trade or forces White's queen back, Salinas ending up giving up another exchange and didn't take long for Min to convert his two extra rooks. Big, big game, and Min Lee putting himself in great position to potentially make his way into the top division. Very, very impressive. Um, of the other top games that, that we have going, which we haven't looked at yet, we have Solim on against Ferusha. Maybe a quick look at this game. It's not a particularly enterprising position. Looks like Ali Rez is just up a pawn. Uh, yep, your math is correct. White's king is in worse <laughs> shape. Black is up a pawn. And queen d7 keeps everything together. So this looks very unpleasant for Suleimanli. So Feruja trying to get the job done that Levon Aronian couldn't against the young opponent. But it looks very, very nice for Ali Reza, who would love to jump to 5 and f to 6. Indeed. He's going to play rookie 8. This knight on f6 has tremendous prospects. On the king side, if you look at all these weak light squares, then I can jump to e4. It can jump to g4 for attacking purposes. 
this is the kind of position that we're so used to the top players converting regularly. So I'll give you uh, the wheel here, Robert. Where should we go from here? We've got the Fabi game, which has been pretty balanced all the way through. But we also have a lot of other top games that have been very combative. We only have like one or two quick draws on the top 10 boards. I love to see that. Yeah, no, we have fights. And it's because it's still early stages here. When players get a couple more victories, they may think, all right, I'll sail into the top eight. But right now, you don't know what's going on. By the way, Yana Pomchi is toast. Like, completely dumb. Completely toast? In that game. Let's take a look. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just crushing for Yakubayev. And you know what happened, Danya? I think I understand the error of Jan's ways. That... He thought he was going to have a an opportunity to win the bishop on e7 if we can just very quickly go back to around sure. move 21. Just very quickly here. So he was queen b7. He doesn't even take mm -hmm. the pawn. And at this moment, after castle, he thought rook f3 kicks the queen away from oh the defense of the bishop gosh. on e7. But he overlooked not queen d4, which runs into knight b3, and white does win that piece, but he missed queen h6 which hits that knight on d2. The knight doesn't get a tempo against the queen. You take e7, you lose d2. Black is up material. That's such a great spot by you because without this piece of information, Jan's play makes no sense, right? Why would he go queen a6? Why would he help black protect the c6 pawn? And it definitely is the reason. After queen h6, Jan had no choice but to take the bishop. Great find, take rook b1. But now you're just down two pawns and... What two pawns they are. Two connected passers in the center. And all Yukuboyev has to do is set those pawns in motion. I think White's only hope here might be the clock situation. Jan is up five minutes on the clock. I think he's the only person who's up five mm -hmm. minutes on the clock in a rapid game. But the issue is that this position is so easy for Black to play. Rook, C to E8, very circumspect move, right? You didn't want to go D2 and allow complications with Rook takes E6. Even if Black is actually still winning by moving the queen away to a1, defending the g7 pawn. Why seek these adventures against someone as tactically gifted and as tricky as Jan? Yeah, because you have to invest a lot of time just double, triple checking. Rook to e8 simply defends the bishop in his place. There's no attack that I can see. If you attack the d3 pawn with queen d6, then I slide my rook over to d8, and I'm protecting my passed pawn and helping... It to the other side of the board. You're ushering it. So I just don't see a plan for Nepo here. I do think that Yakubayev is completely winning, and I would be very, very, very surprised if Yakubayev doesn't actually secure victory. I would be surprised as well. Three minutes is plenty of time for uh, a player as experienced in online blitz as Yakubayev. So a huge, huge win this would be with the black pieces uh, by Noderbeck, putting himself in great position for the final three rounds. And a couple of other top players are in great position. Frederick Svane was leading the tournament before his loss to Amin Tabatabai. Shall we look at his attempt to redeem himself? And redeem himself, he is not going to, I think. No, and if, actually, if you just go back like one full move, yeah. that White took a pawn on e5 with his last turn. And Ralph says, I actually sacrificed a pawn there to free up my bishop to win your trapped rook on e4 if you go rook h4 the d3 pawn falls and you're just losing all sorts of material uh maybe not right away maybe bishop e3 check first but the point is your position is collapsing yeah top players just seem to have their pieces on ideal squares at all times look at the coordination between all of black's pieces and i love the placement of the queen right it may seem like black's worst piece but the queen is just kind of in the shadows directing the war effort it's protecting d4 it's pressuring e5 it's sort of the glue piece in this position while you know, the minor pieces and the rooks are doing uh, the dirty work of jumping into white's territory and actually eliminating the pawns that are holding white's position together. And we do have rook h4. And Robert, I actually think black can potentially take on d3 right away. And he already does because of that queen on c5, x-raying the rook. I don't know when you play d3. Maybe as early as in the next two moves. You just play bishop takes e2 and d3 check. And can I show an interesting line? After rook takes h6... I think bishop b2, bishop b2, d3. And if bishop f2, look at this idea. Rook takes f2, queen takes f2, and simply on takes e2. Beautiful position. Queen takes c5, e1 equals queen. Checkmate, my friends. I think in my mind, 
where the bishop was still on f1 in those positions, and with the bishop on e2, well, it's clearly just game over with d3. And as you point out, a temporary oh. <laughs> rook sack for a bishop, it's all happening, and then it, it's game over. All of it. So, Ralph Mamedov has played an excellent day of chess. He survived that game against Fabiano Caruana. So not really a surprise to see him in, in the thick of things. He's made it to Division I uh, before, and he would like to get right back there. And we see a frustrated Fred Vane on camera there. That is how quickly your fortunes can change in these brutal events. You're on four out of four, top of the leaderboard. Suddenly you're on four out of six, and you're basically in the middle of the pack. And the worst thing is that you're probably going to play somebody with a 2600 plus rating in the next round so once you start backsliding in this event it's so so hard to get out of the tailspin yeah and you then need to score victories because you still want to cling on to those hopes of making it to division one but then when you're playing for wins you're not really being objective and this position that we have between fabi and i mean it's objectively equal i actually am starting to like black's position here uh the black king could find itself vulnerable at some point but the A pawn is being threatened directly. So is Fabi going to switch to the D file with some kind of doubling of the rooks? I don't think you're in time for that. So what is white going to do in this position? Well, I guess white's only source of counterplay is the weak black king on G8. You are going to lose the A4 pawn, just mathematically, right? Black has one, two, three attackers, and white cannot involve a third defender on this pawn, right? White is one tempo short. If the rook was on A3, Maybe White could have doubled on the A file. And Black is going to take the pawn with his pawn in order to accelerate its progress. The B file will open, Robert, when Black does that. So maybe White can preemptively put his queen on B2. Maybe something like Rick AB1 could even be considered in order to infiltrate the seventh rank in the event the Black takes with the B pawn. But I feel like that's a little bit speculative. Bobby goes more mainstream. He goes down main street attacking the knight on D7, but... What's his follow-up if Black drops that knight back to f8? Does he want to go bishop b6 and force Black to, to capture on a4 with the rook? Yeah, maybe his bishop gets those new squares b6 or c5. The knight, in fact, went up to f6. But then finally, Kukla's queen d6. That was a pretty sizable mistake from Tabit Zabai. Of course, entering the game, you say, you'll make a draw with Black against Fabiano Caruana. He says, sign me up. But this feels like the tide of the game is turning, and it went from clear advantage Black to something maybe Black's needs to be a bit careful as all those pawns are in dark squares and white has a dark square bishop that can start attacking them at some point. And black's king could get unexpectedly caught in the crossfire even with the queens off the board. So we're probably going to see king f7. White's going to take on c6 and the other rook could drop into d1. Suddenly you have all these annoying ladder checkmate threats and one rook coming to the seventh, the other to the sixth. We could get a very tactical affair here with black's a pawn rushing down the board. And white trying to use those two or three tempi that he has in order to generate threats against black's king the rook takes a4 oh and what a move by fabi just moving the rook away and saying yeah congrats you got the a file but you don't have a passed pawn after all and after rook takes c6 i would probably take white here by a smidge yeah i mean white has a bishop against a knight although black's king is very safe now rook b6 rook takes c3 rook takes b5 and that e5 pawn being on a dark square, it's a little bit uncomfortable to deal with. And I think with ensuing time trouble, I would prefer to have the white side here. It's objectively equal. We can see that uh, there are not that many pieces remaining. In fact, the fact, in fact, the fact, that just tripped me up. <laughs> but what I was going to say is that bl having pawns only on one side of the board is helpful for the knight. But... Now those pawns on the queen side still on the board. That's bad news for me. And he can't take on c3 because bishop e1, and that's a skewer in the diagonal. Indeed. And suddenly Amin is, has his hands full. He's got all these issues. And he's gone rook c to a4. Now he's got this weird, awkward arrangement of rooks, and his 7th and 6th ranks are open. What's holding Fabiano back is that you can't move this rook up from d1 for the time being, because black is going to drop into a1 and win the bishop on f2. But can Fabi coordinate his rooks in time? Maybe he wants to throw in an h4? I don't know. Things getting really heated here as the player's clock's dwindling even further down. And Fabi brings his king close to the center. And this is what has been allowing Amin to stay even 
in terms of material. This rook a1 idea, their back rank checkmate threat. So Fabi's bishop back on e1, the c3 pawn is well guarded. But how do you get out of this for white? You're going to go king e2, bishop d2, king d3, kind of slowly inch forward. And the b5 pawn is under attack. So rook b1 is the move that comes to my mind. But I think Fabi's going to play c4 as a response. And that wins him a pawn. It does indeed. And I mean, minute on the clock. How do you defend? You might have to give up the b5 pawn and generate counterplay on the king side. That's what he's trying to do, Robert. Well, what threat does this move create? It might actually make his pawn chain even weaker after rook takes b5. And it gives white the h4 square for the bishop. So if you give white two moves, king e2 and bishop h4, I feel like black is in huge trouble at that moment. So I'm starting with king e2. Rook a2 check, I mentioned. You can play bishop d2 as your response. White is up a pawn and playing without risk. Playing without risk indeed. And so Fabi keeps extending the game. He could have repeated moves there. Has no interest in doing so. I will interrupt our discussion of this game briefly and say that Yana Pamishi has managed to win back one uh, of the two pawns that he was lacking and is very close to drawing the game. But Amin is trying to force things and he just wanted a bishop. Oh, he missed king e3 completely. It's one of those ideas like, oh, king takes f3, I'm down a pawn in the end game, I can hold. And then your pawn plays king e3 and it's a cold shower. f2, rook b1, as you've highlighted, Ooh. that just wins the game for Fabi. You can see the relief from him. Huge victory for Fabiano Caruana as he'll go to five and a half out of six with Frugia. What a great patient game. It felt like he was getting outplayed, but he seized his opportunity. Some amazing rook play a little bit earlier to prevent black from getting a pass pawn and can't really blame Amin for panicking. That's just what these top guys do. Great tournament for Fabi and he is knocking on the door. One of his best CCT qualifier performances yet. And Jan Napomsi survived that game. Unbelievable speed it paid off for him. And where to next, Danya? I see a few more games are going. Jeffrey Zhang oh. is playing against Alexander Shimano, for example. And what is that game between Yesipenko and Meyer? Your guess is as good as Myers. <laughs> oh, gosh, Danya, that was not bad at all. I have to give it to you. But this game is absolutely crazy where I'm trying to do a quick material count. It looks like white is down a piece for one pawn, but those D and C pawns are very dangerous. Yeah, I mean, jeez, it's very dangerous. They're going to go D6, D7 and shove it down Black's face here. Black is up a full piece here, but it doesn't feel that way at all. He's given away the exchange. Why could have taken that rook? Instead, he plays the unnecessary d6, allowing black to give it away for another pawn. Very strange decision there by Meyer, by Esipenko, who's got no time at all. Yeah, he's, he's going trying to the... get his rook down to d7. He's going after the queen, the queen. What? Whoa! Whoa! Yeah, rook d6, what a BC sack. Two. Oh. And White could have dropped back to D1 there. Apparently oh, there was, oh queen seven. F7. Queen F7. Queen F7. He oh, missed it. Yeah, he had uh, crazy pieces. He could have taken on F7 and then won the queen. He would have been up in exchange. But now it's all Georg Meyer. That was a win on the spot for Andrei Esipenko. Now Meyer is all over him. It's still not completely over, but White's running out of attacking ideas against Black's king, which is completely safe, blanketed by these two bishops. Now it's yeah. over. Yeah, that B pawn also helps. Just push the pawn to B2. Bishop A2 is a threat. That's on Queen F5. That should get the job done. He goes for that uh, move, and yeah, it's completely winning for Black. Amazing how it's so much easier from the side. We see that Eva Bar swing up. You see immediately what the winning move was, and it came in this moment. E4. Both queens are hanging. You need to look for Desperado sacks. And Desperado sacks exist here. After Rook takes D6, Black can resign on the spot. That's how quickly fortune change and what a win for Georg Meyer with the black pieces against someone as strong as Andreas Sipenko who's defeated Magnus Carlsen before in classical chess hey, in desperado times you have to take desperado measures Danya and that was the tactical motif that was not found in this game incredible Georg Meyer wins I think that might have been the last game oh there's actually a couple of games still remaining let's flip on Demidov against Sam Sevi and another crazy time scramble Sam He's been struggling this tournament, but a couple of wins in the last rounds can propel some of the players who are on 50% right now to a very solid performance and, and make their way into Division 2. Don't miss a fork, Mikael. Don't go King C3. Don't do that. Oh, 
It's so oh, difficult. This is so nerve wracking. Yeah, and also this is a great illustration of what I keep saying. This is not even material. This is black up two pawns on the king side, white mm-hmm. up two pawns on the queen side, but white pawns they haven't moved just yet. Maybe it's time to start. And he pushes b4, and black can't play g4 because knight f4 is loose. And I really like these lower board games because you see players playing such uncompromising chess. Savian knows that he really can't afford to give up another draw if he wants to make Division 2 at the least. So he keeps finding ways to prolong the game and prolong the game and win one of White's pawns. Yes, just... Rook C2. Rook is, what is the follow-up to that? There's 93 check. 93 King C3, though. The Rook also hangs. Rook C4. And you can't go back to B6. Oh, oh he went there first. Knight oh, C4's mate. Knight C4's mate. mate. Oh, ho, ho, ho. <sighs> look at that. That is hard to accept, but beautiful to take in. That is an aesthetically pleasing mating pattern. We have the game still going. Feels like this round has been going on forever. I'm not, not complaining because we got a lot of fascinating endgames to conclude this round. And one of them is Jones against Serana. I think this one's just a dead draw. Correct me if I'm wrong. I like what Alexei's doing, though, is he's not pushing his pawn to a2 just yet because then that is a very clear draw. So he's keeping outside chances for his king to sprint from f7 up the board, but that is why Gawain Jones is not giving any checks. He does not want to allow the black king up to the sixth rank. So yes, this should certainly be a draw if, unless Gawain blunders. And I want to give a very quick shout to... Uh, Constantine Lupulescu, who beat Vladimir Kromnik with black. And Lupulescu played in the Grand Chess Tour. He lost pretty much every game he played. Like, he was getting pummeled by the highest rated players in chess, and yet he always seemed like he was having a good time gaining experience, and that experience paid off right here today, where he beat Kromnik with the black pieces. So, you know, sometimes these GMs, they suffer huh. against the hands of the mighty. Whoa. What? What? Is this? Alexi Serrana was flirting with disaster here. This was actually an only series of moves to win the H1. <laughs> All right, Alexi, time to make that draw. Yeah, now the draw is going to be agreed to. But yeah, I just wanted to finish my thought that uh, Lupulescu, mm-hmm. he had such a miserable performance against the best players in the world. So to see him just mm-hmm. right back at it, taking down Vladimir Kromnik, that's pretty awesome. It is indeed. And it's never easy to be in that position of being the lower rated player. He was handling himself very gracefully and obviously using that experience positively and harnessing it using it to play really really well in this tournament thus far we are in for an incredibly exciting last couple of rounds we certainly are i'm excited i mean look at the top of the leaderboard here we have caruana Faruja, they have to play each other with five and a half out of six each then amin top of dubai ralph mamedov minle and do you see that renato terry has four look and a half out of six He's won again. And who did he beat? He beat. I'm looking for him. I'm going to find him right now. I'll tell you in one second. Oh, my gosh. He still hasn't lost a single game. Okay. But not only that, he hasn't just made draws. He beat Kovalenko. Yeah, he beat Kovalenko. He beat Serrana. He beat Jordan von Forrest. Renato Terry can't stop, won't stop. Will he be in the matches for Division <laughs> One? Now, that would be something. I That would be the first time an international master is in Division 1 and might be the only time in chess history that I am as in a tournament this strong. But people ask me on my stream, why is Renato not a GM? And I never have an answer. I don't think there is an answer to that question. Yeah, paperwork, not playing over the board enough. His strength is clear. But Fabiano Caruana is taking on Ali Reza Ferruja right now. And that could mean we get an epic clash between two of the best players on the planet. Or at some point, they'll offer a draw because they're both doing so well. So which one will it be, Danya? Honestly, given the opening, I feel like we've got a good chance of a combative game. If Ali Reza wanted a draw, my coach always told me that one e4, although it has a reputation as a more aggressive opening than one t4, it's also more forcing. And the top players know all of the most forcing lines. They know how to make a draw in one e4. So the fact that Ali Reza played the English Tells me that he wants a more open-ended position. He wants to play for a win, and he feels confident that he can outplay Fabi with the white pieces in a strategic battle. Well, we'll see if his gutsy decision turns out to be rewarding. And we know Fabi very well, and I've spoken to him about this at length. He doesn't like taking quick draws. Like You don't see that from him. Uh, with the black pieces, if your opponent forces it, sure. 
Alireza himself, not really the type of player who makes quick draws. He likes to fight. So in this game, it's very early stages here. I think that Black typically puts a pawn on c6. Just make sure that the center is nice and well defended. And also, white is kind of threatening. Threatening is a little strong, but knight b5 could be annoying in some positions. So c6 uh, reinforces the center, takes care of any knight hops. I think that it's just early stages. And if you find a more fascinating opening battle, please take us there. Yeah, knight h5 actually making that opening battle a little bit more fascinating. A pawn sacrifice by Fabiana Karawan Ali Reza immediately grabs the pawn on d5 and says, I am calling your bluff. What does Fabi get in return for the pawn? Well, he gets the bishop pair, and obviously White's king has been weakened a little bit by the re removal of the pawn on g3. But I'll be honest with you, I almost called you Fabi. <laughs> I'm very skeptical about this pawn sack. Ali Reza goes e3. He's going to follow up with d4 and really clamp down on this e5 square. I'm not really seeing the compensation here for Fabi at all. I don't understand it. Like I, He doubled his opponent's pawns. The white king may have a little bit of air in front of it, but there's nothing to do with it. So I was looking mm -hmm. at c6. I mentioned that move. I don't like this decision from Fabiano. I wonder if he mixed up variations or he just assumed that he would have the necessary counterplay uh, to stabilize, but... He's just down a pawn, and I think white is very clearly better. Could have also just been a blunder. Maybe he forgot the F4 bishop was defended, right? From our perspective, we think that's odd, but it's a long tournament. The player's starting to get a little bit tired, and Bobby now has his work cut out for him. And another player who's got his work cut out for him is Jan Nepomniche. I want to take another look at his opening, which has been all over the map today. It's been crazy position after crazy position. A king's gambit. Essayed by Yana Pomnishi, an opening that he has been playing religiously in rapid chess. He did a course on it. This is not Nepo fooling around. This is Nepo playing an opening that often gets poo-pooed, but is often poorly studied by some of the top players. Yeah, and the position that he has on the board, you wouldn't even know necessarily came from a king's no. gambit. And the white king is jetting out of the center. If you uh, allow me to, I'm going to castle queenside just next. And that black king is in some danger. So castling queenside, very natural here. And I think black should play f3. You need to tie down some of white's pieces because the structure is clearly preferable for white. a7 and c6 are split. e6 is a target. So I'm playing f3. I don't know how I'm following it up, but I'm starting with that pawn push. Yeah, I think f3 is, is largely... A no-brainer. I guess you could start by taking on c3, but there's no point in doing that either. White's obviously not going to play. Knight takes d5 here. In fact, that would lose the game to a very instructive tactic. Queen takes bishop check, then black recaptures the queen, and then both the rook and the knight are hanging. So Nepo's going to move his queen. Where is he going to put it? Queen e4 comes to mind. Queen c4. Clearing the e4 square for his knight. I think that makes sense as well. But maybe if Rassane can stick a bishop on e5 to really take the sting out of any potential knight sally. Yeah, bishop e5 is a very lovely move. Queen takes c6 would run right into rook coming to c8, and then it's the white king in danger. But Jan, I don't know if this is prep, or he just feels like making move in, moves instantly every single <laughs> it's time. It's just Jan. <laughs> just Jan things. But it looks good for white. I see the eval bar suggesting it's level. I don't have that same sense, because I, I do think that the black pawns, despite having a passer, they're more vulnerable. Yeah, I don't have that sense at all, because even if black plays f2, I'm with you. That pawn looks menacing, but white's knight can maybe travel from a4, exchange on b2, and eventually make its way to d3. And the moment black loses the f-pawn, that's the pride of his position. Black's going to be left with, you know, a bunch of dead pawns all over the position. So Jan can continue improving with rook de1. Maybe you can slide the king over to b1. Although then you're allowing knight takes with check. So no, I think Jan should move the rook away from the d-file. Yeah, makes sense to me. And uh, I just want to quickly, I know it's a player we want to watch, Jan Apamshi. I want to look at Amin Tabatabai against Min Lei because Amin lost to Fabiano Caruana. But look at his position right now against Min. And Min won a very quick game in the previous round against Salinas. But look at this, it's horrible for black. Black's not even up any material. And the king on h7 is in huge trouble. Amin against Min. Okay, well, I mean, this does look pretty bad for black. White is, yeah, not up upon. It looks like white's up upon, but he's not. The problem is just the long-term safety of the king, as you're pointing out, Robert. And one plan involves dropping the bishop back, 
and then moving this queen, not like a knight, but rather <laughs> like a bishop, and then like a rook over to the h file, the knight on f3 can jump to g5 really on demand. There's nothing that black can do to protect that square. So I think the key for Amin is to make sure that his bishop stays alive, because that is really the glue piece that's ensuring access, 24-hour access to the g5 square. And he puts the bishop on that square. I think he's then going to put his knight on e5, which is an alternate arrangement uh, that's very, very effective this this is losing for Min. What a disaster. Yeah, Min is just... Min. Got, yeah, <laughs> mean. Yeah. No. <laughs> Min, I was being pretty mean to him. You were, but I know you and Min are great friends. Min being such a wholesome streamer, uh, really just a fantastic player, uh, has been proving himself well in that match against Magnus Carlsen, the Bullet Chess Championship. But right now, it's not his game. And I know we're jumping around a bunch, but the game between Fabi and Ali Reza, that has become increasingly sharp, where at first we were wondering what Fabiano was doing, but when you drop pawns, you clear lines, and that rook on a8 is now on h6. And his position has improved exponentially, continues to improve. Oligras is kind of tilting away this game. He's just played the move f5 in order to slice off the black bishop, but that's created another target. Fabi with queen h4, he can play g6, Robert, and try to reopen that diagonal, and once the bishop lands on h3, you're dealing with potentially unstoppable mate threats. Also, what hurts white is that that bishop on before guards the e1 square. So I'm envisioning a scenario where if white's king makes a run for the center, its path toward the center has been narrowed even further by black's control over dark squares on the queen side. G6 is an excellent move. And I just want to do an instant replay to show how the rook got over there because it was a <laughs> pawn dropped in the center. And we'll just go through the moves. We don't have to analyze them. But it's fun to note that that rook came from a8 he went with his pawn to a4, and the rook decided to slide up to a5 and then swing over to h5. And I love that he played a3 first. That's such a super GM move. First, you induce some kinks, uh, some dark square weaknesses on the queen side. Then you swing the rook over to h5, and the rook's not done yet. It parks itself on a safer square. Then look at the play on both sides. Yeah, Eval Bar calls this move a mistake, but I like it. Sticks the bishop on the weak square. Ali Reza losing the threat of the game. And G6 is on the board by Fabi. He's on fire. And the way that he was able to manufacture threats against White's King from what looked like a no compensation position is so impressive. He is on fire this tournament. Playing super, super well. Uh, I think from what we've seen, yeah, there were some positions that were even that he ended up winning, like against Amin Tabatabai. And then against Ralph Mamedov, he was better and he couldn't convert that advantage. Uh, but five and a half of the six... With the black piece against Ali Reza Farouja, huge advantage for him. And another tactical point in this position, Danya, is that the knight on e4 kind of needs to stay put because if it moves, knight takes e3 is available to black and oh. the g3 knight is loose. Yeah, I don't see a move for white. I mean, you can't really play f takes g6. We've determined that that's completely out of the question. You have to keep this pawn on f5 because at the very least, if black takes on f5, you buy yourself one more tempo but that's all you get robert because that pawn is going to move on to f4 and kind of throw itself into the wastebasket in order to open up the diagonal for the bishop white is knocking on the door of just losing this within a couple of moves so maybe you do have to play knight c5 so that at least g takes f5 doesn't come with tempo right but after knight c5 i'll probably take your knight on c5 and if you take uh -huh. with the queen then i take on f5 with the pawn and i continue uh -huh. my attack and if you take with the pawn on c5, I was thinking then I go for my knight takes e3 idea where black, I think, must be better in those positions because white's pawn structure is so weak. Indeed. And after queen takes g3, the e pawn will be hanging. The h pawn will also be capturable by the black rook. Wow. This, this might just be game over red rover within a couple of moves here. And Faruja needs to dig deep right now. He needs to find a concrete plan because if you continue to flounder... Fabi's plan is simple. Take on f5, play f4, take on h3, deliver checkmate. It's really that straightforward. It really is. And he's now building up a time advantage. And knight c5 has been played. Apparently the only way to keep chances alive. And knight takes e3 straight away by Fabiano. Very tempting move. But this is a very important resource for Ali Reza. Bringing the rook up, knocking the queen back to g5, and buying himself one more tempo that he can use. To maybe try to generate counterplay on the other side against this hanging bishop on before? Really not sure. Yeah, this pawn on f5 is now 
vulnerable. You, the queen needed to move first. But if you take on g6, which he just did, I'm not sure if five is going to take with the pawn. And he's paused. This is not the first time today we have seen super grandmasters in moments where I would have pre-moved h6, g6, without question. Mm -hmm. just, let me fix my pawn structure, capture toward the center. That's what my coach taught me. He might take with the rook on g6 and go for a pin along g yeah, he doesn't. I mean, it great call. Just super instructive stuff from him. Where now Ali Reza is trying desperately to defend, to bring all his pieces to the king side, and you can't take on h3 just yet. But maybe there's a place for this queen to drop to, like queen h6, so you can play bishop takes h3, mm -hmm. move later. And of course, you have the both attacking and defensive idea of tucking the king away on h8, bringing it to a safer square, but also vacating the g8 square for the rook and increasing. The massive pressure on this g2 bishop. I'm totally with you. Some of the recaptures in this tournament have been ultra impressive. The pauses, knowing when to pause, sensing hidden moments when you can make a really good move, and then actually acting on that thinking and resisting the temptation to play a move that, as you said, I would have played it automatically. A lot of players would, but that's what makes Fabi Fabi. And this is not what makes Fabi Fabi. I'm surprised he's traded queens Maybe trying to play a little bit too cautiously here. Maybe looking Whoa. at the bishop pair as a huge advantage, but the pawn structure is bad for black. Now I want to put my rook back on h6 and put my pawn on g6. If you were going to trade queens, I would like to have a better yeah. pawn structure show for it. It feels like it's very incongruent what he's done in the last move and what he did on the move before that. If you're playing rook takes g6, I'll be honest, I thought queen h6 or queen h5 was a no-brainer. I thought the choice was between where you're retreating your queen, not between retreating your queen and trading and it doesn't even feel like white is that much worse to be honest anymore i like the bishop pair that's what i'll say for black but i just don't like the pawn structure at all and this knight will eventually go back to d3 that frees the bishop to go back to a square like e7 but rerouting the knight could be a bit annoying for black to deal with so the good news for fabi is he's not in danger the bad news is most of his advantage has been thrown away and a big sigh of relief by Ali Reza Ferruja as Fabi decides to take the queens off the board. They will keep playing this end game, And I'm kind of looking around the horn. We have a couple of peaceful results. Ralph Mamedov draws uh, top Spanish GM, Jaime Santos Latasa. We have that Nepo Fresene game, which seems to be headed in a peaceful direction as well. Jan with seven minutes to his opponent's one. But there's only so much you can do when you play this fast. And it looks like Jan, he had some chances at some point. But I think Laurent is going to draw this with a minute on his clock. And Fresine beat Magnus Carlsen the last time I was watching uh, him play in these events. So he's uh, experienced in these champion chess tour play-ins. And if he is able to secure the draw, which he should be able to do, he'll go to 5 out of 7. And he's got a puncher's chance of winning some games down the stretch and making it to the match play for Division One. And a lot of very impressive performances in this tournament thus far. Alexander Bortnik, my good friend, is doing super well. He draws Eduardo Iturizaga on board 5. So he keeps himself in the loop. But let's look at Renato Terry, because this kid is amazing. And... Fortunately for Renato, it looks like his amazing run, well, it's not coming to an end. He still has two more games after this one, but I think Levon is knocking on the door of a big win with the Black Pieces. And Levon has struggled a bit. He lost that game to Aiden Suleimanli. And you know what his reward was after losing Aiden? He played Kirill Alexenko. He beat Alexenko. Oh, like, but can you yeah. imagine to losing to Suleimanli and thinking, okay, I'll get... Maybe someone 2,400. No, you get another 2,700 there. He beats him. Now he's ahead against Renato Terry. And Levon is back. And you see by the scoreboard, if he wins, he goes to 5 out of 7. And that oh. puts him into the top 8. Levon not resisting the temptation of threatening <laughs> Rook takes H2. Oh, forcing my white queen. Oh, my God. Queen sack. Please. Oh, no, my queen. Where's Eric Rosen at? Oh, blundered his queen, blundered his rook. Wait, the rook is defended. The queen is indirectly defended. And now I think it's time to trade queens and smack on h3, move to h2, move to the other side, and start hunting down these vulnerable queenside pawns. Looks simple. He goes play rook g3, rook takes g1. He is a pawn, but I wouldn't go for that. Yeah, you never know, right? Allowing this outside passer. White's knight is in very good position to jump to b5 and pave the way for a potential a pawn to move down to a7. So I'm with you. I think he's going to go rook h2. But again, Levon taking his time. These players, 
you're so good at identifying when the critical moments occur. And you can assess that by their thinking patterns. It's Fabi when he played Rook takes G6 and El Lebon not making an automatic move, knowing that the decision he makes now will have a direct bearing on how easy it'll be to convert this advantage. And Rook H2 is the result. Yeah, the right decision. He was probably looking, can I calculate this game to its conclusion? In which case, Rook G3 takes G1 might be it. But why trade? Look at this position. He is well ahead. He can trade Rooks a bit later if he wants. And he can just go after the hanging white pawns. But Knight B5, that's an annoying move because that protects A3. And you can't kick the Knight off that square. Yeah, that B4 pawn acts as kind of an umbrella, right? You can put the Rook on B2, but where do you go from there? I think the key to the kingdom here is to involve the kingside pawns, right? You've got a four on two on the king side, as one Robert Hess would say, you're two pawns up on the king side, one pawn down on the queen side, but white's pawns aren't going anywhere. The moment white plays a four, black is going to put the rook behind the pawn, and all you're going to do is lose the only source of potential rescue that you have. So Renato might want to go rook g2. He might want to try to activate his rook via g4 until it's too, before it's too late. But, I mean, with 50 seconds left, I don't see him holding this. Danya, my jaw dropped. And the reason why is Jan Napomshi oh. won that endgame. Jan won? It's it's the clock. No way. The clock is Gotta his best friend. Gotta look at that game. Wow. You know, it just wasn't enough time for Fresnina to figure things out. And he ended up into a lost Rook and Pawn versus Rook and Pawn ending. Yeah, this moment was... Uh, one where Fresene could have forced a draw with rook b5, but 50 seconds you're playing Jan. He let the king get a little bit too active. That's just what Nepanushi does, and he wins a huge game. Okay, so he is in the mix as well. Amin Tabatabai still hasn't won his game, but I think he is about to against Min Lee, who's been struggling really since the first moves of this game. Yeah, an extra exchange for white, a very safe king for one side, and it's not Min. So this looks like it should be mop-up duty with the lead on the clock as well. So where else should we turn to? I mean, so many big battles in this field. Fabi against Faruja still going on. Where do you want to turn? Yeah, Fabi Faruja is really interesting. We have Meyer Oparin on one of the top boards, but that's a pretty straightforward game. Let's go back to Fabi's game against Faruja. Let's see how that end game is doing. Because both sides are now below two minutes on the clock. Really raises the intrigue of this endgame. Knight f4 has just been played by Ferruccio. What do you make of this position? At first, I think that white should be better. Because I like white's activity. Black's pieces, the rook on g6 is under attack. Uh, the bishop on c8 is at home. But the a3 pawn is defended. And it's pretty much a thorn in white's side. Because at some point, you have to be very careful not to allow like a bishop e6 takes b3. Some end games that look just like a draw or even better for white. You miss a tactic like that, that pass pawn uh, could mm -hmm. be a uh, runner. So rook h6 is a good start. You need to keep your dark square bishop with your fobby. But I don't necessarily see a plan for either side. And considering we're in blitz, Danya, that means it's quite likely that mistakes are going to happen. They're definitely going to start happening. And your point is very well taken about bishop e6, bishop takes b3. That's not just a speculative idea. I think rook trades are in black's favor precisely for that reason. The more pieces are gone, the easier it is to clear the traffic and just go bishop e6 and threaten the sack on b3. So in the event that Fabi moves his bishop away from c8, which is very likely, I would try to keep everything on the board. I would go back to a5 and keep a very close eye on this a3 pawn. But bishop, yeah, rook a5 is good because bishop f5 is also an idea to go bishop b1. Oh. So all there is needs to be very careful. For instance, if you play rook a7, thinking that, you know, you've stopped that bishop from moving his b7 is loose, there is an opportunity to think about bishop f5. I'm not sure it works because the black king is in some danger, but the point is bishop yep. f5, bishop b1, that at least has to scare you. And Ferruja now down to 47 seconds, and he plays pawn to e4, which, you know, he's getting active, but he's loosening up control as well. And of course, black cannot take on e4 because you drop the bishop on c8. And that pawn is going to run it, run its way up to e5. Ferruja using the limited resources at his disposal to generate active counterplay. And in the blink of an eye, Robert, both sides are now below a minute. It's going to be scramble time. And I think that Fabi, he needs to find a plan right now because in the bullet chess championship and other scrambles, we have seen him struggle. Whereas Ferruja... Uh, we know what he's capable of. He beat Magnus in the BCC, but Bishop B7, great move. You said it. Rook trades favor black. And they do. And we've got one pair of rooks off the board. The other rook is awkwardly placed 
on h6, but it is controlling a couple of important squares on the sixth rank. Will Ali Reza bring his pawn up to e5? Well, the drawback of that move is that it reopens the pathway for Black's bishop from f5 to b1, as you pointed out. And so Ferruja adopting a more defensive posture, but it feels like Fabi is taking over the initiative, and maybe now is the time to re-involve the rook and make it rejoin society. Oh, and you want rook takes b3. Like, taking on b3 with oh, something... Oh, it was a it threat. ...is a huge threat. <laughs> and he goes rook h4 first. Now, how is he going to increase the pressure? Bishop e6, watch out. Bishop takes b3 doesn't work because rook f1 at the end for white. But that rook can't go to f1 now because h3 is loose. So it looks like white is dealing with a lot on both sides of the board. For sure. And when you're in a time scramble like this, you want to set up potential threats. Yeah, bishop takes b3 is not possible now, but it's so easy to forget about this move a little bit later. And Fabi just feeling re precision, moving the bishop from F5. the queen side to the king side. F5. 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 Yes. Ship you... away at the center. And that pawn on d4 was loose then, but he goes rook h6. He wants to go over to f6, it would seem. And he, look at that move. I love bishop c8. You were under attack. Just defend b7. Now bring your dark oh. sword bishop back. And he's just creating problems for white move after move. The bishops are like a slinky moving back in concert and now moving forward again. That bishop on e6 is now firmly entrenched. It can't be chased away by white's pawns because white's got this big, big hole on d5. Ruja treading water, but can Fabi take on h3 here? He can I because he can. He's bishop h4. He finds it. Rook h1 looks like oh, it wins or material. Bishop g2. But. Oh, Bishop d2 wins the knight on e4. Good point by you. I thought Bishop h4 was necessary, but you are absolutely right. Bishop takes g2. So we see the bishop's off. I'll raise it down oh. to two seconds. And Fabi's up a pawn. is a threat. Oh, and Fabi can just move his king up. He's got this beautiful path along. He's got this red brick, yellow brick road along the light squares. Mm -hmm. And instead, he's forcing the rook trade. Uh, so, no, he's just going to uh, win a2. Ali Reza, he thought, I'm just dead lost. So the rooks come off the board, but he's also completely lost with the rooks on. So Fabi... As long as he doesn't blunder, he should take this one home. This is an incredible performance by Fabiano Caruana. Yeah, he traded queens. That was a mistake. But then he outplayed Ferruja from scratch in this endgame, banking on his bishop pair. And I think he'll take the knight and start running that h-pawn up the board. Too much going on on both sides of the board. This is what they call trousers in Russian chess literature. Two pass pawns, either side, not enough pieces to stop them. And D5, a desperate attempt, but H3, H2 happens too quickly. Yeah. And that means Fabiano Caruana is about to move to 6.5 out of 7. What a well-played game from Fabi. Incredible. And he's just finishing it off with one accurate move after another. Like we said, he's been topsy-turvy in time scrambles, but you wouldn't know. He is. This is just perfect play by Fabi. And look at this. A1, rookie 1, and H1. Or you can start with rookie 1. That's the final move of the game. And you see a smile on Fabi's face. It must feel really nice for him instead of collapsing in a time scramble to get that win over Ali Reza Faruja, who looks like he's ready to go play a pickup game of basketball. That looks to me yeah, like yeah, a jersey. I say. <laughs> but, you know, Ali Reza, that was a tough one that could have gone either way. Uh, but, you know, he's still right in the mix towards the top of the leaderboard. But it's been Fabi's day. What a game that was. It's going to be a really interesting conclusion to the tournament. Fabi's going to be... Most likely in first, along with uh, Amin Tabadabai. And I flipped on one of the last remaining games, Jose Martinez. We haven't talked about him much, but he's having a pretty decent event. He's playing Ukrainian GM Vitaly Bernatsky, and I think this one is going to end peacefully. I covered Division yeah. 3 of one of the previous events, and Bernatsky was in it. He moves so quickly. Like in rapid games, the guy was spending no time at the start, and he was just completely obliterating some of his opponents. So Bernatsky, uh, he's really, really strong. He needs to hold on to this game where it's, okay, just give up your knights for the pawns. That's what I would try to do immediately, and he goes right for that. And this should just be a draw, unless Jose can swindle. Yeah, very wise decision, I think, by Vitaly to just give away the knight for the pawn, get the king to the promised land, and that's it. After king h8 or king f7, you've got... Uh, no no chances to win. He wasn't born yesterday. He's obviously not going to take that knight and allow <laughs> h7. He's going to go knight, e4, f8, anything draws. But I'll be honest, I really dislike playing players in like the Aronian MVL school where they play incredibly fast because you think on the one hand, there's no way they can play this fast and avoid blundering. But when you're sitting at the board and your time is dwindling down, it's just such pressure to have to figure out moves fast against players like MVL, like Brunatsky. I think that's a pretty good rapid play strategy, actually. I'm with you. 
and playing very quickly can just you know, make your opponents nervous. And Bernatsky and Jose, two of the quicker players that we have. I see some games are still remaining, uh, not too many of them. Uh, I see Kramnik is still playing. Pranav oh, gosh. is here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. on the ground again. This one's going to be lasting for a while. <laughs> Buckle in, folks. We're on move 100 right now, so I don't know how much longer this game can go. But Kromnik up a bishop. This is a theoretical draw, but he should make his young opponent prove it. And what's interesting is that the rook and bishop versus rook end game has been the subject of much historical debate. So as early as the 1700s, Philidor was the first to tackle this particular type of endgame in his book. And he claimed that the side with the bishop should win um, with best play by both sides. And then the first person to dispute that claim and claim definitively that Rook and Bishop versus Rook is a draw is actually Howard Staunton um, in the, the 1840s. He spends over 50 pages in his book, which I have, analyzing Rook and Bishop versus Rook, and he found a lot of the ideas that we now take for granted. There is also a Philidor position. So, you know, these guys in the 17 and 1800s, they, uh, you know, they had their moments. And they had to work very, very hard to figure that out because they couldn't just check with an engine. Uh, they were studying these endgames deeply. And now we're in the Cochrane defense in the Rook and Bishop versus Rook endgame where the Rook pins Ooh. the Bishop uh, from a distance and then the King goes to the other side of the Black King. So your King is able to run away. And now you see the Rook cuts off the Black King from trying to help deliver a checkmate. And you threw in such an instructive point there about the King going the opposite way. You never want opposition in this position because then black can inch forward and threaten checkmate on the back rank. As long as you stay to the other side of black's king, you're never allowing a back rank mate. And Kramnik is making backward progress here. This is excellent defensive skill by Sean Sarxian, who's also keeping enough time on his clock. But where does he go here with his rook? He plays rook a2, and he's kind of shifting his defense over to, to another side of the board. Right. And Kramnik giving a check. I don't know how many moves are left before this game is drawn with a 50 move rule. But now it's a bit awkward. You have to realize that you know, the Cochrane defense was behind. The Rook was in the 8th rank. Now you're from the side. So you've turned the board around. And mm -hmm. that can be confusing for players. Even though it's the same exact position, you have to look at it from a different angle. I think sometimes we just get so caught true. up in our own thoughts. And that's when we make mistakes. You know what's a good uh, analog where that becomes very pertinent is knight and bishop checkmate. Like when you learn the W pattern and then you have to rotate the board and checkmate on the side, it can be very hard to translate um, about, you know, the, the access of the eighth rank. And I struggled with that in math class when we had to, you know, do translations and rotate certain graphs. And I struggled with that on the chessboard as well. But, you know, somebody who is not struggling with that is John Sarxian. Yeah, he's got this completely under control. It seems like he knows the drawing mechanism without That's fail. It. And that game is drawn at only 137 moves. Yeah, not a pretty, not a not a very long game, not very combative. The players just kind of prearranging a 137 move draw. Vladimir Kramnik, he started hot, but unfortunately it's a nine round event, Robert, and you have to keep your foot on the gas pedal. And as we've talked about, once you lose that first game, it's so easy to get into a tailspin. Yep. And we now know who the players competing for the top eight. There are many of them, but Five Minute Caruana, he is in the lead. Amin Tab Dubai is close on his tails, but so many other players have a shot with two games to go in the Swiss. And the players, they get a break, which means Donnie and I will do the same. But when we return, it's the final two rounds of the Swiss portion here at the Julius Baer Generation Cup playing. You'll not want to miss it to see who will play for Division One in the knockout. See you soon, everybody.
Whether you're a longtime chess player or a fan who just got into the game, you're going to be very happy about this news. PogChamps 5 is back. 16 of the world's biggest creators will go head-to-head -head in the greatest event in amateur chess, brought to you by Chess.com and PogChamps legend Ludwig. Watch your favorite creators like Cutie Cinderella, Dog VA, and I Did a Thing fight for their share of a $100,000 prize fund and the ticket to the live finals in Los Angeles. Use the command POG in chat for all the details. Right now, we are in the heat of the battle for the top eight, so they can face off for a spot in Division One of the Jewish Bear Generation Cup. Danya, we've had seven exciting rounds, two more to go. Do you think Fabi, Ali Reza, who else is going to get the job done? I mean, it's honestly, Fabi's resurgence has been amazing. He's playing with such confidence, such poise. Every game has a different narrative. Every game is a different arc. He's won some middle games. He's won a game in the opening as early as round two. Doesn't that feel like it was last week? And in the last round, he beat Ali Reza Faruja in a complicated end game. That bishop play was incredible. It was. It's nice to have a bishop pair. Usually the top players like that. Oh, gosh. Uh, but Faruja, <laughs> you know, he did not have fun fending off uh, that position. And I think we are off in the eighth <laughs> round. So we are uh, getting into the action here. Uh, and Oh, wait. What action? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what action were you talking about, Robert? What are we off about? You know, you know what's funny is your laugh actually sounded like Fabi's laugh. So that was really well done by you, an accidental impression. But um, I say this all the time. I don't blame the players. It's good for them. Why would Fabi not make a draw? It's going to make sure that he's in the top eight. Ban the draw offer. Wait, say that again? Ban the draw offer <laughs> i thought my headphones <laughs> stopped working for a second gotcha clear as day yes yes let's ban the draw first so we don't see this but let's go to a different game uh, we are on a different game i'll raise a against i mean tab dubai and this is an interesting matchup for many different reasons i'll raise he is the prodigy, the superstar, the former 2800 weird to call someone a former anything when they're just 20 years old but they're also former compatriots for the same Federation, right? Ali Reza mm -hmm. used to play for Iran. Amin Taba Dubai was his teammate in the Olympiad. Now Ali Reza plays for France. Amin Taba Dubai recently in the live rating crossed 2700 for the first time, dropped just back below it. But now with the black pieces, Amin, he's got his hands full. It, the eval bar says he's better, Danya. But in this type of position, I feel like, you know, White really has the safer king, and I feel the better chances. Agreed. And I'm more experienced from the black side in these types of. Uh, Italian positions. This plan with h6 g5 has taken the chess world by storm. It used to be completely obligatory to castle kingside dutifully when white castled. But in the last couple of years, a lot of players have been keeping their king in the center, expanding on the king side, and that gives you kind of a blank check to attack the way that you want to on the king side, because as long as your king remains in the center, you don't really care if the king side opens up. But obviously, this plan is associated with a great deal of risk because if white can beat back the initial kingside attack and then blast open the center with a move d4, which Robert, I think is a very reasonable follow-up on the next move, then black's king could get caught in the middle of the crossfire. Also, you rarely want to play a takes b5 because the open a file favors white with that bishop a sitting duck on a7. And now white threatens to win a pawn at some moment. b takes a6, black will not be able to take back because the rook on a8 is loose over there. So there are a bunch of things that Amin has to worry about. And by the time expenditure thus far, I feel like Ali Reza is still well within his preparation and at least the, in the framework of it. And for Taba Tabai, you, you want to play knight g6, you want to play h5, but you aren't certain it's the right decision because once you push that pawn to h5, it doesn't go backwards. And I think white can play pawn h4 to challenge on that flank. I think you have to try, though. That's Black's only source of counterplay. I was briefly, briefly flirting with the possibility of C6, but making these tempting one-move threats actually hurts you because it creates new sources of tension, it weakens the D6 square, and it reinforces the idea of D4. But as I say that, Amin does play C6, and he's just annoyed by the presence of this bishop. He feels that he has to kick it away. That'll give him, buy him a little bit more time uh, to generate kingside play. So... I get it. I get his logic. 
I do as well. L- but the logical. fact that logical, the fact that Ferruja went Bishop A two that quickly, I still feel like he knows exactly what he's doing. I mean, he is uh, playing with clear purpose. Uh, it is Bishop on A two very strong, aiming towards F seven. The Black Bishop on A seven kind of lurking over there, aiming towards the white king, and that's why the king slides on over to h1. Um, these types of moves, you have to know when to play them, and your d4 push, at some moment, it could spell huge trouble for black. And I think we're going to see h5. I also think black can start with the move g4 and then chase the knight away and then play h5. But when I, I would be terrified here with white, I'll be totally honest. I'd be terrified of the move h5, but top players just go h3, and they seem not to care about the possibility of g4 and, and h4. Somehow they retreat their pieces in the right way, and black suddenly ends up uh, at a dead end. But what exactly is white's response going to be uh, against h5, Robert? Is it, in fact, just to play h3? And is Ali Reza not concerned about creating that hook on the king side? Yeah, this uh, looks scary. I agree with you. But the black king, will it really be safer than whites? And as Tabit Dubai calculates, tries to consider his options, why don't we go to the Georg Meyer game against <laughs> Ralph Mamedov? Because these two players have five and a half points. And by the way, we did see Fabi apologizing in the chat. Aww. He'll be forgiven eventually. Not right now. I'm still a little upset with you. Uh, but thank you, Fabi. We know you always fight, but you are doing the right thing for your tournament. And this position, this is the most Georg Meyer position you could possibly ever. imagine. Yeah. Literally ever. Georg Meyer has a Pictionary entry. It's this position right here. No risk. Slight edge in the end game. And I feel like Georg Meyer's opponents always have at least one isolated pawn. Like, that's just the rule of all of Georg Meyer's positions with the white pieces. And every game is a Catalan. <laughs> it doesn't matter what, it yes. doesn't matter what his opponent plays. His opponent can play King's Indian. Georg Meyer will still play a Catalan. <laughs> and well you're, you're right that he likes these little advantages what he thrives in is positions where it looks like it's just even and he will outplay his opponents and it's a huge skill to have he's played in many of the best players because he was invited to those Dortmund series back when he played for Germany now he plays for Uruguay I believe he's half German half Uruguayan and now he plays for the Uruguayan Federation and for Georg slightly better position with white healthier pawn structure but ralph mamedov has had an excellent day of chess i think he's mm. going to be able to stabilize wait my my headphones glitched there for a second uh uruguay is he not playing for germany anymore no he plays for uruguay no i said uruguay is he not playing for germany anymore <laughs> that was I, a I don't get it fun. like Where's why the... like i said no, that Euro- uruguay no. is he not playing no. for germany no no, not uh, we're going to move on. Fail? I'm going to move on Fail? both from that, that pun and this game. G- I, my, chat, did my GPA one, just one go down below two points? One, se- one second. <laughs> I, you know I don't talk to you very often, chat. I want to vote. What did you think of that pun? Good or bad? Let's hear it, and let's go to a different game. You're making a mistake, Robert. That's a miscalculation because chat is always on my side. See, you're uh, uh, not factoring that in. I don't think <laughs> this one is going to be <laughs> good for you. <laughs> yeah, hey, your friend Bortnik is playing against Sam Sevian. So okay. this is a matchup that is quite exciting. Outside of the you know, top 10 players in the world, like we've seen from Fabi and Jan and Ferruja, we see some other great players taking part. And Danya, semi-open A-file, semi-open F-file, double pawns for white, but open lines for the rooks. A good position for Sasha, and he can solidify that weakness on A6 with the move B4. You see that move very often. Uh, with this type of structure. And as I say that, I think I know Bortnik too well. He's gone before. And will Black try to counter-strike in the center with D5, Robert? Is that counterproductive? How would you go about trying to hold this position with Black? Maybe Knight G7 and Queen E6? But I guess uh, they're thinking like the commentators, which is never a good idea. (laughs) You want activity, and B4 is loose. So for White... Now the question is, do I take on d5? That opens up the c file. I don't like the look of that so much. Uh, but can I just play the move c3? Is that available, or am I missing something? No, I think c3 is completely acceptable, and I think it should be played. After pawn takes e4, queen takes e4, white has a direct line of fire on the c6 pawn. So very pleasant position here for uh, Alexander Bortnik, who probably has to go one and a half out of two to have a chance... At the first division, 50% probably gets him into the second one. 
yeah, you know, fighting to be in the second, or if you lose their match, you get into the third. Uh, so with so many players fighting, they're clawing their way towards the top of the leaderboard. Bornick plays C3. The position just looks nice for White because A6 is such an eyesore in this position. At some moment, White can play Rook A5, other Rook to A1, pile up pressure. And if you're ever worried about your D3 pawn, if the D5 were to open, you push your pawn up to D4 and protect it that way. So I do like mm -hmm. Bortnick's position, but Sevian is also handling this quite well. He is indeed. We'll keep an eye as this game unfolds. It's has quite a bit of bearing on the tournament standings. If we may come back for a second to the Faruja Tabata Bai game, because the G file has opened. Black has made a move that the engine calls a serious mistake, and the eval bar continues to move up in White's direction. But again, I'll be totally honest. I would be terrified here of like um getting checkmated. Can I be blamed for that? No, I, I certainly won't blame you for it. But maybe there's a tactic here. Knight takes e5, queen e5, queen f3. Your knight on f4 Whoa. is pinned. And he plays it. And the other knight is gonna come out to e2 in order to finish off the attack on Black's Knight. Someone did their puzzle battle together with our Honey Nut Cheerios this morning. <laughs> How do you know that Honey Nut Cheerios is the only cereal I have in my apartment? Wait, is that actually the case? Yeah. That's the only are, cereal I have right now. Well, we're on the same wavelength. You you know that. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't love a, a good... Yeah, well, this is not an advertisement for Honey Nut Cheerios, <laughs> but I, now I'm getting really hungry, so thank you for that. And Alirizo was hungry, <laughs> so he took a snack on the E5 yep. pawn in the center and Queen F3 next, and I feel like this is just a one-sided affair. I'll show this on the analysis board. After Queen E5, which is very likely because Black has no other move, after queen f3, the only way to protect the knight is bishop b8. And now you can play rook takes b8, but an even more clinical way to pick up the knight is just the simple knight to e2. And a very important detail, Robert, black has this cute move, queen to h5. And this does get out of the pin, but after the trade, you literally go from the frying pan into the fire. White recaptures on b8, and that open b file finally serves to reward white all these moves later. Ali Reza, how long did that take him to find? Five seconds, ten seconds? He's got seven minutes on his clock. He's playing this Jan Nepomnyshi style. Yeah, he's dominating this game and every move with purpose. These pieces all have a function. And that knight on a5, right? It went over there to attack the light square bishop, but it hasn't been able to get back into the game. So rook takes b8 is another tactical oh. shot I was thinking about. But then I remembered that a couple things. One, the queen can take on b8, but there are tactics on f7, as you pointed out. Uh, but also, there's a funny tactic I just want to show very quickly. Let's say rook b8, rook yeah. b8, bishop f4. Does white have, uh, black have the move queen f6 is what I'm wondering. Oh, that's beautiful. And you might say, oh, that doesn't work because the queen is protected. Well, what's protecting it? Knight. What's aiming at the knight? A piece called the rook. That's so easy to miss from a distance, honestly. Yeah. And you lose the queen. I was just wondering about where the knockout was going to come from. So rook takes b8 was attractive, but knight e2, uh, you pointed out that variation. I think that's just clear that you are able to uh, put pressure on the pin piece, but you do lose sight of the h3 pawn, which maybe not immediately, but at some point could be nerve wracking. So that's why Farouz is slowing down. And that's been a theme of the day, right? I'm going to be a broken record here for a second and say that we like to highlight things that top players do consistently that often aren't talked about as much because they're not as sexy. But one of those things is knowing when to pause, right? Knowing when to pause for a minute and a half, two minutes, even longer in a 10-minute game. And this is one of those moments. How many people would just automatically play, oh, rook takes b8 and bishop takes f4. That's a pin against the queen. Arusha stops. He knows that there are two candidate moves here, and he's going to take as long as he needs to until he's confident that he has found a clear path and he's checked for sudden tactics. Okay, so Faruja on the clock. He is doing the right thing by calculating and making sure that he is accurate. And we were talking about Georg Meyer earlier and his technique. I just want to quickly bring us back there because Georg mm -hmm. is somehow up a pawn and has an advantage in this endgame. And Black has just made a serious mistake. Mamedov is panicking, trying to generate kingside counterplay, but it's had the opposite effect, Robert. I think he might have relied on king e6 a couple of moves ago, but now the bishop comes up to b3, forking the rook and defending his own rook. You're going to lose f6 here. And I think Georg can just... Well, he can recapture on h4, 
but he can also capture on f6 because black has to move the king down to keep the c6 pawn protected yeah i like rook takes f6 the one thing you need to be concerned about is after rook f6 is there king e7 and will the black h pawn suddenly become mm -hmm. a queen i don't think the answer is yes he just takes back on h4 and yeah. it gives away most of the advantage apparently but i don't see why well, apparently it's because of this mysterious move, bishop to c2, essentially forcing a bishop trade, but that's a weird kind of amorphous move. Ralph just no. kind of keeping the status quo. I think Ralph's move makes the most sense from a human perspective. What he's trying to do is ensure that king to d5 is possible in response to rook takes f6, and I think we're likely to see that path. Yeah, that bishop c2 move is not very human at all. No. Just trading and losing a pawn with check and not getting... Um, all that much that I could see for it, but this rook b2 move was very natural. Although rook f6 check, king d5. I guess that white a pawn isn't really going anywhere thanks to the bishop on d3, and that's what Ralph is relying on. So Georg, it was an even position. He, of course, gets an advantage like he always seems to do, and now he needs to find a way to increase the edge and play for a win. I like bishop f3 a lot. Yeah, although I honestly think Ralph has good practical chances uh, to, to hold the draw given how ultra active his pieces are. So I would estimate this at 50 50 between a white win and a draw. We've got a lot of other top games that are continuing to heat up. Not all of them are in the end game phase. Artemi of Theodoro is uh, a board five matchup that we haven't looked at yet. Shall we have a brief gander? And you say Art Artemi of? I say yes. Uh -huh. So let's go right in. <laughs> okay, looks like Artemiev is squeezing out a positional advantage. Man, I've never said that before. Artemiev positional <laughs> advantage with the white pieces. He never really does that kind of stuff, does he? This looks horrible for black, right? I'm looking Honestly, at this. Honestly, terrible. And I'm just like, it's. I get the material is level, but knight b3 to c5 or taking a5 is about to happen. Uh, you could play c5 for white if you want, but I don't think releasing the tension is very smart. Like, D takes C4 is never going to hurt you. So starting with knight B3 seems to be the most accurate. I think a lot of players, when they look at this pawn structure, are biased. Because black has a space advantage in the center, right? You've got this menacing-looking pawn on E4. But we're looking primarily at the queen side. And to my surprise, Artemiev did close down the queen side with C5. He's going after that A5 pawn. But is he not worried about his pieces kind of getting tangled up? And is he not worried about tactics with knight takes C5? I guess queen takes c6 is on the docket. Even if, if you don't play knight takes c5, I'm still going to go queen takes c6. So you might as well play knight takes c5. So good a tactical spot by you. But Artemiev says, I'll give you the c pawn trade. I'm up an a pawn. Oh. And the rook on b1 is nice. But I think the tactics might be working out for black. And I was going to make these moves on the board. Nicholas Theodoro is going to do that for us. Knight takes c5. Yeah. Queen takes c6. And I think after the trade, black can actually snag that pawn on a3. But Artemiev definitely saw that. I think what he might have missed is that bishop b4. There's this crazy move rook a3 to b3, hitting the rook and saving the knight. Can can I start with rook b8 check, though, and then play bishop b4 there? Oh. And can black go, like, rook a1 and... No, that's way too oh speculative. Oh, gosh. Could that, that be it, though? Rook a1 and f4? That is wild, but it makes oh a lot of sense. Goodness. And why can lose that? And this is happening. Oh my gosh. This is a big moment. Bishop b4, rook b3 is not a draw. White's still better because of the long-term weakness of the d5 pawn. But this is not what Vladislav Artemia was looking for. No, he could have won a pawn and been happily pressing for a win. Now he's going to try to press a win from an equal position. Or sorry, an even by material position, not equal, because white is slightly better. By the way, Theodoru has one bar of connection from what I see, uh, but mm -hmm. Artemiev is the one who isn't moving. He's trying to figure out how to maximize the potential of his position. Yeah, Nicholas really closing the door on white's winning chances, potentially, in 20 seconds. Or Vladislav Artemiev, who's got a big decision to make, uh, Robert, rook b8 check is a three-result game. So if he wants to play with no risk, I think he should go bishop b4, trade the rooks, and probably admit that this game is going to end in a draw. He takes a third path. He takes on c5. I wasn't... This was not on my radar at all. But Theodore doesn't have connection. I'm looking at his one bar oh, of man. internet. And so that would be a... Oh, he's back. Okay, as soon as I said that, he's back. So uh, maybe oh. I'm being misled, and I don't think... 
Nicholas Theodore is going to struggle at this point. He is just hunting down the pawn, and White could lose this game. If Black gets d4 in, Danya, and then the bishop enters the position, the f2 pawn is a target. I feel like White's king could fall under threat. I would venture to say that Black is definitely not worse objectively, but practically Nicholas has to figure out where he's going to tuck this bishop away and what he's going to do against rook b8. And I think the answer is just rook takes c5, and suddenly everything is protected, Robert. And if white goes knight e6, intending to bring this bishop back to a6, the rook goes out to c1, that buys black the tempo he needs in order to unpin his bishop. Right. I don't think white has the time here. Knight b7, you can just bring your rook back to c6, and I don't see how uh, you win the piece, at least not yet. Yeah. Or even bishop e5 here. Intermezzo hitting the rook first mm -hmm. and covering the d6 square, and he's found it immediately. Super nice move. Really, really nice there. And two seconds. Artemio has no time. He's entering an endgame that is clearly worse for him. How is this possible? He was all over Theodoro. That's what happens when you get low on the clock. He's got to try to trade a knight for one of the bishops. I think that would increase his drawing chances. But Nicholas is not going to allow that. He's going to play bishop a7. And I think Black's plan is so obvious. Get the king to e5 and then either push d4 or f4. Given the time situation, Nicholas should be able to win this. Yeah, huge trouble for Artemiev. Down a pawn, down on the clock, and Black's plan being very simple. What White really does not uh, want to do is uh, see this pass pawns go forward, and Black really does not want to see... Oh, this trade's okay. You have to take on a6 now, but I was going to say, do not take on c5. You do not want opposite colored bishops. That's immediately a draw. For sure. Nicholas is going to take on a6. And he's taking his time here. I am still a little bit worried about the connection. But after you take on a6, maybe he's thinking about what he's going to do afterward. But that's kind of a no-brainer. You have to bring your king up. I feel like this might be a little bit premature, Robert, because you can always play d4. Maybe it was worth bringing the king to the center first. And you need to leave black with an h-pawn and take away the other three. And then it's immediately a draw. So that's why white does have pretty decent chances to hold this game. Or Tenium down to nine seconds. And a win in this game would have been huge for either player. So if Theodore can win, he goes six out of eight, which is really great news. Because wait, is that Wesley So's name? Oh, what Bishop D six. Sorry, sorry. What are these standings? Uh, what, sorry, everybody. We note that these are some old standings from some <laughs> other event. Who are these I was like, people? <laughs> Wesley's not playing. Magnus isn't playing. We will make sure uh, to get that fixed. But yeah, this knight is trapped on a six. That was such an instructive blunder, Robert. Knight a6, trying to get the knight back and forgetting that the bishop can dominate the knight. This is a worthy construction to remember. Black's winning plan is so simple. You just bring the king up, you hit the knight, and white will not be able to get his king to the center soon enough to start eating up black's pawn. It's huge, over. huge win in the making for Nicholas Theodoru, and that knight cannot move. The king comes up to c4, the king will go back to b5 and grab that That's it. It's all over. I think Artemia will resign within a couple of moves. He's trying to eliminate Black's pawns, but you can just play fg, take the knight, and you've got plenty of pawns. The only thing to avoid, obviously, is to have that h-pawn because it is the wrong promotion square. Yep. So bishop h2, bishop f4, and then the rest is it's over. very simple. Okay. Yeah. Vladislav is going to resign momentarily here. I don't know why he's playing, to be honest. Oh, he wants a stalemate trick with king h3. Look at that. Okay, no, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't even allow us to laugh about it anymore, but Ferruja won his game, and Bortnik and Sevian, they're in mutual time trouble, but it also looks like no progress draw. can be made here. Yeah, they draw their game. More time scrambles in the game between Yesipenko and Martinez, both of them down to their last couple of seconds. This game, a lot more combative. Whoa. And you see the f6 pawn is weak. That would be an extra pawn for white. So yes, if I could take it. And apparently there's a... Oh, that's a nice move. Right. Where's the knockout, though? Martinez kind of curling up into a ball there. And obviously he's got his own counterplay with a check on d1. Mm -hmm. Rook d1, king h2. Oh, barely any time. Look at the clock. Jose is five A4. seconds, and so does Andre. Queen F6 is now a huge threat. So many squares the black has to keep tabs on, and he is. 
Mm-hmm. Maybe Queen B6. No, that blunders a rook. <laughs> yeah, that's that's an easy piece to drop there. And watch out. If the rook leaves the back rank, Queen F8 is actually checkmate. So don't play rook That's beautiful. Knight F6, Queen E7. Jose still holding on. Will we see a queen trade? Yes, we will. But this gives black definite drawing chances. Although apparently going passive was not the way. I wonder if it was like rook F8 or something. But here mm-hmm. the knight coming to B4. That's bad whoa, news. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> And if the pawns get liquidated, that should be a draw. Although, honestly, with two seconds left, I feel like Andre will find a way to trick Jose. Yeah, it does seem that way. And the knight goes into d6. Watch out for rook g3, knight f7, mate. No way, Andre. <laughs> Says Jose. <laughs> How about pushing the kingside pawns? Like, Can white use them as attackers? That's definitely what you should do. I feel like you should milk this position down a little bit. Try to go rook c5, rook c7. And if you fail to win the h7 pawn or you fail to fork black, then you start pushing your pawns. Mm-hmm. And he goes king f7 because king e6 would have been met by rook h5. This looks very unpleasant for black. Extremely. And it obviously is a draw objectively. In a classical game, Jose would hold this position pretty handily. And Andre has to be careful about a repetition. He's also got to be careful about getting skewered. Rook Uh-oh. g4. Oh, and he's threatening knight g5. And he plays it. Whoa, king g6 walking into the same line Fearless. as the rook. No good discoveries. A great play from Jose. And suddenly he's got a near fortress. He's got rook a3 is a very nasty idea. Rook h1? Oh. Don't blunder checkmate. Reminds me of that or per chess, chess league Tech Mahindra game. You know, between Bieri and Yakuboyev, where a mate was blundered in a very similar type of endgame. But look, h5 is about to fall, so be very careful. King g6, the rook will move out the way, and there's like knight e5 to oh my uh, gosh. keep an eye out on. Knight h2, maybe? And then rook g5, rook takes h5? Oh, but look at this. The rook moves, then rook g5 check, and then knight e5. Oh, there's no knight e5, the knight covered. Wow. Now it's winning. Rook takes f7 and knight e5. It's winning. Mm-hmm. And knight g5, too many threats. That's it. Well done by Yesapanko. And I think the king and pawn endgame is winning for white, but it's barely. Winning. Oh, and he missed rook g4. Oh, and he missed it. Both players. Oh, my gosh. And g3 now what is was in that? fact winning for white. That was just nerves and time trouble. Oh, my gosh. That was a golden opportunity for Jose. And this is a huge half point to lose. Yeah. I mean, Yesapanko now suddenly, uh, maybe he can claim a chance for the top eight. And Yesapenko is super dangerous. We know he beat Magnus Carlsen in Tata Steel Chess 2021. I mean, he can really play. And you can tell Jose is upset. How? By the fact that he's playing this out, right? He's upset. He's mad because he came oh so close. He had a chance. King G3, terrible blunder. Rook G4 check, instant drop. Both players forgetting about that square. This is what nerves do to you, right? And I don't mean this critically. We understand. You've got five seconds for the last 50 moves. You never know when this drawing opportunity is going to randomly manifest itself. And we do have the last round about to start. And Fabiano Caruana plays against Eduardo Iturizaga. And you know what's interesting? In matches like this, where Fabi, the high rated player, he beat Iturizaga in the knockout of the Aim Chess Rapid, right? That were the mm-hmm. first round opponents. Uh, Fabi is the stronger player between the two. But he only needs a draw, right? And he agreed on a draw very quickly. I was just yep. wondering like, if Faruja could leapfrog him. Because Fabi moves to 7.5, and, and if Faruja wins his game, he'll also get the 7.5. But Faruja already made a draw, so it's a totally <laughs> moot point. It is indeed. And the only other top game that hasn't ended in a draw, Theodoro and Min Lee also agreeing to a draw. We've got Tapa Dabai, who I think is actually going to play this out against Georg Meyer. Believe it or not, a Rubenstein French. I know that's a very new opening for Georg Meyer. And you know what happens now, right? Is that the fans all root for the players with six to win so that the players who made quick draws uh, get knocked out for the right to play mm-hmm. play for Division One. So you can see the top eight, they will play matches where one gets to choose first. One through four get to choose between five and eight. One chooses first, two second, and so on uh, from the opposition. So Fabi, he has earned the top spot. He will get to choose his opponent. We'll see uh, later who that is going to be. But it's not a guarantee that the top eight that we have right now, for example, Min Lay's tie breaks are very bad, that even with some of these draws here, oh.
Oh my gosh. All five of the top boards have already agreed to a draw. To your great positive surprise. I know you are thrilled about this. You are, you are so happy that you are speechless. Tears of joy are streaming from your face. Yes, exactly. And interestingly enough, we are having some forced fights because Pavel Elyanov is playing Levon Aronian, and Levon is five and a half points, so he needs to win to compete for a Division One. So sometimes you have to play because your opponent's not just going to make a quick draw with you. And I almost feel like some players are not playing as much to compete in Division One. Like Nicholas Theodore, for example, he knows that likely he's got bad tie breaks. It's very likely that some player with six wins and leapfrogs him, but he wants to get into the top of Division Two because the money in Division Two is also really good. So I think for the lower rated Grandmasters, they aren't necessarily willing to throw caution to the wind in order to give themselves a chance to get to Division One. They want to secure a good tournament showing. And sometimes they're winning to hedge their bets in order to do that. I get that, but you still have to play a match right. for Division 2 or if you lose Division 3. If he lost the final round, he still would have been in the same match for Division 2 or Division 3. Like, I don't actually think there's a benefit to making a quick draw because if you lost, you'd have the same outcome. So I just think that uh, it's possible that the tiebreaks improve. Rem reminder to everybody that the tiebreaks are based on opponent scores. So if... You know, Nicholas Theodore's third-round opponent happens to win the last game. That's really helpful for him. Uh, but you're relying on others. And yep. there's only so much you can control. And I feel like I'm not blaming Nico Theodore. I don't know. He was just the name that you would mentioned. <laughs> but for Min in particular, he had his very bad tie breaks. If he lost his last round, he still would be playing for the same Division Two, Division Three match. That's totally fair. That's a great point. And, yeah, this is really the remaining top game. We've got Makarian against Yakuboyev, Aronian Elyanov, and obviously for these players it makes sense to play for a win because you never know. Somebody with five and a half could conceivably have good tie breaks and could leapfrog people who were in front of them before the round started. That's just how tie breaks work when they depend on opponents' results. I really like Levon's position here, by the way. I think he's off to a great start. Yeah, and Levon is one of those players with pretty good tie breaks. So if he can win this game mm -hmm. and get to six and a half, he may knock some of the others uh, out of the matches for Division One. So I, I'm with you. His position is better. His king is safe. And look at this. Elyanov decides, I'm not going to passively sit here. I'm going to strike. But that makes the E5 pawn a bit more tender. So I would want to open the E file, bring my rook to E1. So E takes D5 followed by rook e1 speaks to me, but it does hand black the huge center. It does, and it's a committal decision. And Levon pausing here for a moment. What are the alternatives to e takes d5? Because Elyanov obviously is threatening to take twice on e4. So the move queen c2 comes to mind, but it does feel a little bit awkward. And I actually think after pawn takes e4, white's queen is overextended. It's protecting both the bishop and the pawn. So I suppose you could drop your bishop back to c2, but... I'm with you. That feels too passive. I think we're going to see E takes D5, and we do. Big moment here uh, from Levon. He, he, he played as soon as you said it, and Rook E1 makes just so much sense. He plays no. D4 to start with, right away. and now this is going to be a fight because E4 for black, it's an attack on the king side in the making, but white saying, look at this pawn on D5 in particular. That's stuck in place. I have two miners attacking it. Maybe I can remove the guard. And speaking of removing the guard and chipping away at Black's pawn chain, you often see this move F3, uh, which is particularly sensible because the knight on E3 is really pining to get into F5. And if you can open up the F file, you make it a lot more feasible for the knight to jump in. But rook AD8 walked right into a very thematic move on the other side of the board. This is brilliant. I think you would use the phrase whole board awareness by Levon Aronian. Great stuff. The B7 pawn. You don't usually think of a pawn like that as being overloaded, but now it's under attack and covering the fork on C6. So Elyanov kind of walked into it. You can hardly blame him. He was trying to defend what we were just talking about as a weakness. And if you take on E5, then the pawn takes back, and it looks like Black's position is on the verge of falling apart. So this position, very good for Levon Aronian. He's ahead on the clock, and he desperately wants to get to six and a half points. The side that controls the pawn breaks controls the position, and white has three of them. One of them was just carried out, a six. 
He's got C4. He's got F3. It's always nice when you can go chip away at the base of the pawn chain and at the tip of the pawn chain. So as imposing as these pawns look, they're actually very tender. And I think Levon displaying great knowledge of typical Italian ideas. It seems to be a rite of passage for any top player to have complete command um, of mainline Italians. And Levon really displaying that here. Will we see F3? Is this the time to trade on G6 and liquidate a couple of minor pieces and maybe then strike with C4 or F3? I think lots of appealing options here for Aronian. I'm mainly curious how quickly Levon makes his decision here because uh, you point out knight g6, trade darks or bishops, and play for a move like f3. That looks good. f3 right away looks good. He takes on b7 and rook a4. Wow. That was not approved of by our silicon friend or fiend. But I approve where you sit. of it because I'm looking at this position. It's ridiculously complicated he wants to go rook b4 where is that queen going to go next that's not entirely clear and what he's doing is he's putting pressure on the queen side sure but also on the clock he's making quick moves they may not be perfect moves but that move makes black's life mm -hmm. difficult well this may sound obscure but one of my worries would be that the queen drops back to c8 and if black can stick a knight on f4 then bishop takes h3 becomes a very serious counter chance white can't fall asleep on the safety of his own king. So maybe that has something to do uh, with why the computer isn't a big fan of rook b4. On the other hand, I'm looking at the position after rook b4, queen c8. And in that position, you have to reckon with tactics involving rook takes b8 and knight c6. So I actually think Levon's time advantage and his speed of play is going to come in very, very handy as we enter the second stage of the middle game here. I'm with you. And bishop d6 was the choice and the advantage back up to white. So bishop d6 stops rook b4. An extremely mm -hmm. natural move. Uh, and we'll see if Levon does break the tension of these knights. Take on g6, take on d6. Uh, White's pawn structure looks a little bit healthier. But black does have counterplay down the b file. And I, I did want us to you know, keep note of the game between Rudik Makarian and Nodirbek mm -hmm. Yakub Boyev. Because the winner in that game... <laughs> Nodirbek who? <laughs> Yakub Boyev. Nodirbek Abdu, Abdu Boyev. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them, those Nodirbeks are super strong. One you know, is a bit higher rated than the other, but... Both are great players. And you see in this position, it the bar says equal. I'm looking at this like, I'm, I like Black's position. Healthier pawn structure as White has two isolated pawns on the queen side. Yeah, this is one of those weird positions where both sides have weaknesses. And White obviously has to be very careful not to blunder a fork. And not to blunder the a3 pawn. But you can get away with queen b1 here. Because rook takes a3 obviously runs into bishop takes knight. And the bishop on b7 hangs. So I would call this a positional situation. But there's a lot of tactical details that hide beneath the surface. Such as the possibility of knight g5. Which could be played even if it comes with a pawn sacrifice. Because securing the bishop pair in a position like this could be potentially a great asset. Right. I'm with you. And that bishop on b7, not the best piece. So I would be looking to go bishop a6, maybe bishop c4. Protect the pawn from the front. Uh, these positions are quite complex. I think that h6 is an idea for black just to stop your knight g5 uh, threat. I, I'm with you that the bishop pair, Magnus has been doing that a lot, where he gives away a pawn just to secure the bishop pair. Doesn't mm -hmm. always work, but it is an idea that you need to keep in mind. So this one, it looks like a position with chances for all three results. Are there any other games that have significant impact on the standings anyone with five and a half uh, will have a shot to get to six and a half and leapfrog some of the others i mean we've got some pretty weak players that we haven't spoken about thus far quite as much because they've had pretty decent performances nihal saran i'm looking at shakar mamid yarov but uh, maybe that is below our minimum rating threshold of the games that we're willing to look at in all seriousness let's have a quick look at Shakir R's position against Dr. Bassem. And what a crazy position it is. I think, Robert, that Shakir has five and a half out of nine, but uh, out of eight, but don't quote me on that. Five. But isn't it's that, like, oh, he's got five. That these two wow. players, so we won't stay here long because it doesn't impact the fight for the top uh -huh. division, but they have five and eight and they're playing each other. Whew. Brutal. It's never easy. Hey. Never Let's go back it. then. Shall we go back then to Aronian's game? I feel like of all of the top games that are still going, it's probably the most 
meat on the bone in terms of the position that they have. Let's go to it because you'll like how the go back because you you would think he put F three and it was captured. He didn't play F three. He put F four. So how is the pawn captured then? Is there a rule that allows <laughs> that pawn to be? Did he play G takes F four? Yeah, no. magic. You know. Whoa. He cheated. There's Someone... a first for everything. He hacked into the into the server, man. Yeah, complain to the support team. Uh, that's the most one of the most frequent complaints they get is about Ampassant being illegal. Well, he's a computer science major, so <laughs> totally, uh, totally understandable. I still remember all these years ago, there was this video where Peter Svidler and Gustafsson are teaching chess to beginners. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think Peter was trying to illustrate a situation where on passant is illegal, right? But like the pawn <laughs> moved one square and then it moved another square. He's like, so here you won't be able to take on passant. And of course the move executes on the server and they're just like dying laughing do you remember that that was going around at oh some yeah point. i absolutely remember that where it was a4 and there's a pawn on b4 and it wasn't supposed <laughs> yeah. to be able to take it but it, it did. was a3 a4 <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> bishop f6 played by levon he keeps a one minute lead on the clock <laughs> uh, the evil bar suggesting that black is really doing okay and i like black's control of the b file but when is levon going to turn his attention fully to the king side that's my big question well he might have to turn it to the queen side because rook b8 hits the bishop and if the bishop drops back i think black's gonna eat that pawn on b2 and threaten to take on c3 so levon better have something cooked up on the king side because he does not have forever maybe rook b4 is his idea but then robert the queen moves away and i still feel like levon is really saddled with a lot of problems along the b file what about rook a3 here? Just to keep the a7 Ooh. pawn in its sights to protect the bishop on b3. I'm not saying I enjoy the look of my rook sitting there, but at least I stop black's immediate threats. I really liked that. That would have bought your bought you at least two tempi. Black could have sent that a pawn down the board, but that would have given you one more tempo that you could have used maybe to reinforce the bishop or to involve the knight in the attack. As it stands, I don't know if white can afford to allow rook takes b4. And I feel like Levon... Maybe I'm underestimating his position, but it feels like he's gone a little bit astray on the king's side. Yeah, his Do you bishop get that on sense? f6, I'm with you. His bishop on f6, it's in enemy territory. It looks threatening. Let me get a queen on g7 for that checkmate. <sighs> but that Whoop. bishop can be captured Whoop. at any moment, and it can't escape. So the Houdini act that was en passant, it doesn't work with queens on d1 landing <laughs> on g7, and that means that black should be doing just fine. And also, Levon's advantage on the clock is no more so yeah, good news for elianov and he's got a good shot right if he is able to uh, take this game then he will fight for division one i feel like white is one inaccuracy away from his position falling apart so maybe you should start with rook takes b8 but black then threatens you know he's got rook takes b3 and knight d2 ideas he can take on f6 on demand which means the rook is completely tied down to f3 and i was thinking maybe you can drop the rook back to f1 and pave the way for queen h5 but that just feels so slow it gives away the g3 square and i probably would prefer black at this point and as you said a great chance here for pavel to stake a claim and potentially even make a serious push for at the very least top of division two you know it's a problem though is if he draws the game i'm looking at his tie breaks they're bad so if he knows his mm -hmm. tie breaks he may think i'd rather win this game Right, I'm okay losing, but I can't make a draw. I need to win to fight for Division One. Other people, as you said, they're fine playing Division Two. Like you make a draw, okay. But both players need to win to fight for Division One, and that mm -hmm. often creates interesting scenarios. Yeah, because neither player willing to compromise in any way, and it literally affects the moves played in the game. And as we speak, Levon has allowed the rook to be captured on before. Pavel reinforcing the h6 pawn, moving his king to safety. And is it time for Levon to start taking some pieces off the board with bishop takes e4 and potentially later on the d-pawn and move up to d5 and bother this bishop on e6? The, that looks good because the bishop on f6 looks very powerful. The black knight will likely hop into f4 at the right moment. So the knights, they have squares for Pavel and it's a Levon who's down a minute on the clock, and they both need a win here. Uh, that's what they're aiming for, but I think Levon needs a little bit more, and he's feeling the pressure in the position. He most certainly is taking his time here. 
You can play bishop takes e4. I'm still partial to the idea of bringing the rook back to f1. Maybe you can do that preemptively so that pawn takes e4 doesn't come with tempo. But it's crazy that Levon is now down a minute on the clock as he does take on e4. Pavel very likely at some point to plant a knight on f4. That also prepares or prevents the white queen from reaching h5. Some attacking chances for white here. And for black, it's looking reasonably stable. Who would you take? Which, with the time as it is, which position would you take? Honestly, and I don't know exactly where I would critique Pavel's play the last couple of moves, but five moves ago, I would have taken black. Now I would take white because, well, opposite color bishops, they favor the attacker. And I think Levon illustrates that with his last move, h4, undermining the g5 pawn. And I would definitely take white if black's only way to protect that pawn is with the king. I think it is because rook g8, I think you get checkmated. <laughs> hg5, h5, rook takes f4 oh. with queen h5 mate. So you can't defend with rook g8, which means that you kind of have to play king g6, which is a scary, scary move to be forced to play. And you also can't play knight d3 because the moment the white queen lands on h5, the game is over. White's just going to play h takes g5 exactly the same way that white would checkmate uh, in the line that you illustrated. So process of elimination really helps. It doesn't matter... If king g6 is good or bad, you know it's the only move, so you have to play it. And the sooner you play it, the more time you leave yourself for the subsequent defensive task. I just think Pavel is clenching his teeth right now, and it's just a very, very hard move to play in time pressure. Because white has the simple bishop e5, right? I just get out of your attack. I'm threatening to win mm -hmm. a pawn on f4. The white king is very safe on g1. The knight on e3 blockading black's passer and staring over it to the d5 square where you, know, you want to push your pawn. I think that you're right, that somewhere... Pavel lost control, and even though the mm -hmm. evaluation bar tells us, oh, it's about zero, it's only 0.1 better for white. No, not in this position. This isn't a rook and pawn endgame where white's king is just slightly better than its opponents. This is a position where there's a king on g6, so he finds the best move, but I really believe that Pavel's in huge trouble. This is a very minor point, Robert, but I like the fact that Levon didn't take on g5 first. When you're facing your opponent's time pressure, you want to keep as many sources of tension on the board as possible. And you never know, maybe at some later point, you would want to go h5 check and knock the king out of g6. Maybe you're saving h takes g5 for a rainy day. And every one of these small sources of tension force black to dedicate a little bit more time. Time that he simply does not have as Pavel shifts his rook over to d8. Kind of a semi-waiting move, I guess, just trying to pass the turn to white. And preventing bishop takes f4, I guess that is, or at least discouraging, white from taking twice on f4, which now runs into queen takes d4. And a quick note that I think a lot of people would want to get rid of this knight by playing g3, but that walks right into a fork with knight h3 check. If the white king were on h2, g3 might just like win the game because the knight is uh, being booted and the white rook is about to hurt the black king. So you can't play g3, that's not available. King h2, that's you know a one move attack, I'm not going for that. Maybe queen f1 here? Because I'm thinking about an exchange sack on f4. Rook takes f4. Queen takes f4. Just getting in there with the queen. That's absolutely brilliant. And guess what? The decision to keep the pawn on h4 could be rewarding. If black ever plays queen e7, right, he won't have the move queen e7 to g5 covering a potential check on g3, which adds a lot of appeal to that exchange sack. I think queen f1 is a brilliant move. Good call. He plays it. He's played it. Wow. Oh my gosh, queen to f1 played by Levon Aronian. And how does black defend this? Because there are so many threats here. F f6, I was going to say. But now bishop takes f4. And he goes h5. He kind of rushed that move. Apparently the winning move was d5. Forcing black's oh. bishop to step in front of the queen and rook so that queen takes d4 wouldn't come with the same effect. That's super nice. But even this position yeah. still looks shaky for both sides. I mean, White can definitely lose this game, but that was a rush decision, as you're saying. He wanted to keep some time. Look, he's down to 45 seconds. But how does Black play here? Because Queen G3 check might be annoying. He just simply slides I love this move. Seven. Yeah. Slide your king over. Make waiting moves. Don't be afraid to do nothing. And Levon down 20 seconds on the clock. It's totally a three-result game. And Robert, what you said earlier is so important now. A draw might be out of the question for one or both of these players, which means they're going to make crazy decisions that they normally wouldn't make if they believe that a draw is tantamount to a loss. Now 20 seconds for Levon, who's Whoa. running out of effective attacking ideas. 
G4. Now that is a risky move, but he's playing for a win. He does not want to draw this game. And the queen goes to E5, centralization. Now Levant down under 15 seconds. I think he needs to figure out how he can improve his knight, but the knight has nowhere to go. Where would you do here? I think he's playing for a loss. You might have to go knight F1. He goes knight G2, but there's a nasty check on D1 that would drive white's king to H2 where you have to self-pin your rook. But Pavel playing a little bit too cautiously here, maybe. A repetition of moves. Pavel has six points entering, so he'll go up to six and a half with a draw, and he does not oh, want to draw. for it. Yeah, brave chess from him. E3. E3 ends the game. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, what a find. Because the rook on f4 oh is gosh. loose. Can't take with the queen because black trades queens and takes on f4. And Pavel, he didn't take more than 10 seconds to find this move. He's going to win this game. And that means he's going to end up in the tie for second with Faruja uh, if he can secure this victory. He's playing extremely well. That pawn is just pushing up the board. The rook on d4 still can't be captured. In fact, Pavel Elyanov wins. Levon's time has elapsed, and that means Elyanov, you see him, about to show up. He's going to be tied for second place and probably in third behind Faruja. Unbelievable. An on-demand win against Levon Aronian with the black pieces. And the pivotal moment... Came a couple of moves ago. Levon in this position had to find the very difficult move d5. Can't take the knight. You've got to take the pawn. And after rook takes f4, it's the same type of position, Robert, but completely different particulars, right? The queen is passive. Both pieces are blocked in by your very own bishop. Black has to enter complete passive defense. And Levon, I think, would have finished Pavel off. That's what these games come down to. That is how narrow, how razor thin the margin of victory is. Yes, and we still have some games going on that are very important. Yakubayev is playing against Makarian, and a win for either of those players would get them to seven points. But this end game, um, uh... as we, it, we catch up to the live position, no, Yakubayev, I've seen a different position than you, and the game has actually just concluded in a draw. Okay, so that game ends in a draw. Ignore the zeros on Black's clock. We also have Sevian against Yesipenko. On one of the top boards. The last move is B4. It appears that... Yeah, it appears that some of the, the moves have, sub, have stopped coming in. But this also looks like it's pretty close to being a draw. Yeah, no, this position, even material. And Bishop, that's not a very good piece on F6. But there gives it some potential because the pawns on the queen... Uh, excuse me, the king side. It's weird because the kings are on the queen side, but the pawns are on the king side. Now my head is thrown through a loop, but the g3 and h4 pawns are in dark squares, which could be good for a dark square bishop to go after. Yeah, pretty interesting, unbalanced endgame here, and it doesn't matter what the position is, when the time is low, the players will find a way uh, to raise the entertainment value of any position. And we've got sort of a smattering of games on some of the other boards. We've got two bishops against two knights here, but it does appear... Robert, that some of the moves here have stopped coming in, and we will try to address that very promptly. Yes, and these games, um, they don't actually impact the top of the leaderboard uh, because those players did not have enough points to hop up into the top eight where they will compete for Division One, And really, that's what everyone enters the competition for. Uh, they are trying to make it to the top eight, and that's what's coming up. So let's just talk about that a little bit, Donna. We uh, will confirm who our top eight players will be and who has a, a chance to play for Division One. But we know it's going to be Fabiano. We know it's going to be Faruja. We know it's going to be Pavel Elyanov. Those are three big names, and in particular Elyanov. I think he deserves the spotlight right now because everybody knows Fabiano. Everybody knows Faruja. People may not know Elyanov, who was 2760-plus at his peak. I mean, the guy is such a beast at chess. He still hovers around 2700, and... He could take anybody down. And I think it, it can be annoying when some chess fans are too quick to jump on the, oh, he's washed bandwagon. It's hard to remain at that level. It's hard to remain at 2760. And even when some of these players get a little older and drop, I love it when they show that they can still compete with the top of them. They still have it in them uh, to put in a performance at a 2750 level. And that's exactly what Pavel Olyanov did this tournament. I'm so interested to see how he fares playing these crucial mini matches for qualification to the finals 
Yeah, we'll elaborate more on the mini matches. They're going to be two game matches. But for now, we are going to take a break. And when we return, we'll talk about the top eight and much more. So don't go anywhere. This is the Julius Bear Generation Cup plan. We'll be back soon. So I loved puzzles. I love solving any puzzle you put in front of me. So chess was a natural for my brain. It was the unsolvable puzzle. It wasn't one of those things you just looked at, here is the puzzle, what's the solution? It, it was a puzzle inside of an enigma, <laughs> inside of a mystery. Like, what is this game? And there was so much to it. The more you learn, the more there was to learn. So that puzzle solving uh, gift that I had or desire, wish, you know, I would do crossword puzzles back in the day as well as a little, as a high school kid, fell in love with New York Times crossword puzzles, I had to do one of those every, every day that the puzzle came out in the paper. So I always was a, a puzzle solver. And I think that that made it easy for me to, to, to transfer over that skill set to chess.
Our sincerest apologies, everybody. We, are, of course, are sorry that this is happening. There are some technical difficulties that are being worked through, but the Swiss portion of the Julius Baer Generation Cup, the playing stage, have concluded. And, Danya, it was a very fun nine rounds. Some of the players were able to coast at the end. Others had to win in the final round just to get to the top of the standings. But we saw some great chess. So many amazing individual performances, Robert, really headlined by Fabiano Caruana, who had a wire-to-wire -wire performance. Could have looked a lot different if he didn't win that first round against Gawain Jones, but he did, and then he won the second round in 15 moves, and then he beat Ali Reza Ferruja, and as you said, coasting in the end, but he definitely deserved two quick draws in the final rounds. But Eduardo Iturizaga, you pointed him out at the very beginning of the tournament, and he is one of those dark horses who squeezed his way into the top eight. And I'm so curious to see how these lower-rated GMs do against the top dogs when, you know, qualification is on the line. Yeah, well, of course, wait for that, as you know, play cannot resume just yet. But you know, the format of the matches is different than what we just saw in the Swiss. So when we get back to the chess, we will see a different dynamic altogether. Instead of being able to make a quick draw and then hope that you keep doing that, uh, we will see matches where four players will advance to Division 1, 16 players will make it to Division 2, 32 get into Division 3, and 20 players, unfortunately, don't have any spots remaining. They will be eliminated. And the players that are already in the top division for the Julius Baer Generation Cup, because of their performance in the Ancient Rapid, are Magnus Carlsen, Wesley So, Nodirbek Abdusatorov, and Denis Lazovic. And Denis Lazovic won Division 2. There is certainly no shame of being in Division 2. Those events are still super strong, uh, super GM level tournaments with double elimination formats. So, Danny, no matter where you look, there are chess stars to watch. And I think that's the beauty, Robert, of this format. Really the fact that, yeah, we spotlight the players who are in the top eight. We spotlight the players who fight Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura and others in the final. But there's so many cash prizes to be won by GMs who don't have as much of a chance of finishing in the top 10. And they also get their moment in the sun. They get to fight for big prizes and they get practice fighting in situations where a loss essentially knocks you out. So this is invaluable experience, particularly for younger players in the 25 to 2600 range. And there are a lot of super GMs in Division 2 and even in Division 3. So even the players who didn't quite make it into the top division do not have an easy path. Nobody does if they want to win a big cash prize. That's true here. It's also true at the upcoming World Cup where you play these matches. So it's this format that's about to happen in the next stage of the play-in. Uh, it's 10 minutes and 2 seconds per move. We know that. And the matches consist of just two games, much like the World Cup. One at points wins the match. But the interesting part of this is that players 1 through 4 get to choose their opponents from 5 through 8. So if you're Fabiano as the one seed and you say, well, that one player is the lowest rated of the next bunch, you probably choose them. And of course, match play, the results of which will determine the division placement for the Julius Baer Generation Cup. So, Danya, it's always interesting to see you know, which players choose uh, maybe a little bit higher rated opponents, but someone whose style is easier for them to manage. It's a difficult choice because everyone is super strong, uh, but you have to choose, and you have to choose wisely. And you have to realize that the player who is cho chosen first uh, isn't necessarily the weaker player of the bunch. It's kind of like choosing who you're playing 1v1, 1v1 basketball against. Is it going to be LeBron James or Michael Jordan or Stephen Curry, right? Had to make a Stephen Curry reference after all. And I think a lot of players, they make their decision not based on the rating of their opponents because a lot of the ratings are approximately similar but just who they think they would fare the best against and if there's somebody under 2700 feet a yeah they're probably going to be chosen first but guess what then they're going to have a chip on their shoulder and they're likely to play better because someone like eduardo Iturizaga can say listen you chose me first i am going to make you regret that until your last day so it adds a little bit of that interesting psychological component where the lower rated players and the ones who are chosen first are trying to prove their worth. Yeah, no, definitely the case. And he's, Terry Zaga made it to Division One last time. He 
won by milliseconds against Parha Maksudlu. He beat Levon Aronian in the aim chest rapid. Uh, so Eduardo is one of those players who may be lower rate on paper, but they can punch up. And we do know our top eight finishers, the players who will have a chance to compete for a spot in Division One. Five out of Caruana, he won the event 7.5 out of 9. The Swiss portion, Ferrugia and Elyanov had 7 points. And in the next batch had 6.5, but Jan Napomnishi, he was with the best tie breaks of that bunch. Alexei Dreyev, Amin Tabatabai, Ralph Mamedov, and Eduardo Iturizaga. And what's super fascinating about this is that the left four, well, Elyanov and Tabatabai are about the same rating, but the left four, players 1 through 4 who get to choose their opponents, they're the highest rated players. So, Daniel, as you look at this, you know, who do you think Fabiano is going to choose? Well, I think Fabi is going to be choosing between Alexi Dreyev and Eduardo Iturizaga, and I think he's going to choose Alexi Dreyev. Then I think Ali Reza is going to choose Iturizaga. I mean, those are the two players who are under 2,700. And Pavel Elyanov will have a very unenviable choice because Ralf Mamedov is just one of the least pleasant opponents to play in a knockout match. Remember, he knocked out Jan Napomnishi in RCC matches, he has a very good pedigree and very good performance in knockout situations. So my guess is that Ralph will be chosen last. You want to stay as far away from Mamedov as possible. Well, Wreck-It Ralph can get the job done. Uh, you, you don't want to choose him because then he'll feel that chip on the shoulder that you mentioned, but it's never easy to choose from those list of players. I don't know how they're going to do it. We are going to take an extended break as everyone, all the engineers, everyone at Chess.com works very hard to get the site back up and running. And when it does get back, we will be back with the matches, the stage of the play-in from the Julius Bear Generation Cup. Hopefully, we return shortly. See you soon, everybody. That's pretty tough for, uh, for, for 10 seconds, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Why to play and draw? Oh, but this, this I'm pretty sure I've seen. This looks so, so familiar. So he has to go to either H2 or H3. I haven't been able to decide which one, <laughs> but uh, my feeling... 10 seconds pass fast. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. My feeling would be definitely not H2, because H2 then maybe E1 Knight, that Very may be nice. a problem. Yes. So I have to go to H3. H3, Knight F4 and then check. F4, King H2. Knight G4 check. Knight G4 check. Then King H1. Knight F2 check. King H2. E1 Knight. And Knight F3. Knight F3, King G3. Yes. <laughs> Very yes. nice. <laughs> Very, Very good. Nice. I know this one. I'm just trying to remember it. So it's when the three knights get picked. So king h3. Knight f4. Knight f4. Uh, king h2. Knight g4. Check. Knight g4. King h1. Knight f3. King h2. E1. Knight. Knight f3. Knight f3. King g3. Very right, nice. <laughs> and now king e3 is a stalemate. Yeah. Very good. Um, okay, let's. Start with King H2. Kind of have to, I guess. Mm, or King I can... H2, I would probably go E1 Knight. Oh, is this King H3 and E1 Knight and Knight of 3? Well, yes, but King H3, I will go Knight F4. Okay, now I have to go to H2. Knight G4. Okay, now I have to go to H1. Knight F2. Okay. King H2, E1 Knight. And uh, this knight e2. Oh, uh, knight f3, knight f3, king g3, king yeah. g3, still. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Knight f3, knight takes f3, king g3. Very nice. I knew this one. <laughs> I was just trying to remember the, the whole detail. Look, you're the only one that's uh, remaining perfect after five studies. Last one. Why to move? Yeah, I've seen this one. Okay, this one I think I've seen before. Queen G7, Rook H7, Knight 6 Easy. Yes, <laughs> very nice. Yes. But what's the uh, what's the puzzle? Why the move? Well, you you save the simplest one for last. Or? This this is Queen G7, Rook H7, Knight 6 Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> wow. How did you get me here? <laughs> So, 
Queen G7, Rook H7, Knight H6, Mate, yeah? Yes, that's it. We saved the easiest for last. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
And we sincerely apologize for everything that has been taking place. It is not up to us. It's unfortunate to happen, but the matches will be postponed until tomorrow. We know what the specific matchups will be. Unfortunately, they cannot take place right now. Chess.com has tweeted about it. You can read more there. Uh, but we are going to focus on the matches that will take place tomorrow, 2 p.m. Eastern time. So right after the first title Tuesday, the matches will commence. And Danya, you are pretty spot on here with your predictions. Fabiano picked Dreyev as his opponent. Alireza Ferruja has Ituri Zaga. Pavel Elyanov takes on Rauf Mamedov and Jan Napomshi against Amin Tabatabai. So when you see these four matchups, which one catches your attention most? Well, first of all, Fabiano's match is far from a walkover. Alexei Dreyev is an incredibly experienced grandmaster. When you have two game matches, the margins of victory are so thin. All it really takes is one mistake, you lose a game, and then suddenly you're in a must-win situation. So I'm definitely keeping an eye on Alexei Dreyev. Can he make this top eight finish count? And obviously, I mean, top of the bye, he was leading the majority of this tournament. So I'm curious how he's going to fare against... Jan Nepomnishi, really all four of these matches, Robert, are a treat for the eyes. And I'll look at the bright side. At least we get more uh, Champions Chess Tour action tomorrow. We get to extend the, the joy over multiple days. That's right. People can play in Title Tuesday. Then right after that, they may have matches uh, to qualify for Division One of the Julius Baer Generation Cup. And while this event will continue tomorrow, an event coming up very soon is a super exciting one, one you will not want to miss. It is PogChamps 5, and it is back. It starts late July. It features some of your favorite streamers, Dog VA, Cutie Cinderella, I Did a Thing, and many more. And they will be announced shortly, all the contestants. It's going to be an exciting event. PogChamps 5 with a live finals in Los Angeles. Yes, you can yourselves attend that live final in Los Angeles. That will be in August, but the event starts late July. On that note, I think we are going to call it a day. We apologize once again to everybody. Uh, you know, not up to us. Unfortunately, these things happen, but we wish you all well. We hope you continue enjoying chess, and we will see you soon for more chess action on any event that is covered by chess.com. So for now, we say goodbye, and thank you for stopping by for the Julius Bear Generation Cup play-in. Until next time, have a good one.